housekeeping notes before we get going. Each presenter will be speaking for approximately 40 to 45 minutes. We will be quite strict on time because we want to have and have it on the fly. When you're eating, you can turn your video off, no problem, that type of stuff. But there won't be a lunch break and there will be a five to 10 minute comfort break after every second talk. So at 10, 12 noon, PM, this is on the South African time. Okay. So, yes. Yeah. So, go ahead, Samantha. Over to Saurabh, sir. So, Saurabh wants to tell you. Sorry, Saurabh. Yeah. Uh, good morning, all the participants. Myself, Saurabh Sandilya. I'm from My Rehab Academy. I'm in charge of planning and communication. Today's conference, today's e conference on the shoulder rehab has been organized by the great club physio and My Rehab Academy Association. It's our pleasure to have such a wonderful speaker on our panel and I welcome wholeheartedly everybody. Welcome Karen ma'am on the, on the panel and uh, we are very much, uh, I mean, in the beseeched manner, I can say that uh, with a lot of humility and modesty that uh, we are very happy so that we can have, I mean, uh, we can have uh, such a wonderful session on this weekend, especially over shoulder and uh, your work in four Olympic Games and two Commonwealth Games will definitely enlighten us, all of us, with a lot of knowledge and skills. Dear participants, today you will be getting one link through that you can ask your question to the particular speaker. Suppose you want to ask anything to the Karen ma'am, please type her name and then type your question. This we have done only to avoid any sort of repeated question as well as uh, to avoid the kind of uh, like a, a targetless whom to ask questions. So please ask your question by, uh, by typing the name of the particular speaker and whatever question you want to ask, you have got the link in the chat box, please ask that. And you have a reaction button that uh, you have been knowing. So you can give clap whenever you like anything or you can give a uh, uh, thumbs up, but uh, avoid giving the raise of hand because the speakers will be talking in a rhythm. So we don't want to disturb his or her rhythm. And other thing, what I want to say to you today that my rehab academy as crack sir knows that uh, we have, we are the first among the people in Asian subcontinent who has gone from physical to digital in this Corona pandemic period. As you know, most of the countries have been undergoing to the dark period of the lockdown and a lot of restriction. We can't meet people enough. So in this scenario also, our My Rehab Academy has gone from physical to digital to enlighten you all with the knowledge from the great and uh, globally renowned name like Craig Smith sir, Karen ma'am, and many more names to follow today. So I once again welcome you all participant and uh, have wonderful session. Ask your question uh, in the chat box link and then let's enjoy the session. Karen ma'am. All over to you. Please start. Thank you, Saurav. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I could just introduce Karen very briefly. Karen is a specialist shoulder physio from Johannesburg in South Africa. She's in private practice. She's worked at the highest level in South Africa at uh, international sports events and uh, with professional sports teams. And she is very, very well um, experienced to to us this morning to speak about the assessment of the shoulder. So Karen, over to you, thank you. Thanks very much, Craig. And to my rehab academy and club physio, thank you very much for inviting me today. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody, wherever you are. And hopefully by the end of today, we're gonna to have a fabulous day on the shoulder. And certainly after my talk, I'd like to give you a few clues on how to ensure successful treatment with the assessment. So as you know, the shoulder is very confusing. There are so many things to look at. There's more than one joint to look at, but often we're not listening to what the patient is telling us. What does it all mean, whatever they're telling us? Are the special tests actually special? Do they have any relevance? What about imaging? Is the imaging any relevance, have any relevance at all? 
Does it help us make a diagnosis? And what is the relevance of our diagnosis? And does it help us inform us on any treatment strategies? So as you know, the diagnosis can be very challenging. Patients want to know what's wrong, and often they want to know what structure is wrong and what it means for them in the future. But we know, and the evidence shows us, that there's poor imaging correlations. Symptomatic patients have the same um, imaging changes as asymptomatic uh, patients. Special tests are not so special, as they don't isolate any structures. And the biopsychosocial factors example, fear avoidance, pain beliefs, catastrophization, and self-efficacy can affect their prognosis. And one of, I think, our failings as physios is that we know that in chronic low back pain, the biopsychosocial factors come into play, but we ignore them in those chronic shoulder pain patients, and it definitely can affect their long-term outcomes. Is a diagnosis important to rule out serious pathology? Absolutely. If we think there's any red flags, we should put them into context and refer if necessary. Our diagnosis can, is important if it's going to change our treatment or it's going to impact the prognosis. And in the literature, the nomenclature is confusing. Is it a frozen shoulder or an adhesive capsulitis? What about impingement? Does impingement actually exist? Or is it subacromial pain syndrome? Or is it now rotator cuff related shoulder pain? What does it all mean to us? So hopefully we're going to clarify that by the end of the session. So if you look at assessment overview, if you were doing a complete holistic assessment, you do a subjective interview, then you look at the objective. And the objective will then be observation, palpation, various forms of movement, muscle testing, special tests, muscle length, muscle control, neurological, neurodynamic, ruling out the joints above and below and looking at the kinetic chain and hopefully you'd be respecting your severity, irritability, and nature. But then you've got so much information. What does it all mean? And I think that's where we all try and throw everything at the patient because you don't actually know what's going on. So let's try and clarify. The clues that the patients are giving us, we just often don't listen to. So the subjective assessment is the key. It should give you between 75 to 80% of your diagnosis. So we should be listening to the patient's story without interrupting. And that's quite hard for some of us. And there's actually been research to show that when they looked at some of the doctors, that they interrupted the patients within 11 seconds. And in that 11 seconds, didn't even uh, get to the agenda of why their patient was there. And the research shows that if you let the patients talk, they'll often tell you their story within about six seconds. So it's definitely worth letting them just talk to us and tell us their story. But obviously we get some people who can go on and on. So sometimes we just need to get them back onto the road, but don't interrupt them. So what are the clues we should be listening to in our subjective? Certainly age is very important. Often we say to the patient, how old are you? They go, I'm 22, and you go fabulous and move on to the next question. But if they're 22, they're more likely to have an instability rather than a frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulders develop in between 40 to 60, with a mean age of about 52 to 56. An older patient is more likely to have OA or a rotator cuff tear, and a younger patient can have a reactive a rotator cuff um, or an AC joint injury. So the age definitely plays a role. What about the mechanism? Well, is the traumatic or atraumatic? If it's a traumatic, there has to be some incidents like a dislocation, or they could have fallen, fractured their shoulder, or um, uh, hurt the AC joint versus a chronic degenerative OA shoulder or rotator cuff tear. What about symptoms? Not everybody comes in complaining about pain. They can also complain of stiffness, weakness, or, or instability. They won't say the words instability. They can say it feels loose, or it feels like I'm double jointed, or it feels like it's shifting. They can also complain of neurological signs. They'll complain of pins and needles or numbness. So the symptoms also can give us a clue as to our potential diagnosis. The area of pain can also be helpful, and we'll go through that a little bit later. And the behavior of the pain. Is it a severe, debilitating pain, which would implicate a frozen shoulder or a calcific tendonitis or tendinopathy, versus just a dull, low-grade pain over time? So all of those factors can give us some clues. So if we look at the assessment, Obviously, as we've discussed, if the age is important, hand dominance, 
and your occupation or your sport. But if they are a sports person, and it doesn't have to be an elite sports person, if it's in a team, what position do they play? How many years have they been playing for? And the level. So are they an elite athlete? Are they just a social, uh, do they play for a social club? Or are they just a weekend warrior? And that in itself brings its own problems. How often do they train? Do they have any previous injuries or treatment? And if they are in a sports, um, in a sports team, and there's a specific aggravating movement or painful phase. So example, if they're a swimmer, which phase of the sw uh, swimming is uh, problematic? Or in the tennis serve, is it at the top of the serve or on the follow through? And is it affecting the performance? The mechanism we've just discussed, was there a traumatic episode? And that dif uh, differentiates between the non-traumatic patients. Is it insidious onset? Example, that it's just been developing over time. And is there it was acute or chronic in the duration of the symptoms? We've also discussed the symptoms and the varying between the pain, stiffness, and the weakness. The area we'll discuss now, the quality and the severity, the duration, and what factors aggravate or ease their pain. Is it a shoulder movement that's aggravating their shoulder, which will implicate the shoulder, or are neck movements aggravating their shoulder pain? And often the patients don't even realize that when they move their neck, it gives their neck, uh, will give them their shoulder pain. So they'll say to you, no, I don't have any neck pain, but when you assess them, actually their neck movements are referring to their shoulder. And obviously if there's any pain down their arm or referred pain or visceral pain referral, we wanna be interested in that. Also looking at their previous treatments, and often I get patients and I say, have you had physio or treatment before? And they'll say, yes. And I say, what did they do? And they say, oh, they just massaged, they put me on the machine. Well, to me, that's not physiotherapy. So that's a very passive way to treat the shoulder. You really need to be looking at rehab and exercise. And there's a strong load of evidence on how effective exercising and rehabilitating the shoulder is. And in a lot of the evidence is actually showing that rehab is as good as surgery, which obviously a lot of the surgeons are not enjoying. Also looking at the general health, so you especially wanna know about diabetes, thyroid problems, and metabolic uh, problems, because there's a strong link with frozen shoulder. You also wanna look at night pain, are they having night pain? The people who have night pain are the frozen shoulders, the OA shoulder, and rotator cuff tears. And is it waking them up at night and keeping them awake? And what position are they sleeping in? So if it's an AC joint, often if you sleep on that side or a rotator cuff tear, if you're sleeping on that side, it will aggravate it. But if they have pain when they're sleeping on the opposite side, it could be the hand dropping into horizontal flexion, which would implicate the AC joint, but it also often implicates the neck. If we look at medication, especially when I ask about corticosteroids, long-term corticosteroids, because there's a strong link that it affects the bone density and it can cause avascular necrosis. And AVN in the shoulder is the second most common site. And the thing with AVN or avascular necrosis is it mimics a frozen shoulder. So it is definitely something to bear in mind. Um, ligament laxity or hypermobility, and that can be assessed with a bait and scale, which I'll show you now. And any other symptoms of do they look or feel unwell and is there any previous history of sinister pathology? Because sometimes you can have a metastasize to the shoulder. So just the, all of those factors to bear in mind. So if you look at the Baton scale, which is to help diagnose hypermobility, you rate it out of nine and anything over five indicates hypermobility. So you'd be looking at, can they touch, their toe, can they touch the floor with the palms flat? and you're looking for elbow extension or hyperextension, knee hyperextension. Can they touch their thumb to their forearm? And can they extend their baby finger back more than 90 degrees? And you give that a rating scale out of nine. What about outcome measures? Certainly we should be looking at them to assess impairment, disability, and the biopsychosocial factors. So impairments we often do, we look at range of movement, the visual analog scale, strength or functional deficits. There are various shoulder specific disability uh, questionnaires that includes the DASH, the Quick Dash, the Oxford score, the Constant score, or the SPADI. But more importantly, we really need to look at those biopsychosocial factors again, because we're going to want to identify barriers to recovery and the risk of developing persistent pain. 
And certainly there is some evidence that uh, in the upper limb, central sensitization is a, pro is a prevalent cause. So what about some of the factors that can affect our prognosis? Certainly simultaneous neck pain or a high pain intensity and symptoms longer than three months uh, are likely to cause more persistent pain. And in terms of the biopsychosocial, increased disability, poor self-efficacy, poor expectations of physio. So do they only expect to improve slightly or not at all versus a complete recovery? And if they have a higher pain intensity at rest, and that was um, researched by Chest et al. in 2018. The other things that are linked are emotional distress, depression, anxiety, preoperative concerns, fear avoidance, beliefs, and catastrophization, and also the fear of pain of movement or kinesophobia is a definite link to poor pro poorer prognosis. So just those are the things we need to bear in mind when we're assessing the patients. What about the area of pain? Often with a shoulder, we know it can be poorly localized. And that if they just show the whole shoulder area, it's implicating the shoulder. But if they point to either the sternoclavicular joint or the AC joint, it's definitely more localized and it's more likely to be the area. If they show you an area around the deltoid or a band around the deltoid, it's more likely to be a chronic shoulder or rotator cuff referral. And there is some emerging evidence to, if they show around the deltoid insertion, that it could be linked to a frozen shoulder because of the capsule innovation. If they complain of pain at the posterior shoulder, it's either a referred cervical or upper thoracic problem or an inside impingement. So an inside impingement is where it's impinging between the glenoid and the head of the humerus, as opposed to normal impingement where it's the humerus and the acromion. If they complain of medial scapular pain, it's more likely to be the cervical or thoracic area. If they complain of supraspinatus fossa pain without any local glenohumeral pain, it's also more likely to be cervical. If they complain of pain or paresthesia in a stocking distribution, don't forget thoracic outlet syndrome. If they complain of pain in the anterior and posterior shoulder and they're younger, it definitely could be an instability. If it's in the axilla or the inner arm, it's unlikely to be a shoulder. And if they've got any, any distal symptoms or paresthesia or anesthesia, Think cervical, neural, neurological. So those definitely give us some better clues rather than just saying, oh, well, it's a vague pain and we don't know what they're showing us. The other thing to remember, if you can't re reproduce their shoulder pain with your examination, really think of the visceral referrals. The diaphragm can refer to the left shoulder, the right shoulder, or bilateral shoulders. The gallbladder can refer to the right shoulder or the scapula. The liver can refer to the right shoulder, the scapula, or the right cervical area. The spleen refers to the left shoulder or the upper third of the arm. And the heart can refer to the left shoulder, scapula, face, arm, and chest. So remember those, if you can't reproduce it, it should just be a little signal going off in the back of your head saying something else is going on. So if you go through the physical examination, we know that we have to observe them anteriorly, posteriorly, and laterally and we want to look for wasting. So is there any uh, wasting of the supraspinatus um, or the infraspinatus area? If there's wasting over deltoid, think of the axillary nerve. So you want to be looking at the posture and the limb position, the scapular position, winging. So true winging is when the medial border tilts up and that's implicated with a weak serratus anterior. Or is it pseudo winging where the inferior angle moves up and that implicates a weak serratus anterior or lower traps or tight pec. You also wanna see if there are any deformities. So if the patient's had a previous AC joint, they might have a step deformity over their shoulder, in the front of the shoulder. They could have a previous clavicular fracture, which would also be quite prominent. You also wanna look at the position of the head of the humerus and the position of the hand at rest. You then would go through the palpation, active movements, Usually the movements that are done are flexion, abduction, horizontal flexion or horizontal abduction, hand behind back. You can do hand behind head as well. External ro uh, rotation in neutral and 90 degrees abduction and extension if it gives you any more information. But you definitely want to look at their functional movement or the injuring movement. You then go on to passive, which is pretty much the same movements. So you want to look at flexion, abduction, horizontal flexion, internal rotation, and external rotation. And then if you look at resisted movements, you wanna test their rotator cuff, which is static resisted external rotation and internal rotation. 
and the scapula would be serratus anterior and lower traps. And if you needed to do more muscle testing, we would do it as applicable. And we'll go through the rotator cuff testing in a bit more detail. So what about special tests? Are they so special? Well, if we look at the literature now, there are actually a lot of people advocating that the special tests don't give us any further information um, and they shouldn't be used at all. Whereas um, the people are saying use them in a cluster or use them as pain provocation tests. But they've been drummed into us so uh, hard over the years. So I'm just going to go through the tests and we're going to discuss which te uh, tests are more reliable than others. So if you believe in the true impingement, then Nier and Hawkins and the empty can. But the problem with those is that they put you in a very pain provocative position. And the empty can actually doesn't isolate supraspinatus. And I'll show you that in a slide now. You could do the scapular assistance test or the scapular relocation test to look for scapular involvement. If you're looking purely for rotator cuff, as I said, you're going to do resisted external rotation and internal rotation. You could do the full can, but again, that doesn't implicate only the supraspinatus because other muscles work simultaneously. And for subscapularis, you could either do the liftoff or the belly press test. The slap test that you would look at for a labral tear is the O'Brien's test, the biceps load two, and the dynamic shear. And they're definitely better as a cluster with a relevant history of a young traumatic pain patient that complains of pain deep in the joint. Instability, you'd look at load and shift, apprehension and relocation, the posterior draw and the sulcus sign. If you're looking at biceps, it would be Jurgensen speeds and the upper cut, but those tests are not so reliable. And GERD is the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. So let's go into a little bit more detail. You would also look at muscle length. I'm just gonna whiz through these if it's applicable. Muscle control, looking at either muscle control of the glenohumeral joint and the scapula, which is important in the, especially in the instabilities. Scapular movements, can the scapula actually move actively and passively in the, all the directions? The cervical area must be cleared and you could do a quick clearing, but if you pick up anything or if you're considering the cervical area to be the uh, dominant problem, you need to do a full examination. You need to do, look at neurodynamics, which is differentiating the shoulder from the cervical area using the upper limb tension test. Neurological, the referral to the shoulder is usually C4, 5, 6, and you want to look at sensation, power, and reflexes, and testing the levels above and below if necessary. Also looking at the AC joints and any other joints above and below. And the kinetic chain is the most important thing to look at, especially not only in the sports person, but in somebody who just has to reach to a, a high sh um, shelf. You want to check their thoracic area, their lumbar area, the hip, and the lower limb if necessary. So there's lots to look at, but what is the most applicable? If you haven't found any information still, as a physio, we can look at accessory movements of the glenohumeral joint, the AC joint, and the sternoclavicular joint. So if a patient comes in with wads of investigations, they've got MRIs, they've got ultrasounds, and they've been told that they have a tear, often we find that, that those structural issues on the MRI can be a potential barrier to the patient's recovery once they're aware of it. So they might believe that the only way to fix a tear of their rotator cuff is to have surgery and that the physio alone might not be good enough. But there's a definite lack of correlation between structural pathology and imaging, as researched by Jeremy Lewis in 2010. And abnormalities are common, even in asymptomatic patients. So Girish in 2011, he looked at 51 asymptomatic men aged 40 to 70 years old, and 96% had asymptomatic abnormalities. And the problem with the imaging is they often only image the injured area. But if they look at the opposite side, they often find similar changes on the symptomatic and the asymptomatic side. And often the changes are just normal age-related changes. Example, the wrinkles on the inside, like we talk about with the low back pain. And Schwarzberg et al. in 2016, found that superior labral tears in asymptomatic 45 to 60 year olds was um, just a normal age related changes. And they find it in about 72% of the patients. So just be aware that what we see on the MRI or on the investigations is not necessarily the cause of the problem. It could just be a red herring. And treatment should be based on the clinical findings not on the imaging. So what about these clinical tests? Well, 
at the moment there's over about over 200 of them so far so it's impossible for us to be able to do them all and also i think one of the reasons why there are so many is because they just don't do the job that they were supposed to do and i think the problem also is when say example uh, o'brien uh, put out his o'brien's test he claimed 100 percent accuracy but that's never been replicated again by other researchers so don't use one test in isolation to make a diagnosis. A combination of tests is definitely better. Um, apply clinical reasoning. You, they must be used in combination with a good subjective history. They must fit the age, the trauma, the mechanism, and the area to be relevant. And use them with caution, because we know that there's poor sensitivity and specificity. That means they don't rule them in and they don't rule them out. So what can be said is that they can help with symptom reproduction, but they can't specify the structural cause, and we should rather use them as a provocation test. So an article that's just come out now by Jeremy Lewis and Salam says, special tests for rotator cuff-related shoulder pain have passed their sell-by date, and they suggest using, doing an examination without using any special tests as they can't specify the structural cause and they should be considered as pain provocative. And they actually say, and a lot of the sh other shoulder gurus are agreeing, if you can reproduce a patient's pain with an active or functional movement, the special tests aren't necessary and it's not gonna give you any further information. And certainly they, they shouldn't be used to make a surgical decision. And they even stated that it's not best or even acceptable practice. So let's go back to the empty can and the full can. In 2009, Butcher and Karen Jin looked at um, the empty can and the full can. And the empty can has often been said it uh, isolates supraspinatus. But the problem is nine other muscles are equally as active during that test. And in the full can test, eight other muscles are equally as active during the full can. So how can you say that it isolates a supraspinatus and it's, therefore it's diagnostic of supraspinatus pathology? And that's why we're saying tests don't isolate a structure. We know things cannot work in isolation alone. Is combining the tests any better? Not really. If we look at this um, um, evidence from Litica 2000, in 2000, for a diagnosis of a rotator cuff tear, he looked at the, sorry, he looked at the age of over 65, external rotation weakness and night pain. Those aren't even special tests. Those are things that you find during the assessment. But one of the tests that does carry a little bit more reliability for anterior instability is the apprehension and relocation tests and the combination of it. So what about these impingement tests? Well, they're not really helpful, but they've been drummed into us over the year. If you look at the nearest test, which is end of range flexion, if you're doing your assessment and you're applying overpressure, that's actually the near anyway. If we look at true rotator cuff tears, we want to do static resisted external rotation in neutral and internal rotation in neutral as well. The problem with uh, the internal rotation, not only does that position assess the uh, subscapularis, it also looks at latissimus, pec major, and teres major. So again, if it's weak, how do you know which muscle is the problem? And that's why they've rather used a subscap liftoff or Gerber's test, where you put your hand behind your back and ask the patient to lift their hand off their, uh, their back and to be able to hold it. If they could do that, you could add some resistance if it's warranted. But the problem with that, it's a very symptomatic position. So often the patients can't get into that. So then they rather do the belly press, where you literally, the patient puts their hand on their belly, presses their hand into the belly, and the elbow shouldn't drop back, and neither should they use some uh, a wrist flexion to get there. The full can, as we discussed, doesn't isolate any supraspinatus. So if we look at the labrum, the cluster that works definitely better is O'Brien's test, the biceps low two and a dynamic label shear. Only if it's in a young patient, they have a history of trauma and they complain of pain deep in the shoulder. And O'Brien's test was actually discovered uh, initially for the AC joint and it was translated into being a slap tear or a labral test. So what happens is the patient goes into 90 degrees of flexion, uh, 10 degrees of horizontal flexion, and full internal rotation, and the physio provides a resistance, and they complain of pain. So they can complain of pain either 
deep in the joint, which would implicate the labrum, or they could say it's on the superior shoulder, which would implicate the AC joint. You then release the internal rotation, so they supinate their forearm, and you retest that, and the symptoms should decrease. And if it decreases, it would either, again, implicate the labrum or the AC joint, depending on the area of pain. The dynamic labral shear is a newer test. So the patient stands with the arm above 120 degrees of abduction in the scapular plane with full external rotation. The physio then adds maximum horizontal abduction and you lower the arm down to 60 degrees while maintaining that position. So it's almost like the McMurray where you're trying to nip the meniscus of the knee, you're trying to nip the labrum. And it's positive if they complain of pain or they have a painful clink in the posterior joint. The biceps slow too. The patient lies on their back with 120 degrees of abduction and you resist um, elbow flexion and it's positive if it reproduces their pain. Remember, none of these stand alone and certainly with a labrum, still the best gold standard is an arthroscope or an MRI arthrogram. Biceps pathology definitely doesn't stand up well, but one of the newer tests is the uppercut. So it's literally like an uppercut where at boxing where you want to get the patient to start in supination with 90 degrees of flexion and punch up towards their um, chin. Just make sure that you're resisting them and you don't let them actually hit themselves in the face. So what about ins instability tests? Well, they can either be provocative or having laxity. So it's either a gross uh, translation or more subtle. So the subtle is more the subluxations. So if we look at instability tests, certainly the anterior instability, the apprehensive, apprehension test is one of the most reliable tests, only if it's done together with a relevant history, the age, and the um, mechanism of injury. So they must have apprehension when they're doing the test. They can't just have pain. So it's positive if they're apprehensive with or without pain. And the relocation test is just the same test, but adding pressure over um, the front of the shoulder to relocate the head of the humerus and they should have decreased pain or instability and the load or shift is literally putting your hands on the head of the humerus and shifting it forward and back and seeing how much it translates anteriorly and posteriorly. So here's a video of somebody with an anterior appre uh, uh, apprehension test or oh, the video hopefully will work properly. There we go. So you take them into external rotation abduction and you're watching the fa patient's face all the time to see when they um, apprehensive. My hand is on your shoulder, not to apply any force, but just for some of the patients, they, go, they could sublux or dislocate again. And you certainly don't want that happening in your rooms. And you look at the amount of range that he's got and if he's apprehensive. So if he's apprehensive, it's a positive test. You then release a little bit of the, um, the external rotation, they apply an anterior force through the head of the humerus towards the floor and their range should either increase or um, his pain should get better and that would be a positive relocation test. If you look at posterior instability, um, it's positive if there's a click or a jerk when the arm moves. So you're looking for the head of the humerus to shift posteriorly over the posterior glenoid. The sulca sign, this is considered to be a hallmark of multidirectional instability. And it's, um, if it's more than five millimeters, it's considered to be abnormal. And you're looking for that sulcus or that indentation below the chromium. So another concept that's important, especially in a throwing athlete, or anyone with overhead activities, is a thing called GERD, which is a glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. So is it relevant or not? Well, originally they used to think it was all pathological, but now we know that it's an adaptive loss of internal rotation in throwing. So it could be a physiologi physiological adaptation as well. But the thing to look at is not just the difference between internal rotation side to side, but of the total rotational motion concept. So if you look at external rotation and internal rotation in combination, it should total 180 degrees. So if you look at this patient, if example, if he had 120 degrees of external rotation because he's hypermobile and he had 60 degrees of internal rotation, the combination would still be 180. 
So he still has a total combination rotational movement of 180 degrees. But if he had 120 degrees of external rotation and only has 30 degrees of internal rotation, 120 plus 30 is 150. Therefore, he has lost his total rotational motion, plus he would have an internal rotation deficit compared to the other side if, if there was more than 20 degrees difference. So a pathological GERD is a loss of internal rotation together with a loss of the total rotational motion. So those are things just to look at because with a throwing athlete, we certainly know they get increased external rotation at the expense of internal rotation. So, and over the season that can change and, and quite a few authors have suggested that it's predictive of developing shoulder pain later on. So let's look at the scapula. Kibler is the shoulder or the scapula guru and he says that you should look at three elements. You should observe it statically and dynamically. And so the scapula dynamic test is a test that assesses a dynamic uh, dyskinesis versus a static test, which is called the scapula slide. And they used to do it in three different positions with your arms by your side, your arms, hands on your hips and your arms at 90 degrees. But they are now saying a lot of the researchers that the static position of the scapula does not correlate to any dynamic problems or, um, and has no correlation with shoulder pain. We can also correct it manually with um, the scapula assistance test or the scapula retraction test. And that's where a lot of the symptom modification is coming in. If you can change the patient's pain using the scapula assistance test, it gives you a clue of where to start your treatment. And if it doesn't affect the scapula or their patient's pain, it also gives you a clue. Maybe you need to go straight to the shoulder. You could also assess the surrounding anatomical structures, example, a tight pet minor. But at the scapula summit in 2013, um, Kibler and the rest of the group said that the dynamic and static tests are not so helpful and you should rather consider them as impairment assessment tools. So as you can see in the literature, things change all the time and it depends on which articles you read about how relevant things are. If you look at the scapular dynamic test, it's just a visual test. Is there scapular dyskinesis while they're flexing their arm or abducting? Yes or no. And is it winging or is it just a movement issue? So is it stuttering or is it not moving as well as it should? The problem with this is that the incidence is almost equal between symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. A more relevant test is a scapular assistance test where you put one hand on the upper traps and the other hand on the inferior medial board of the scapula and the, patient, the physio will then assist upward rotation and a posterior tilt of the scapula while the patient's moving his arm and that should decrease their pain um, and that could be a good way to start their rehab and also it's one way of getting a buy-in from the patient because they're more likely to respond, especially if it's on the first visit and therefore be compliant with their rehab. The scapular retraction test is another test that you can use where you just retract the scapula while the patient's moving and it's positive if it decreases their pain. You could also look at four-point kneeling, which is a weight-bearing assessment advocated by McGarry and Jones. So can they dissociate the spine and the scapula and can they control it? So you maintain the neutral spine, can they prone retract in that position and can they elevate one arm at a time without having any scapular issues and you compare it to the opposite side. It's a nice test to use also for the spinal dissociation. So here we've got a patient and you can see he's got an obvious scapular issue. But the thing is, if you take it just out of context, so certainly I would look at both shoulders, but I just wanted to show you this movement in isolation. But you could be doing it on the opposite side if you didn't look at it. And also, is it relevant? What are his symptoms? What is area of pain? Why is it doing that? And can we change it? So use a scapula assistance test, use a relocation test, or could you change it? So put it into perspective. This patient, um, he's an elite athlete. Um, he does motocross and he'd had uh, surgery, stabilization surgery. And he said to me, Karen, look, I can do a push up." And I said, that's fabulous but you can't, you're not doing it very well. Obviously, I didn't use those words. But the, in his mind, he was good to go with a push-up. But his scapula, he certainly didn't have any scapular control. So we had to work a lot more on his scapular control, especially when you've got instability 
scapular control is important. So moving on to the AC joint, the tests that have the most reliability is a cluster of active compression, which is O'Brien's test again, the Paxinos, which is where you just squeeze the AC joint, and resisted extension. So you put them into horizontal flexion and you get them to extend out and that gives them the pain. You could also use a cross-body adduction stress test, which is this one over here. But again, it must be relevant with the subject of history for you to diagnose the AC joint. Moving on to the kinetic chain. So the kinetic chain is something that some of us forget about. And the kinetic chain is a sequential activation of body segments during functional movement patterns. And we know that all body segments contribute to generate force. And if we look at um, overhead athletes, 54% of the energy is transferred through the lower limbs of the trunk. So if you've got a weakness somewhere along the, um, the chain, specifically in the lower limbs or trunk, it can affect the shoulder. The shoulder therefore has to work much harder to generate the force and the shoulder acts as the funnel to the upper limb. So as I said, it's not only for sport, but also for functional reaching. So if you integrate the, rotator, the kinetic chain, it can decrease the demands on the rotator cuff, it can re recruit the axioscapular muscles better, and it can decrease the lower trap ratios, which is something we're looking for. And in the latest article by Richardson et al. in 2020, they found that if you step while you're doing your exercises, it also adds to the kinetic chain integration better than squatting. So risk factors when the kinetic chain might be implicated, certainly if you've had a previous injury of the ankle, knee, hip, or the lower back. And how many times have we had patients who say, oh, I've got a shoulder pain and I've got a knee pain and you go, okay, we'll, uh, we'll look at your shoulder now and then you forget about the knee. But it certainly can affect them, especially if it's patients who have recurrent shoulder pain and they're coming back over and over, it could be that the kinetic chain is not working efficiently. Poor thoracic flexibility, poor pelvic hip stability, and hip stiffness, i.e. decreased range of movement, um, internal, specifically internal rotation. And if they have poor movement strategies, that can also implicate the kinetic chain. So how can we assess them? Well, you can really do anything you want to look at but you should look at cervical, thoracic, lumbar range of movement, the hip, the knee, and the ankle, and the big toe, the first metatarsal joint. And I actually had a beach volleyballer who came in with shoulder pain, and I went straight to his big toe. Obviously, I looked at his shoulder first, but he actually had a stiff big toe, and he thought I'd lost the plot. He said, Karen, my shoulder is sore, not my toe. But because he had a stiff big toe, and he was on the beach, sand, the sand is obviously a lot more unstable, he wasn't generating enough power and his shoulder was taking the brunt of the force. So once we worked on his shoulder and his big toe, his shoulder pain got better. You could look at single leg balance, you could use a wire balance test, you could look at bridging from two legs to one leg, you could use sitting to standing if they're more of a social athlete, you could do various forms of hopping, you could do knee bends, going to a squat, going to a single leg squat, you could step down, or you could do any sport-specific drills that the patient would require. So the things that are useful the most and where the assessment is really changing is symptom modification and trying to make the assessment a little bit easier. So Jeremy Lewis in 2009 described the shoulder symptom modification procedure, but it's not as formal as that anymore. Now we're just looking for a way to identify a relevant strategy to change a patient's pain and then we in, you use that. And as I said, that would uh, implicate that uh, area and the patient's more likely to respond if we can change their pain immediately. So strategies that you might want to use is making a fist during the movement that seems to recruit the shoulder a little bit better, or you could unload the shoulder so you make a shorter lever. So if you're doing, a, say, a elevation and you're using a long lever, shorten the lever and see if it changes their pain. And if that can change your pain, it's a way to start the exercises. You could add some light resistance. You could add visual, tactile, or verbal cues. You could use the scapular assistance test, as we said, and we could integrate the kinetic chain. So certainly a lot of the shoulder gurus are trying to get away the from the complexity of the shoulder assessment, and they're trying to make it easier. Some of the um, authors are saying they look at just, is it painful and weak? Is it painful and stiff? 
or is it painful and unstable and any other like a cervical referral and putting them into those boxes as opposed to trying to get through all these tests and complicate the issue. So hopefully by the end of this, you would have thought of some of the pieces of the puzzle that the patients are actually telling us to make our diagnosis better. Okay, guys, that's it. Awesome, Karen. Thank you so much for that. Um, I must agree with you, uh, especially on the, uh, the MP can and, and the full can. Um, you know, I, I'm not at on clinical anymore, but in days gone by, you were absolutely convinced that you had a supraspinatus injury you were dealing with, and then it came to the point where the surgeon wanted to operate, and they went in and they operated, and it wasn't like you thought it was. So um, sometimes these assessments are really confusing. But thanks so much for that uh, awesome uh, talk. Um, I just want to bring in Sumanjit. Sumanjit, are there any questions for Karen on the text? While Sumanjit's doing that, if anyone has any verbal questions, you can unmute yourself and you can ask you. Karen. Karen, would you stop sharing your slides so that we can get the gallery view of everyone? Sure. Yeah. There is a question for uh, ma'am from a participant. The question is, uh, is an entrenched pen specific to an impingement? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, is an entrenched pen specific to the impingement? So, pen. yeah, entrenched pen. So, no, because if you're looking for nearest test, you're putting them in an entrenched pen. But if you're looking at Hawkins, it's actually in the middle of the range. So, people generally, when they're impinging, they would often have that painful arc. But the point is, is the impingement, is impingement actually a diagnosis? No, it's not. It's a symptom. But the problem is a lot of the surgeons are still using that structural model because they need to um, go and look for a structural fault. And there's actually a lot of research coming out to say that acromioplasties or decompressions are actually not that relevant and physio alone can often help the patient. So it's not only about end range pain, it could be the symptoms together with all the other testing. But they, if they're impinging at the end of range of flexion, it could be an inside impingement. Okay, so that's where the impingement is happening between the glenoid and the head of the humerus, as opposed to the chromium and the head of the humerus. Thank you so much, ma'am. Any participant has any verbal question? Can ask Karen, ma'am. Uh, there is a question. There's a is that the question from Danielle Karen? Yeah. Uh, when you say it's best to use a group of special tests together with history, etc., is there a specific number of tests percentage that you take into account? For example, out of the three special tests are positive, that type of thing. Um, well, the research is very confusing. Um, some of them say you, if you have this a cluster of five tests, the three out of the five would be relevant, but some of them don't have five tests. So th the key from what the research is saying is actually the tests alone, even the clusters are not that good. It has to be the cluster of tests together with the subjective. So the cluster is usually three or four, depending on, so, so the cluster for the AC joint would be all three of those tests together with the subjective. But the key and the takeaway is the subject of history has to align with the special tests. The special tests don't make the diagnosis because they're actually just pain provocative. So they're provoking pain, but they're not actually telling you a diagnosis at all. Right. Yeah. Nice question. Thanks, Danielle. I have one more question to read out if no one has a verbal question. It's from Sneha. Hi, I've seen a few rotator cuff pathology cases where the patients have complained of pain around the biceps insertion during external rotation. Could you explain why it could be occurring? So remember when you, uh, the biceps is a secondary stabilizer of the shoulder. So if they complain of pain over the biceps area, that implicates the biceps, long head of biceps. So it doesn't mean that it's only the rotator cuff alone. It could be the biceps. You could have a biceps tendinopathy. So that's when you could use those biceps tests. And it also could be, it again, needs to fit in with the history. Did they overload their biceps? So certainly with a rotator cuff, you could have a reactive tendon where there's an, an acute overload. So that's the younger patient. 
versus the older patient that's more likely to have a rotator cuff tear. But often when the surgeons go in and they do surgery, they will do something to the biceps as well because the biceps as a secondary stabilizer is often overworking as well and is implicated, but it's not the primary cause of the problem. Okay, then there's another question from Deepti. Any scales for assessment like SPADI or the pain NPRS scale? So there, there are many uh, shoulder scales. So the spade, there's a dash, the quick dash, the spady, there's a constant score, there's an Oxford score. So again, you need to go and look at which one. Some are, more, are better for disability. There are also impairment scores. So it depends on the patient and which ones you find most helpful. Some of them you have to pay for. Some of them are available freely. But also remembering doing it together with a biopsychosocial questionnaires. Don't just do structural questionnaires in isolation. Well, thanks, Karen. If anyone and has those any... Are freely Sorry, Craig. If, if you wanted to look at um, on the internet, a lot of them are freely available, and then you could see which are the most relevant. So I, for me, it depends on the patients that I have about which ones I choose. But the biopsychosocial definitely are helpful in uh, looking at those patients that are going to be slower to respond, have potential barriers to recovery, and are more likely to develop persistent pain or chronic pain in the future. And we really want to catch those patients early and do lots of uh, pain science, education, reassurance, and not necessarily going and telling them what structural problem that they have and buying into their fear avoidance, because that's the worst thing we could do. Sure. Anybody got any uh, verbal questions? You can yes, Craig, sir. Can, can I ask one question? Please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Karen, ma'am, for giving wonderful information. And I have one question. Uh, sometimes a uh, thrower or a baller has shown a partial instability in the shoulders. So in that particular um, things, uh, how to categorize whether it is, uh, you know, uh, dangerous for the athlete or he can continue with his sports or uh, what what prehab, uh, prehab uh, litigation we can give it to him to improve his condition and he can continue game for uh, that particular season. Thank you for that question and for the good feedback. Um, the thing with a partial instability, I think you're talking about a subluxation. So yes, a subluxation yes. is a, a shift of the glenoid as opposed to where it dislocates uh, traumatically. So if you look at the research, there's a thing called people that are born loose. So they're genetically more hypermobile. So they would have more movement. And those are the patients that definitely need better muscle control. So your rehab has to focus on lots of muscle control. But the thing is, which way are they, do they have the subluxation? So they could have an anterior or a posterior, but they could have a multi-directional instability. And that's where a lot of the, the athletes we see. So you can't rehab them only in one direction. You've got to look at their whole motor control. And mm -hmm. certainly with good rehab, they do well. And that patient with the video of the apprehension actually had a multi-directional instability. Yes. And he, he was a swimmer as well. So with fatigue, his instability got worse. But with time, when you rehab them, they do much better. But it, it, it takes time, and obviously you need to get the buy-in from the patient. So one of the things that I do with the shoulder straight away is when they come in on day one, I say to them, good shoulder rehab takes time. You're not mm -hmm. going to get better within one session. The rehab yeah. minimum, and the research shows, minimum of 12 weeks, if not longer. So if you put that out to the patient straight away, they're not expecting a quick mm -hmm. fix. But certainly mm -hmm. to get back to your question, motor control, so lots of um, exercising and rehab in all directions. So you could look at proprioception, closed chain exercises, open chain. A proprioceptive exercises for the shoulder is not often done. So we know that um, we we'll often do it for a knee or an ankle, but there's good proprioception exercises to do for shoulders as well. And depending on their sport, making it more sport specific and also integrating the kinetic chain. So also for those patients to look further down the chain to see if there's a problem anywhere else that's making his shoulder work much harder. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Uh, there is a question for you, ma'am. Can I ask one? Uh, any scale for assessment? Any scale or any other? 
any skill for assessment of pain or any Sorry, skill uh, of uh, can normal can, assessment? Can you repeat your question? Uh, the participant uh, is supposed to repeat the question because the question has come like only any skills for assessment, pen skill or any other. So the visual analog scale is a scale that we obviously use where you rate the pain out of 0 to 10. Um, you could use impairment scales. So you could use range of movement as a scale. So it depends on what's the most relevant to use. But I think most of us use the visual analog scale anyway together with some of the outcome measures. But you could also use a functional impairment scale. So do they have, is there a specific function? That's the problem. Um, I'm not quite sure what else they're asking about. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, can other? I ask one question please? Uh, this is uh, Shagupta. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Um, uh, hi, hi, Karen. Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, discuss a case where a patient is having a long history of, uh, of being in asthma, having an asthma, and uh, she has been on uh, uh, some kind of the medication. Um, so uh, currently, uh, she is uh, uh, having pain uh, in her shoulder, which is uh, uh, getting worse when she's sleeping uh, at night, and uh, pain gets more uh, aggravated when she's uh, lying on the and a pain side. So uh, uh, my, I am giving her uh, some trending exercise program and giving her some capillary stabilization exercises also. But since the pain history has been there for quite long, so uh, uh, so what what should uh, be the uh, um, um, protocol or the approach uh, in such cases? Patient is uh, around 58 years old, female. Okay, thanks for that question. So one of the questions I was going to ask is how old the patient was, and you've just told me now. So if it's a 58-year-old, the chances are that age group, it's either going to be the cervical spine, she could have OA of the shoulder, she could have a frozen shoulder, depending obviously on the range of motion. So you want to also look at the location of her pain. Where is her shoulder pain? Is it over the deltoid? Is it more up in the neck? So the area of her pain, and the mechanism of her pain is also important. How did it start? Was it an insidious um, episode that's developed over time? Or was there an acute mechanism? Because that would differentiate a potential diagnosis. So it doesn't sound like you've ruled out the neck to me. So the, I would definitely go and assess her neck and see because in that age group, she might have some uh, changes um, in her neck as well normal age-related changes, but it could be affecting her shoulder. And off, a lot of patients that have even true shoulder pain actually end up having cervical pain as well. And also you could see if she's had a previous episode of whiplash, that also could predispose her to developing shoulder pain later down the line. So those are all factors to go and look at. So I think you need to maybe go back to your assessment and see, is it actually the shoulder or is the shoulder pain being referred from somewhere else? Okay, uh, she. Uh, I have been treating her previously also, and previously, a uh, few five four months back, she showed the history of having some neck discomfort, uh, neck discomfort, which was actually leading to some giddiness also. So that's where uh, I was uh, treating her for cervical spondylosis at that time. But uh, lately, she has uh, uh, complained of uh, she shoulder discomfort while she sleeps uh, at night. And at the same time, uh, she's not diabetic. Uh, her range of motion is complete. There is uh, uh, pain at the end range uh, of motion only, at the extreme end range of motion. And obviously, she has uh, a lot of uh, uh, lackness in, these, in her muscles, basically. The strength is not very good. And that's there for bilateral shoulder. So, so if her strength is not good, specifically in external rotation, you would look at the rotator cuff. So she could have a, a potentially a tear of the rotator cuff. She's fitting into the age group of the older patient. Um, you could also look at, she could have OA of the AC joint, which would also um, affect if she was lying on it at night. So things that cause pain at night are usually 
OA shoulder or a frozen shoulder or a tater cuff tear. So putting that into context with the rest of your assessment. So if she's weak in resisted external rotation, along with other things that could implicate the cuff, but end of range flexion alone could also implicate the cuff or the AC joint. So the AC joint also gives you pain at the end of range of flexion. Karen, okay. thank, thank you so you. much for that. I, sorry, I don't want to, uh, forgive me for barging in. We need to move along and uh, your presentation and your answers, the questions have been fantastic. So I'm gonna say, Karen, thank you so much guys. Karen, if you are okay to share your email address or some form of communication, we can put in the chat and if people have any other questions, can then uh, communicate directly to you or they can chat directly to you on Zoom if you're staying online, Karen. Okay. Yeah, um, sure. Thanks, Craig. Thanks very much, guys. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's time to introduce our next speaker. I'm very excited to be able to introduce Paula Nutting from uh, Australia, the Gold Coast in Australia. Uh, some of you might be aware of Paula's work already. Some of you might find Paula completely new and very refreshing. She presented her course, the Chapman's Reflexes course on uh, Club Physio just a couple of weeks ago. It was over six modules, very, very well um, received and uh, supported. And uh, she's going to speak to us on uh, how to treat shoulder area, the shoulder total, the shoulder complex, the shoulder joint using Chapman's Reflex techniques and the excitation of the neurolymphatic pathways. Well, I'd like to invite you to share your slides, please. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to start sharing these <clears throat> as we right. speak. Yeah, go for it. I'm going to mute myself. And over to okay. you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for spending the time to, to listen to all of us today. There's some pretty amazing speakers out here. Um, the information that I'm going to be giving to Many of you, you won't have done any of this work before, or you might have seen a little bit of about, uh, about what neurolymphatic point stimulation is. But it's, it's um, I'm going to give as, I've got as much detail as I can that will, won't swamp, I'm hoping, so you'll feel comfortable without getting lost. So basically what we're talking about is uh, our Chapman's reflexes. What are they and how can we use them? So sorry this machine is getting freezing us over so they're actually called neurolymphatic points but otherwise the the term that you might be familiar with them would be um a um chapman's reflexes i'm so sorry my screen is jumping ahead of itself i'm just going to get out of that mode and put it into something that's not going to scroll so just bear with me for a moment because that will annoy you and I. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so apologies, it's going to just be into that shape for the time being because um, I won't be able to swap the notes over. So, <clears throat> Chapman's reflexes, known by, um, coined by Frank Chapman, who was a, 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 a clinician way back in the pre World War II in that age. He and his wife and her husband, who's Charles Owens, they all worked together, they were chiropractors, and they worked in uh, visceral work. So he was uh, working it um, to stimulate organs and found that, that he'd get great responses to the health of the body through stimulating these small spinal reflex nodes. We can palpate them because they're quite superficial, uh, uh, just underneath the skin in the, the superficial fascia. And when you mobilize them, they actually improve the quality of the lymph drainage to the organs, but they also will stimulate via the neural arc um, the specific muscles. Now, they, that was found quite um, by accident later on by a fellow called George Goodhart. Now, he was the uh, founder of Applied Kinesiology, and he did a lot of work with, with muscle strength testing. So he was working with, with um, Frank Chapman's work on the stomach and then found by incident that it actually was stimulating the power to the pectoralis uh, clavicular head. So he then mapped through the entire body to work out which of the neurolymphatic points would actually turn on specific muscles. 
Um, that, as I said, the, they're located in the lymphoid tissue within the fascia. And when the, the organ or muscle is actually weakened or congested, those points will be quite tender. So that's where we will be working. Uh, when you work with your clients and your patients, you'll find that the work we do is quite gentle. And the beauty of that is that you can be treating many different modalities. So you can look after paediatrics, you can look after the aged, you can look after um, people who are quite infirmed um, and there's no major contraindication. So they go by many names and Leon Chattel, bless his beautiful soul, um, wrote many texts. One of them was his soft tissue manipulation manual and in it he talks about these reflexes going by many names and you'll see that Myron Beale, um, Terence Mann, uh, Gernstein, even Travell and Simons all use specific reflexes. I think I align mostly to Erwin Korb and he talks about the uh, facilitated segment and referral dysfunctions. And that's where we're going to be, that, that's where I kind of work with this, um, this my, my mindset is that it comes back to specific spinal reflexes. Now, what we try to do with with any client or patient that comes in with a shoulder pathology, I like to look at the body, not only in its muscle origins and, and insertions, but also within our fascial line. So Tom Meyer's functional anatomy trains and the work that we're going to be, I'm going to be showing you today is working from the, uh, both Tom Meyer's work and the work from George Goodhart. So the order of treatment is we look at our stability and then we look at our mobility. So we want to try to stabilize from the core first before we work at, at appendicular. So we work axial and then out. And because we do that, what we do find when treating people with neurolymphatic point stimulation is that when we address things that have been axial, then shoulder pathologies tend to, to abate or at least reduce quite dramatically. And in this case, what I'm going to be working with you today and showing you is we're going to be working on the latissimus dorsi and that links in with our functional back line. It's also part of our upper cross and lower cross. We're going to look at our thoracic defence patterns. Now, when we go into defence, which is part of the Chapman's reflex, um, the, way, the way I work is I look at fright and flight. Once you become in that fear lockdown, we tend to turn off a lot of our postural muscles. Now, postural muscles are our, our, the supporting muscles that are our, uh, need oxygen as their primary drivers. And they're the type of muscle that we really need to encourage to, to um, get oxygen by doing diaphragmatic work. So one of the first things we would do here, I'm not, I haven't put it into these slides, but we would get the diaphragm to function. So once the diaphragm is actually working and doing respiratory work by stimulating the neurolymphatic points, which sit right down along the sternum, then we've opened up the oxygenation and the potential to reduce our stress. We've increased the, the work of the vagal nerve. So we're turning on the vagus, the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's super important. So when we thoracically close down, we actually internally close through our intercostals, our serratus anterior, and we weaken the, the recip by reciprocal inhibition so that all of the muscles posteriorly, so our rotator cuff, our scapula stabilizers, our, you know, the lower trapezius, the mid traps, your rhomboids, they all become quite weak. So we actually need to work by opening up the anterior, stimulating there to thereby get proper length and strength in the anterior cage so therefore that the posterior side will work. So I get tired of seeing therapists only working on the back where they actually should be doing a lot more work at the front. Where they're going to have a look at the rhomboid weakness and the trigger point and how, how um, if you have a trigger point in your teres major minor complex, quite often the rhomboid is actually not functioning and that addresses our spiral line of Myers. We're then going to drop down into uh, looking at traditional Chinese medicine as a, as a model in our functional front line, and that's working on central, uh, the position of the shoulder and what happens at the supraspinatus. And then if we have time, we're going to look at the sternocleidomastoid and the jaw. 
Primarily though, we're looking at the shoulder and its attachments. So we're gonna be talking about our supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the rotator cuff, the lat dorsi, and then we're gonna be coming into the pectoralis major and minor and our serratus anterior. What I do wanna see before we actually go into, um, I'm gonna describe what's going on, you're gonna see some videos and then I'm gonna get you actually to do your own stimulation points. We can't strength test here, obviously, but we can certainly do the facilitation. I'm gonna show you what um, I want you to be able to do by having a look at this video. And I'm hoping that it's, is, can you see that, Craig? Yeah. 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 Stretch exercise together. Yeah. She's a little bit tight, so I'm a little bit concerned that she's not going to pass. So I want to show it to you so you understand how to get that length and what might be going on. So we're going to start by getting our backs against the wall, knees bent, and lower back nice and flat. Elbows and palms together. So while you're watching this, I just want you to put your elbows and palms together. So that, that position that I've got mine, because that's, you're gonna do this against a wall in a moment. Up and back. Did you see my elbows don't separate, my palms don't separate, and I can touch the roof. Let's watch Tabitha. Elbows split. She can reach the roof, but she's not doing it to form. Let's hold them in and see how far up she can get. Okay, that's as high up, which means she needs lots of great stretches for those lats. And if you feel that as well, so do you. This is a great stretch, do a dozen of them a day, and you'll find that you'll slowly get length in the muscles that count for your back. Okay. So what I want you to do now is I'd like you to go and get yourself into a wall, find a wall, get your elbows together, fingers together, and just do a reach over. See if you can touch the wall behind your head. So, and, and because this will give you a how you are now to how you are later. So if you can, please, I'd like you to do that for me now. I'm presuming that there will be people that can touch. I can't actually see. Oh, yeah. How did you go, Kareen? Could you get back? I didn't see you. Can we get yeah. back? I could get there, but it's a bit tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anybody else get, get uh, restrictions? Couldn't get all the way back? It's hard for me to see everybody's screens. Yeah, some tightness. Okay, so let's go have a look at back at this, this functional back line and the latissimus dorsi and, and have a bit of a, a discussion around it. So the lats are involved in the upper and upper body and the shoulder due to their attachments at the humerus. So also be, if you're looking at that slide, you can see that, that um, it will pick up the the huge lumbar, thoraco lumbar fascia across the, um, the, the lumbar thoraco junction. Yeah. You've got the latissimus dorsi and then the gluteus maximus and underlying uh, piriformis. So when we see our clients, what happens is they come in to see us complaining of piriformis syndrome or pseudosciatica, that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> pardon me. That's, that was the position that, that I was hoping that you could get into. Now, when they complain of that pseudosciatica, I'm needing to know whether it's actually coming from the latissimus dorsi or whether it's coming from something else. And nine times out of 10, there'll be a weakness and insufficiency in the, in the latissimus dorsi. And we know where it attaches. It's, it pops up into that, that uh, humerus, up in that intertubercular groove, and it will affect shoulder pathologies. So, what we, what we often do is we check for internal drive. So can they hold that arm in by themselves? And um, 
and what symptomatic picture we see. So I'm just going to show you that video now. The functional back line, when we look at Tom Meyer's descriptors and Yander's lower cross syndrome, both have a commonality and that's one of the latissimus dorsi and also the piriformis. We also need to be mindful of what effect the Chapman's neurolymphatic points have on these. So that's what we're going to test and it's a really great tester. First of all, you're going to check up the piriformis length. This down will give you one definition of piriformis because remember it attaches on the anterior portion of the sacrum. When we take it into closer to the midline, it's going to test in a different portion. So this way we're looking at external rotation and what tightness we get. If we're down here, we're actually looking at internal rotation. I'm checking how much external rotation Patty's got. She should be somewhere up around here in a perfect world. I know, I know, perfect, I know. Let's check the strength of the latissimus dorsi. So she's internally rotating the humerus because mm -hmm. the latissimus dorsi attaches at the point there. We're going to take our hand not on the, on the wrist joint, but slightly above, hold that arm in. And I'm applying average force. This shouldn't move at all, which means that the uh, neurolymphatic points that sit on ribs seven, eight, sometimes nine, need to be facilitated. We're checking this lat, this piriformis, because remember our muscular ligamentous slings cross over tender mm. quite often this is a tender point it can be tender with defense patternings as well we'll cover that in a minute thirty seconds let's read this here hold strong for me yeah mm -hmm. yeah there's a difference in there and let's have a look at this range how's that feel mm. Yeah. It's not as far as I would love, but we've done 30 seconds. It is, however, further than what we had before. Really important to have your clients strong through the latissimus dorsi on this side because they come to complain of piriformis pain on the contralateral side. Mm -hmm. and, and even though we're actually talking about um, shoulder pathologies, you still, still see people that will come in and, and exhibit both. So we're going to keep going through there because I'm going to, uh, th this is the area that we, the actual testing, so internal rotation of the arm. And um, we're going to keep that, that make sure that the wrist does not, co your hand does not go near the wrist because you've got proprioceptors up there. So you, you'll get false uh, testings for strength and that's not what we want. When we're facilitating the area, we're actually going to be working between the fifth and eighth ribs and it's directly underneath the, the, the nipple line. We normally laugh and talk about it's nipple line when you're 25, not when you're 85, because it's probably out here somewhere. But I want you to come in and palpate yourselves. So you're actually going to feel, you're going to find, find um, I'm just going to stand a little higher. So you're going to be coming down through the ribs, underneath the breast, uh, the tissue, so you can feel the floating ribs 10, 9, 8. And just rub in that area for yourself right now. So you're going to be rubbing in that, that region. Let's see if I can make that a little bit bigger without being completely annoying. Yeah, no, 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 no. Nope, that's not going to work. Yeah. So once you've rubbed there for 30 to 40 seconds, I want you to then come to your spine at the back and you're going to feel for your erector spinae and knuckle in just at the lateral border of your erector spinae. And try to do that on both sides. Now, obviously, if a client patient comes in to see you who's got um, shoulder pathologies, they're not going to be able to get to these ones at the back because taking their arm into that that internal rotation will be too difficult. But you want to try to fire up as much as you can in that region. I'm just going to show you 
just another modified. If I'm in the clinic, this is how I'll explain it to my clients in the okay, clinic. So this time we're going to test to see how strong your functional backline is. I know it doesn't mean anything really to you, but what the functional backline means is how our body, when we walk and move, that the back muscle, the latissimus dorsi on that side and the glute max on this side work together. And what they do is that that muscle there and this muscle here helps support the pelvis. So when you're moving, it helps with a thing called formed closure. So I just make sure that everything's locked. People that have instability in their, in their um, hips and pelvis, sometimes they can have a thing called pseudocytica, so something that'll go down the back of the leg. That can all come from this line. A lot of therapists will actually treat and work on the buttocks, but I've found that if we just check and see how strong the latissimus dorsi is, then that will make a difference down there. Great. So to test you, all I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to turn your arm inwards. That's it. I'm going to keep away from your wrist and I'm going to make sure that your shoulder's nice and flat. I just want you to keep your, your arm in that position and that's actually a key point when you're testing your clients and patients that the shoulder when you get them to internally rotate their arm that they actually stay with a shoulder that maintains um it doesn't pop that humerus up so if they can't actually do that then it's going to be an indicator it's a it's a, a false negative so it's that we automatically will facilitate facilitate the lats Don't let me move it away for me, one, two, three, hold, stop. And she's really weak. A little bit weak, yeah. yeah. Let's test this other side. If you can hold that arm in there and don't let me, that's it, hold it there. Don't let me move it. One, two, three. Yeah. It's surprising how many people I treat have really, really weak latissimus dorsi. And that muscle, we don't really treat, we don't really look after when we're in our. Um, in our practice, like when we go to college, we don't really learn tips and, and um, techniques for the lats. This is going to be a great one. So I'm actually going to lift up your underwire bra and I'm going to find the ribs about number five, six, and seven, and eight. And you don't have to do anything. I'm just going to come right in here. And what we're doing is it's kind of medial to the clavicle. So from your collarbone, it's about halfway. So if you get halfway, you probably find that you have the set of the nipple and down and it's straight up to here. And these points can be really uncomfortable. Yeah. The way I'm, I'm doing that technique is I'm sitting on the skin and I'm rubbing the skin on top of the neurolymphatic points. So when you're doing it at home, it's the same thing. You're not kind of rubbing over the top, you're sitting down on and rubbing it on top of. And again, we do everything for 30 seconds. When you do this at home, what you'll do is you'll find that the, um, the stronger it is, the less the pain. Oh. Yeah, and that's when you kind of go, oh, I feel pretty good now. Yeah. We're gonna do the second point, and it's really important to do the second point, and it's exactly behind there. I'm gonna feel for the erector spine, the muscle back, I'm just outside of it, and do the same thing here. Yeah. How's that feeling pain-wise? Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. Sometimes this one can feel fine and the one at the back can be yeah. really, really uncomfortable. Doesn't happen all the time, maybe 5% of people. Yeah. I'm not going to do the other side. I'm going to let you do that at home. Yes. <laughs> we work about 30 seconds for everything. And then I'm going to retest. So turn that arm in for me. Hold it there. Don't let me move it away. One, two, three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so really super strong. Yeah, that's a great job. Well done. So, comments like really super strong, and it is a comment that I will say quite often, <clears throat> more is the point that a client will sit there and say, Oh, wow, because they actually are surprised that they've actually had that kind of dramatic change in their, <clears throat> their shoulder pathology. <clears throat> so, it feels <clears throat> felt really weak, and then it's felt quite strong. What we do after we've done anything with the Chapman's reflexes or our neurolymphatic points is we always try to give a take-home exercise. So A, they're going to facilitate for 30 seconds once a day. It doesn't have to be forever, 
but they have to build up that that neural connection, that neural drive. So they might do it every morning for three weeks and I might drop it down to a couple of mornings, yeah, three or four mornings a week for a few weeks and then down to a PRN. So you know, once or twice a week if they're feeling that they, they are weak or limited. What I also like them to do is do some low load muscle activation. So that we have to, have to encourage the latissimus dorsi to know what it wants to do. And it's got to be that, the capacity to keep that shoulder in a fixed position. So what you're going to do is you'll see that, that you can actually do this. I'm going to get you to, to palpate, find your medial malleoli. Hang on, I'm just going to get me out of screen share for a second. So find your medial malleoli down at your ankle and then come up about three centimetres and palpate behind there. So you're in the tibialis posterior. Have a, have a dig around there right now. So stick your fingers into your medial malleoli on, on one leg and on the other. Have a feel and tell me and just know whether you are having tenderness in there or not. Yeah. So you should have had a chance to have a bit of a, a, a play with that. Now what I want you to do is I want you to get the hand of the side that was painful and put your hand on a surface that's probably about, I, I use my thigh, so I'm gonna rest my hand on my thigh and so that my, my, my humerus, my arm is hanging perpendicular, so it's straight down along the spine and like along my ribs. And I'm going to gently press with the heel of the hand into my thigh and then I'm gonna relax it. So you, it's like you're pressing, like you're um, dribbling a, a basketball. It's, it's movement from the elbow, not movement from the shoulder. When you press down, you should actually, if you put your hand underneath, if you put your hand underneath here, you'll feel the lateral attachment of the lat as it crosses over the, the, the inferior portion of the scapula. And as you press down, you'll feel your latissimus dorsi engage. So press and then relax. Press your hand down and then relax. Press down and relax. While you're doing that, I'm just going to explain what we see in Maya's functional backbone is we quite often see a short leg on the same side as the dysfunction. We might see that there's um, a anteriorized or a posteriorized ilium. In this case, when the lap plays up, it will be a posteriorized ilium. And they quite often come in complaining of stiffness and tenderness in L4, 5, um, L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And they will generally always complain of pain in that tibialis posterior when we palpate it. So you should have done about 20 of those gentle hand presses by now. I want you to re-feel that, that tibialis post region. And then I'd love to see some comments. If you can put, if you can hit your thumbs up or just do a thumbs up, if you feel that you've got change, if there was reduced pain, thumbs up, thumbs up. Yep, good. Looking through your pages. Yes, there's thumbs over here, good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So um, that's homework that we know uh, that the, the functional lines, it, you know, we're not just looking at shoulder. We can have clients that will come in complaining of piriformis pain syndrome. They can come in complaining of ankle injuries, ankle, ankle disorders. We need to be going further along those kinetic chains. Just don't stop at the one area. Excellent. All right, I'm going to just jump back into our screen share. Over here again. So once we've established that we, oh, yeah, oh. once we've established that we've woken up that, that um, functional back line, the latissimus dorsi and the attachments for the shoulder, we can now go through and, and go into our defense patterns. So when we look at our clients, defensive positions will put us into posturally weak um, muscles, the chest and thorax. Uh, you'll see that hyperkyphosis um, 
will increase, they become more kyphotic because there's no support, there's no strength back here. There's no strength back here because it can't do it. It's too tight here, so we have to address this. Um, I'm just going to get a video up so you can see exactly what we are doing. Thoracic extension is very, very difficult to maintain when we're in defensive patterning. Remember that defensive patterning is all about our fright, flight and fight. So we close down here and the intercostal muscles contract, diaphragm contracts and this whole area when tight chronically will create problems in the shoulders and in the neck and all the way down into the arms. So let's assess and see what strength we have with our client arms in full extension. So Patty, arms over your head. I'm not worried about whether there is um, elbows out and wide or up. We're not looking at lat versus pec in any of this. We're looking at extension and the capacity for the extensors to hold strong. So keep your arm back for me. Don't let me push it up. Hold it back, 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 back. You can see it's quite tight. And I always over tell the client because it's quite a weird position. Hold it back there for me, hold it back. You can see there's movement, yeah? So that means that we need to be working all the way through the entire portion of the ribs in between the intercostals. It can be quite tender. Yeah. Patty's face is saying, don't be yes. like this. Be gentle. You might need to take two or three times at working through this area to really get a good um, opening. Remember it's defensive. Remember that they're not going to like this area being stimulated and woken to open. I'm just going to do one side so we can see if we make change between the left and the right. Alright, so we've done nothing on this side. Actually bring them back and bring them over. Does it feel different left to right? Mm, yeah, this one does feel different. Okay. Getting it back across easier. Alright, so easier in the movement, which is a tick for us. Hold this one backwards for me. Still got that movement. Hold this one back for me. Yeah, I'm applying a lot more strength and you're holding that back a lot easier. Yeah. Really important to address our defence problems that our clients will have. This is a beautiful, easy treatment and really part of a good upper body um, protocol. So I saw, uh, where's he gone? I did see uh, Dr. Anurag had your hand up. Did you have a question, Doctor? I've lost you. Let's get out of this. I'm just yeah, trying to you find can unmute you. yourself and ask your question if you want. I think uh, you can continue, Paula. Oh, okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you for that. I, um, I just couldn't quite hear either. Um, and I'm also going to show a second, like that, that, the value of, of this work, if you've got, um, if there's a modesty issue with this work, which is perfectly fine, I've got that um, doing patty as obvious for ribs for the video footage, but for my, my patients that I'm working on, I would be, could put towels or, yeah, they're all fully clothed anyway. But I'm just going to give you the secondary option for um, the way I work with, a client in the in the clinic. Simone, right now what we're going to do is I'm going to test the quality of your ability to stay in this position. So that position means that the muscles of your back are actually strong and the way that that happens is that the muscles at the front aren't short and weak. So when we sit in postural positions like this, these shorten and become really stuck and immobile and people come in and complain of pain at the back like you know how many times you see people go i'm really sore back here i'm really sore back here it's because these are so tight they're loading you down so the muscles at the back are like anchor chains really pulling so to test that 
I'm going to get you to bring your arm over your head for me. That's it. I'm going to get you to hold it down there and don't let me move it to the ceiling. So you're going to hold it down. Ready? One, two, three. Hold it down. Yeah, so there's you can much. see her neck yeah, muscles firing too. How much movement comes through from here? It's not really necessary uh, unless someone is super, super tight. So if you take both arms over right, and do it a little slower for me. So we're going to watch what's happening here. So take your arms overhead. Yeah. And there's just a little tiny bit of lift at the last 15 degrees. So that's pretty good. That's actually what we want to find. So what we're going to do is I'm going to wake up the area for the thoracics. So we're turning on these ones to open them up to allow these guys to get more strength and, and support. And it tickles, yeah. I know. It's the same as when I turn on the hip flexor. Yeah. We're actually working at the front to get better results at the back. Now, if someone's really, really ticklish like this, I would get you to do this for yourself. Um, and I'm just kind of coming between the ribs like that and working through them. So that's when you're treating your clients at home. And you feel that there's... Yeah. yeah. So we've been blessed enough that Simone's got some fusion in these ribs here and some um, more weakness on this side. Yeah. She doesn't like that much at all. See how many therapists can make you laugh in a click. Yeah. That's right. So it's about 30 seconds with area. You can go a little bit longer in that area when you're rubbing because it's quite a large area. Okay, let's take that arm over your head again. Good. Hold it back there. Don't let me lift it. So hold it down. One, two, three. Yeah. So it feels a lot different, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's surprising. So that so, mm. oops, sorry guys. Um, so clients who come to see you in the clinic complaining of shoulder pain, overhead movements, when we look at our arm ranges, we know that we can get um, our arms up through range, the shoulder range is about 165, and then the last 15 degrees only works by thoracic extension. So you will only get this high. If it's one arm, we get rotation. So your body will actually rotate to get the last 15 degrees. If you're stuck thoracically, you start seeing these patients that come in to see you with shoulder pathologies. They'll have tendinopathies, they'll have bursitis, they'll have, they can have even some tears um, because they're not getting that, the arm range. So the, the change of where the humerus is going to sit will be completely different. It'll be altered for different people depending on whether they're tight on the lower thoracic, mid thoracic, upper thoracic. But any of those, people that come in to see you with shoulder pain and, and change the range, then you're going to have to test and see what quality they've got holding that arm in that position there whilst I take the, try to bring it forward. Um, if they complain of pain, they can only take their arm back a certain different um, level. That's fine. That's your starting point. If once you elicit the, the contraction, it only is the um, can they hold it instantaneously or is it weak automatically? If it gets pain straight away, then then that's a, a, a positive as well. So that would be an indicator to facilitate that area. Now, I've treated clients who've come in to see me with shoulder pathology, shoulder pain, and worked just those two, the latissimus dorsi and the thoracic work, and have had massive changes in full range and pain restrictions. So it's quite powerful, the, the work that you will get from that. So gentle fingertips, because it can be very ticklish, and you can get your client to go over the top. So remember, we're on the skin, we're putting our fingers down onto the skin and then onto the superficial fascia and we're, we're mobilizing through that way. I've got one more slide uh, video that I want to show you with, with the spiral line. Now our spiral line is one of Maya's big lines and it addresses, it, it actually attaches right up at the, the occiput on one side of the head and it 
feeds around, loops around underneath the, the rhomboid on the opposite side, the opposite shoulder, and then back across to the same side again through the obliques. And then it houses down through the lower limb and back up through the, the um, sacred tuberous ligament, up the erector spinae and on. So you can see that, that lovely, beautiful, bloody picture of the, the rhomboid. We actually try to facilitate that muscle. By facilitating that muscle, it will reduce um, complaints of pain in the teres, our rotator cuff. People get that, that particular trigger point pain and that will work on that. So let's go have a look at this slide. Rhomboids. I'm Paula Nutting, your musculoskeletal specialist. Okay. Today's video addresses trigger points all through the rhomboids and how we can address that issue. The anatomy trains reveal lots of hidden secrets about the body. The spiral line in itself will show up tender points or trigger points down the teres group. Many of us just work on this area, but in actual fact, it quite commonly comes from a muscle group that's not working properly, and that muscle group is our rhomboids. When these don't contract as part of the spiral line, we end up with an overuse of a secondary muscle group that shouldn't be doing the job. When we assess for this dysfunction, what we're looking for is stiffness along the lateral cervical joints, quite tight through here. We'll also feel a stiffness and pain on palpation when we're treating our patients in prone from T1 through to T4. It's because that spiral band comes along here, wraps underneath the scapula and across the opposite portion of the body, comes back up the spine and it attaches back up here again. So we're going to assess for trigger points here and I'm going to show you an amazing muscle activation or low load recruitment technique that will sort the trigger points out. We have our client in prone and we need to do one more assessment technique and that's to see if there's a palpable taut band with or without trigger points in the teres. And you can feel me or see that rolling of muscle. And if I push firmly enough. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to actually feel yourself to see if you've got um, pain in that region. So you're actually going to palpate underneath your own arm right now and palpate for a trigger point in there. It only takes a couple of seconds. Your other hand underneath the humerus at the distal portion. Palpate gently on just on the medial side of the scapula and instruct them to do a low load recruitment exercise. So he's going to lift the humerus off the table and then down and completely relax. Keep that going for me, Bruce. Coming up, down and relax. We're looking at the fibers of the rhomboids firing and it's a spiral line and you can actually see his entire torso taking a rotation. When the rhomboids become more efficient, his body will actually stop doing that rotation because the rhomboids will be more effective in their strength and they'll return to a better length. The special tips here are that they lift focusing on their elbow and when they come down, they completely relax the entire shoulder complex. A low load muscle recruitment exercise dictates that the muscle has to turn off before it turns on. And that's really important. If we don't do the, the muscle off then on, we're not going to get the value out of it. So what I want you to do is I'm going to just stop the screen share for a second. 
I want you to stand up against a wall and you're going to actually just grab one more. Sorry, I'm just going to screen share so I can show you one, the actual image that I want you to do so that I'm not explaining something that's crazy. All right, so what I want you to actually do is you're going to stand in this position right here. Let's put that up, bang. So that picture there, you're standing with, um, no, don't do that to me. And show, show people. So you're gonna be in that position right there, a foot against the wall, an arm against the wall. I can't stand this thing. It's doing too many good. So you're gonna be standing with the same side that you were in pain. I mean, I'm just gonna get this share. So the same side that you're in pain, you're gonna put your, that foot against the wall and you're gonna put your hand with your arm straight against the wall as well. And I'm gonna get you to press your hand into the wall and then relax it. So the elbow stays straight the entire time. You're actually engaging your rhomboids when you do this action. So press your outside of your palm into the wall and then relax and press and relax and press and relax. And you're going to keep doing that for me till you've done 20 of them. So once we've completed the 20, you are going to, um, you're going to palpate underneath that Terry's again. And I want to find out whether it's gone. So in a perfect world, once you've done it, palpate in there and check whether there's still pain. And then the last thing you're going to do is you're going to get against the wall. Corrine, is that eased off? Because your face looked like you've, that you've just dumped your trigger point. I know, it's magic. We love that stuff. So back against the wall again, everyone. Remember at the very start, we did the hand reaching. Let's see if that's changed. Dr. Sanjip, you want to put your elbows together. Yep, up over and back. That's great. How are we going? We found that there's a difference in that movement pattern. A lot of people with they're absolutely frozen, which is fine. Yeah? Easier to perform it. Yes, very much. So, so, Corinne, so we, that's your homework. As, as well as getting into the lats, getting into the thoracic cage, turning on the lat, and turning on the rhomboid. Those four little activities get so many of my clients and patients from, from pre-surgery to no surgery. So, Craig, we've got... 10 minutes, 11 minutes to, for people to ask questions that I'm happy to answer. Yeah, there are a couple of questions already uh, on the chat. Order. Okay, um, the patterns obviously decrease our breathing. Yes, absolutely. Luke, that, that they will automatically decrease our capacity to breathe because of the intercostal spacing. So um, we want to really come in and start by turning on the neurolymphatic points for the diaphragm. And that, as I said earlier, tapping along the sternum and then getting them to do diaphragmatic breathing. So one hand on the chest, one at the, at the, um, the, the base of the ribs, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth and really trying to engage that diaphragm. Uh, uh, maybe question. Samanjit or Saurav will have a few more questions on the question form link. Oh, okay, so I just hit that link. Um, one second, sir. Thank you. Yeah, over to Saurabh, Saurabh Ji. Yeah. Yes? Uh, looks like uh, uh, no one has posted any question. One question is there. Uh, one second. <clears throat> Uh, Can you see the questions? I, I, the, the, there was nothing in the, the question form that I saw. No, wait, last. Uh, do you have any uh, 
evidence based article for neural lymphatic uh, technique one second Uh, yes, in many instances they will, the, the neurolymphatic points. Serratus anterior will definitely, uh, you'll definitely assist that with the thoracic defense. It'll pick that up as well. Okay, so next question it is, uh, next question is, uh, <clears throat> so the neurolymphatic stimulation, is it, uh, is it in any way similar to MFR or there is no involvement of fascia? No, 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 it's not, not at all. I'll do my facial release work but uh, in conjunction, but no, it's a standalone because we're working a neural arc primarily. I find that if you work the nervous system first, then everything else uh, improves. If, if, it's almost like you think of a hose that's kinked, a water hose that's got a kink in it. It becomes less efficient. Stimulating the reflex endpoints on the neurolymphatic chains will actually unkink that hose and get much better quality of neural efficiency to any of the muscles that we're working with them. <clears throat> okay, sir. Okay, ma'am. Slide number uh, seven. Okay, if anyone has any doubt, please unmute and one, please ask. One yes. more question, Sandeep. Uh, yes. had a question. Yeah. Yes. Do these anal points assist activation of the lower trapezius and serratus anterior as well? Yes, yes, I did. I, I thought I had addressed that. I'm sorry about that. You have answered uh, yes. that, Paula. Yeah, I had already yeah. answered that and said, yes, that, that is the case. Yeah. Okay. Paula, Sandeep has got a question for you. Go ahead, Sandeep. Uh, Ma'am, I have two questions for you. One, uh, one first question is, can you pin again explain the elbow maneuver or elbow testing for latissimus dorsi? And second, sure. what are the indications uh, to incorporate all these uh, testing when patient comes to us, because they come sometimes with the different, different clinical symptoms. So there are some indications that pointed out that you should go for this particular testing in that. Because in India, mm. uh, many of the patients, many of the females are believed to have shy, they don't tell, but they definitely have these kind of a problems. And we, uh, we, in our postural assessment, we do get that, yes, this is the, uh, you know, culprit over here and we have to treat. So if you uh, share some indication or any, you know, your experience, it will be good for us. Sure, absolutely. Firstly, the, the numbers, the slide, the se that seventh slide that you were asking about. Yeah. Um, gonna... Ma'am, it's, it's a, this manual, uh, just use. There. So you can see that one? That's the logistics. Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's, as you can see that position there, my elbows are staying together. My mm. palms are facing my hand, my face, mm. and mm -hmm. I'm trying to reach. So I'm actually getting a stretch and strength yes. of the latissimus dorsi by doing that maneuver. People that yeah. come in that might be really super tight, um, that I might limit it down to um, simply me going, get your elbows together mm. and get them to do just, just that. Because sometimes mm -hmm. they can't even reach their hands. Or it might be just as high as there and no yeah. further. It's just to slowly encourage a strengthening maneuver, yes. which is also going yeah. to do an eccentric contraction. Yeah, thank you. And the second question, it's really, it's a great question because we have um, culturally, we, like women don't like you to, to be going through the anterior portion many times anyway. I tend to speak to people and go, um, the body is, is a whole, as I'll sit down and say, the, the body will try to do a task focus. It doesn't, it doesn't go, I'm going to do a bicep curl. It, does, it doesn't think like that. It thinks, I've got to pick up the glass and how will I do it? And I'll explain that when we become defensive, we use any muscles that will take to provide that task. And then we get an overload of muscles that are trying to do their original task and then a different task. So we might see someone with pain in the shoulder, but it's actually coming from an unstable pelvis. Um, yes. And the analogy I'll use, I'll go, you know, someone who's having a heart attack, but mm -hmm. they're not complaining of heart, they're complaining of the jaw or their arm. Yes, ma'am. And I'll, they'll understand that. It's, it's mm -hmm. very, very, I'll go, it's, it's the same with the human body. So, 
and you can ask them, I, I would like you to rub this area because we can strength test away from the, the trunk and they can do their own. You can sit there and say, I want you to rub like this and do it on their arm, but mm -hmm. I want you to do it in the, the thoracic area. I want you to rub in this and you can show, I want you to rub on you where mm -hmm. I'm rubbing on me. Okay. And that, that will help. Yes. It is a trick. Is Thank you, ma'am. Does anal points assist for dysmenorrhea? Yes, there is a point for dysmenorrhea. Um, dysmenorrhea, dysmenorrhea dys, dyspareunia, all of those. There's uh, the sacrum two, three, and four bilaterally. So I'll get the knuckles and I'll knuckle in behind at the, at the sacrum. It doesn't affect the shoulder, <laughs> but it will, affect, it will help with, with the neural support for the pelvis, along with the internal obliques. Um, and there's points for the internal obliques as well. Again, we need to try to support that pelvic cage. And good breathing. So diaphragmatic, if you're breathing in, you should be relaxing, relaxing the pelvic floor. When you exhale, you should be in contracting the pelvic floor. So we're actually like pumping the contents like that versus compressing and, just, and relaxing. So most, most people think it's quite counterintuitive, but if you, we say don't pee, don't poo, as you breathe, um, as you're breathing in, you relax. As you're breathing out, I say don't pee, don't poo. So you're gently contracting the posterior and the anterior pelvic floor. Get them to do that for a minute, a couple of times a day. Okay. Can you, uh, can you share any article links or websites where we can get more knowledge regarding NLS? Yes, absolutely. There's loads of, of information on my website, uh, which uh, I can I can pop into the links here. Um, or if you just Google Paula Nutting and you'll see it, we'll give you a link to my, your musculoskeletal specialist. And that's, that was my link. Uh, the hypermobile with the elbows is easy, but I had great response after pushing against the wall. Yeah, yeah. So people will say, I've had pain, but it actually feels better now or I felt weak, but now I feel stable. I well, I've, was heavy walking and now I feel much lighter walking. So they're all signs of um, the body going, I feel stable, so therefore I'm now mobile. Paula, can uh, I just pause you there for a second? Yeah. Just to say to everyone, guys, this is now, from now on, we have a five minute uh, comfort break. Uh, Paula is gonna stay online. And if there's any more questions, she's going to answer them from the chat box or verbally. But you're welcome to go and grab another cup of coffee, make a smoothie, uh, and then come back. And time on my iPhone is 9.59 South African time. So we will start at 10.04 South African time. We will introduce Yash Pandey and uh, his presentation. Okay, so quick five-minute comfort break, but Paul, you can continue. Yep. So I was just looking at, at Isha's question about elaborate about the pseudo sciatica. I'd happily answer that. When, when we look at our functional backline uh, and in defense and fear, we close the anterior and we hip flex. So once we've got into hip flexion, the piriformis, um, the, the hips become less stable because the gluteus maximus is now weak. So when we've got contraction of the hip flexor, the hip extensor can't, can't maintain a good quality strength. So the ilium then becomes, the anominate becomes a little bit more unstable. So two things happen. One is that the hamstrings will turn on and you'll have chronic hamstring tightness with anyone who has got weak glutes because they're trying to maintain stability. So my big peeve is do not beat up a hamstring until you've turned on the, the muscle activation for the glutes because the hamstring, you'll get changes of range, you know, centimetres. You get them from, from 45 degrees to 90 degrees by just facilitating the hip flexors and the hip extensors and getting the neural support there. The second thing that happens is that this, this piriformis will tighten because it's trying to stabilise that, that, that non-fixed in and or around in 90% of cases through that piriformis. So that's when they start feeling a pseudosciatic symptoms and they normally go just generate to below the, to behind the knee, but they won't go down further. So we 
stimulate um, the gluteus maximus and the latissimus dorsi on that chain, and that would generally get rid of the pseudosciatica. I would request Jordan, madam, to ask question verbally as she was uh, asking about hypermobility. I didn't get your question, madam. So kindly unmute yourself and ask question verbally to follow, ma'am, please. Is Jordan uh, still? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was just saying how um, putting the elbows back was very easy for me. So it's not. Um, if the person is hypermobile, that testing's not going to work. Yes, you know, it was, correct. It, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're right. That testing won't. Uh, the the length testing will not work with people who are hypermobile, but the strength testing will always work with people who are hypermobile. So I'll I'll always err towards strength testing, and that that will give you your quality response. Sorry, my, my clock's just dinging. <laughs> sorry, sorry, just quickly. Um, that strength testing. Are you talking about taking the arm back? Yes. Or... yes. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and all of them. The arm back for the thoracic extension, and the uh, the in internal the for the dorsi. Yeah. Okay. All of the work that I do to facilitate. I'll, I'll get a client that comes in, and I'll say. Uh, I can do a number of things. I like to try to start with our neurolymphatic work um, because I find if we can turn the nervous system on, then everything else will flow better from there and it will cut down the amount of treatment that you need to offer them. Um, so this, the tests for an entire, for my entire defense pattern test, there's about 13 of them and they take less than two minutes. So it's easy to go through and look at hip flexion, hip extension, uh, functional la lateral, this lateral sling, functional backline, abdominals, lower limb, um, and upper limb. And then I, I'll make note of the areas that are weak. And I might just go, look, I'm just going to give this a little rub here, 30 seconds, and they will see a notable difference. I'm, and then I'll say, okay, now we've got two choices. I can do this and wake up all the other areas that you were weak with. And then we can retest and see how you feel when you stand up, when you walk, you know, flexion, extension. Um, or I can just do a massage. And they will normally always say, no, I would like you to do the wake up because it was a notable change with the first, the first one. So I always have to get buy-in. Patient buy-in is really important. Paula? Yeah. Um, so... Are you saying that you would always do neurolymphatic first, say before AC joint dysfunction, rib dysfunction, thoracic, or myofascial work? Yes, I would do the. I'll turn on. I'll turn on the hose first, get yeah. the nervous system up and running. Then I'll look at um, AC and SC joint mobility. I'll look at the cervical spine because, um, as Karen was saying before, the cervical spine is massive with shoulder pathologies. Mm. Um, yeah. I'll also have a look at the contralateral gramellian obturators because the glutes on, on the hip flexors or hip rotators on a contralateral side will make a big difference to the shoulder on the opposite. Okay. Because they're both um, rotator cuffs. Okay. The, the oh, that cuff makes the hip sense. And the rotator cuff of the shoulder. And we know that, that, like, that the cervicals will, will mimic Dysfunction at the cervicals will mimic dysfunction at the lumbar. So C1, L5, C2, L4, and on it goes. Okay, it's the same. We're, we're looking at these beautiful kinetic chains. And they can stretch their glutes at home. Yeah. Hola. Yep. Hola, um, I want to say thank you very much. I want to apologize because I'm going to stop you now. Um, you thank you I'm so happy. much. Uh, awesome presentation generated lots of discussion and questions. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of um, formal physios, like myself when I was a formal physio 20 years ago, are a lot more interested these days in the neurolymphatic um, circulatory pathways and yeah. exciting the uh, those channels. And um, I just want to give you guys a heads up that Paula will be teaching line with club physics you'll be doing a couple of modules happens reflex modules and so look out for that in future advertising in a couple of weeks time 
Well, thank you very much for being a part. Please stay online. Please continue to stream with us any of the future um, presentations that are interested to you. And thank you mm -hmm. once again. Thanks very much, everybody. Glad you had us. Well, awesome. Thank you for having me. Take care. Thanks. Okay, uh, and I'd like to uh, extend a very warm welcome back to Yash Pandey. Uh, Yash and I go back a number of years. Yash has worked in professional sport for a long time, he's worked in tennis, he's worked in uh, football, he's worked in many other sports. He has a business called Peak Performance and he is a high performance sports physiotherapist. So Yash is going to talk to us this morning on shoulder biomechanics, biomechanical abnormalities and the relationship to overhead injuries in athletes. So Yash, thank you for sharing your slides. You are good to go. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Uh, good morning in Europe and Africa. Good afternoon in India. Uh, can somebody just confirm me if I'm audible and there's no break in my voice? Okay, perfect. All right. So, uh, hi guys, my name is Yash and uh, I've been dealing with overhead sport, uh, mainly tennis since last eight years, uh, traveling on the ATP World Tour, Davis Cups and uh, a lot of other tournaments. So, I thought it would be interesting to share my knowledge on uh, similar lines. Okay. So, uh, the topic that uh, I'm going to talk about is biomechanical abnormalities uh, in the shoulder uh, for an overhead uh, athlete and how it can lead to injuries. Oh, awesome. um, so, can you make it the zoom actually, make it, make it full screen? Is it possible? Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, to, uh, just to start with my credentials, I run a company called Peak Performance. It's a chain of high performance sports rehab uh, clinic. Um, I've been involved uh, with the ATP World Tour, uh, traveling with a lot of uh, Indian professional tennis players, uh, along with some Canadian and European tennis players as well. Uh, been part of the Davis Cup since 2013. Uh, I've also been part of the Indian Football Federation. Uh, uh, this is something different which not a lot of people get to work with but I've been involved since last five years with the uh, Ten Pin Bowling uh, Federation of India. I work with a lot of Ten Pin Bowlers. Um, work with the Hong Kong Federation uh, with the tennis. I was lucky enough to be part of uh, Sheffield United FC uh, during my uh, post-graduation in UK. Uh, and yeah, of course, uh, All India Tennis Association and yeah, very lucky to be in the Rio Olympics uh, with the Indian contingent. So that's my credentials. Um, so we are getting into this topic about biomechanics and uh, overhead injuries. Uh, now what's the need? Why do we need to know uh, that? So the first point is to understand uh, the basic forces uh, that gets involved when an overhead motion happens. And once we have an understanding of the forces, we can always evaluate uh, the condition or the injury in a much better way and we can treat it in a better way. It also helps us to target uh, the root cause of the problem. So a patient who comes in or an athlete who comes in uh, with an impingement or a rotator, rotator cuff tendon uh, inflammation, uh, obviously that's the symptom and that's the injury that has happened there. But what actually led uh, to that injury would be really interesting to know and if we can solve that we can always have like a long-term um, effect of the therapy uh, also you know we can also prevent a lot of injuries in uh, future uh, especially when you see uh, when you're constantly working uh, with tennis players or any overhead athletes and you have a pattern that you see if they have restricted mobility if the scapula deviates more than normal or any other biomechanical uh, imbalance in the body, you can always work on them so that the patient or the athlete doesn't really get injured and you can prevent that injury. Uh, to start with, what are the overhead sports? Uh, I've put in a few pictures and there are numerous sports that uh, we can uh, look at. Uh, but any sport in which the upper arm and shoulder arches over the athlete's head uh, whether it's to propel a ball or swimming or to throw a javelin or 
any of those uh, overhead smashes in tennis, a serve in tennis. Uh, you know, so all those are going to be your uh, overhead sports. So like I said, serving and smashing in tennis, pitching a baseball, throwing in American football, throwing in handball, bowling and throwing in cricket. Uh, spiking, smashing in volleyball, smashing in badminton, the release and javelin throw, and the propulsion during swimming. There are numerous other sports that uh, can be put into this category. Uh, what are the most common injuries uh, that we see? Now, according to Laudner and Cypress, uh, the most common injury that uh, they came across in their research uh, was uh, impingement. Uh, the subacromial impingement, which accounted for 27% of all the shoulder injuries. Uh, this was followed by rotator cuff tendon injuries. Uh, it could be tendonitis, tendinosis, tendinopathies, tears, uh, you know, up to 24%, uh, followed by inflammation of the biceps tendon, uh, slap lesion in 8% uh, shoulder cases, and uh, AC joint. So these are the top five injuries that are most commonly uh, seen in your uh, overhead athlete. And personally speaking, I've been since eight years. I've been traveling with uh, tennis players. Uh, impingement and rotator cuff tendon inflammation is something which uh, we have to keep a check on these type of injuries day in day out. It's not like you can let go and then if, because when you're traveling with a professional player and if injury happens, then you know it's, that's his bread and butter, and he would lose points, he would lose money, and uh, if he doesn't travel, then you don't uh, make money also. So it's very important in uh, understanding these injuries, understanding the biomechanics, also trying to prevent a lot of stuff and not end up in an uh, injury like this. Uh, which sport uh, has the highest prevalence of shoulder injury? So this was again the same study uh, conducted by Laudner and Cypress. Uh, they found that volleyball had the highest percentage of uh, injury, so 43%. Uh, and whatever uh, group of people that they selected, 43% uh, of the volleyball players had injuries, followed by baseball, softball, tennis, and uh, then swimming. Uh, so when we talk about overhead injury, it's um, a motion like I told you, your arm, your hand arcing over your head. Um, it could be throwing a ball or any other uh, equipment or a propulsion of water. Uh, so it's more or less a very common uh, technique that we use. There obviously can be a little bit of a biomechanical variations from sport to sport. But just to generalize things um, for overhead sport, what we're going to do is uh, have a quick look at uh, the biomechanics of throwing. Now, uh, in this picture, uh, there is a baseball pitcher who's trying to pitch a ball and it shows the different stages. I'm not going to go very in depth about explaining uh, each and every phase and talking the muscle action. I would like to keep it simple. And as and when I move ahead, I'm going to uh, pick up points again from here and we'll try and correlate. So the first phase is your wind up phase. You're trying to prepare your body uh, for the movement, for the action. Uh, the second phase, uh, we move on to the early cocking phase. So in your first phase, there's not too much of a movement that you see from the shoulder. From the cocking phase onwards is when the shoulder starts moving. And obviously, when we look at any of these motions, it's not uh, just the shoulder that we look at, but uh, we look at the entire uh, human body as a chain right, right from the foot to the head. Uh, you know, so it's very important to understand uh, lower body when we look at uh, shoulder also. So, uh, but the problem here is with the limited amount, uh, amount of time, we are not going to go in depth of talking about the lower body and uh, trunk control and stuff with, in relation to uh, shoulder injuries. We're going to keep ourselves a little to the upper extremity and thorax. So, um, so like I said, wind up phase, not much involvement of the upper body. It's the legs, it's the trunk rotation that happens, uh, which uh, gets you ready to uh, into the, the cocking phase. Uh, in your cocking phase, it's you get into an external rotation. So again, a cocking phase will be divided into an early cocking, wherein you have close to a 90 degree of external rotation and a late cocking, wherein you go into a hyper external rotation. Now, it's very important to have that excessive external rotation range of motion in your shoulder because that is what is going to uh, give you that uh, power to, and momentum to throw the ball. From late cocking, we go into a phase of acceleration, which is, starts from end of extreme external rotation 
and it comes when the ball is in it ends when the ball is released uh, this stage is a very forceful uh, contraction of your internal rotators and like i have mentioned above it's it's one of the fastest human motions performed um, and the internal rotation velocity will reach uh, up to you know 7000 to 7500 degrees per second so imagine the amount of uh, imagine the speed uh, and velocity there okay so a really forceful contraction of all your internal rotators um, and not just the subscap which is the primary internal rotator but also along with a little bit of help from the pecs and other uh, surrounding muscles so once the ball is released your um, acceleration phase ends and then you your body your shoulder your muscles have to control the movement of that arm to try and decelerate so from ball release uh, we enter into the deceleration phase wherein the velocity is kind of getting reduced um, after the release of the ball and there's a lot of work now happening from the posterior rotator cuff uh, group of muscles trying to uh, decelerate uh, that arm we're going to do a proper talk on concentric versus eccentric uh, work in my future slides um, and the last stage is obviously the follow through wherein your arm and hand will go into a cross body adduction uh, and the trunk bend uh, forward so that's how a basic uh, overhead motion would look like and uh, as we go further we'll discuss more uh, in detail uh, so if you have to throw a ball efficiently or if you have to throw any equipment in an overhead position what would be your biomechanical contributors so there is going to be a rotational movement that happens at the gh uh, joint your glenohumeral joint there is contribution of scapular thoracic joint there is your scapular humeral rhythm coming into picture your ac sc joints will go into elevation and rotations you have your thoracic spine um, that works into extension and then a lot of stiffness in the thoracic spine is also a reason uh, for shoulder injuries which which we'll discuss uh, later uh, you need to have a proper lumbar pelvic uh, stabilization through your core muscles uh, there has to be a momentum transfer from the lower body uh, into the upper body and it's actually the force that is produced from your legs core and then transferred into the arm which actually um, gives you that speed and that force uh, of throwing uh, and overall like i said an entire kinetic chain activation activation it's not just the rotator cuffs which are working here but everything from your hip flexors to your core to your knee to your hips to your uh, pegs to your rotator cuffs to your stabilizers of your scapula everything has to work uh, in a proper pattern to have the most efficient uh, throwing action now if at all there is any problem in any of these uh, areas uh, there is a huge risk of uh, getting into an uh, injury and i mean like i say every every point of time when we uh, play any explosive sport or any sporting activity and we keep repeating it the body is constantly getting injured but those injuries are micro injuries and with time and with proper circulation nutrition recovery the body will heal back but then if that biomechanical imbalance continues over and over and over that's when you will end up in a proper injury and the body won't be able to recover by itself um so the causes of injury now this was one of the studies uh, that was done by kipler and uh, litner kipler is a very famous uh, uh, scientist to have done a lot of work on shoulder and a lot of research a lot of research paper has been published uh, under his name uh, so according to him uh, the list of uh, in the biomechanical causes for shoulder injuries the, the main thing would be the glenohumeral uh, internal rotation deficit which uh, in short we call as gerd which is a restriction of the internal rotation range of motion um, the rotator cuff strength imbalance is another important factor uh, that he uh, spoke about in his paper uh, scapular dyskinesis which is the abnormal or excessive or uh, uncontrolled movement of the shoulder blade uh, could again be a big reason why somebody may have uh, or end up in a shoulder injury uh, stiffness in the thoracic spine or an increased thoracic kyphosis uh, would be another reason why somebody may get injured 
and muscle activation pattern between your serratus anteriors, your traps, between your upper traps and lower middle traps and you know things like that. And obviously, like I said, the lumbar core instability issues. So if you your core is instable, your trunk cannot have a proper rotation. If your trunk cannot rotate and get stabilized properly, your arms cannot do their job. And when we look at lumbar core, we can't forget your hip mobility and strength. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the glenohumeral uh, rotational movement, and uh, we're going to lead to the glenohumeral internal uh, rotation deficit. Now, in general, uh, approximate uh, range of motion for internal as well as external rotation is close to 90 degrees, 5 to 10 degrees here and there, uh, especially in the internal rotation. Uh, but when you look at a picture like this, so this guy is a baseball pitcher uh, who is towards his end uh, cocking phase. Uh, and if you see and try and you know gauge how much his external rotation would be he is going close to 160 170 degrees uh, into external rotation so according to the textbooks your external rotation range of motion should be around 90 degrees but then this is this is double of what you would expect and uh, this is what is also one of the sporting adaptation uh, that happens due to continuous throwing and with this, we come on to a concept of something called as a total range of motion. So uh, uh, when we look at uh, shoulder range of motion, like I said, 90 degrees in front, 90 degrees going backwards, which makes it around 180 degrees. But when you look at this picture, uh, the picture on top, uh, you will see the internal rotation range of motion is close to around 60 degrees and the external rotation uh, range of motion um, is around 100 to 110 degrees. Uh, and the next case wherein you see the range of internal rotation is restricted, but this player has gained external uh, rotation range of motion. So this is the sporting adaptation that you will see with most of the tennis guys, you will see it with most of the baseball pitchers, cricket bowlers, swimmers, they will always have uh, an external rotation range of motion much higher than normal. In my work with swimmers, uh, most on an average, uh, the range of motion of external rotation that I would see would be at least 120 degrees and plus. Okay? And a huge amount of uh, uh, patients come in with an internal rotation uh, deficit. So I hope this picture uh, is very clear. So first case, uh, more internal rotation, uh, around 70 degrees and then 110 degrees of external rotation and there is due to a sporting adaptation you end up reducing your internal rotation and then you gain your external rotation now the theory behind this is uh, what a lot of researchers say is because of constant uh, hyper external rotation the cleaner humeral joint adapts itself into a position in which the normalcy when we look at this position, when we say this is the starting position, now for them, this technically becomes the starting position. And then you assess the shoulder from that. So it's like a repositioning of the uh, shoulder into a slight externally rotated uh, position, which enhances the external rotation range of motion and uh, reduces the internal rotation range of motion. Uh, coming to uh, uh, good uh, internal rotation deficits, uh, you see this guy in the picture. Uh, the left side, which is the non-dominant side, goes down all the way. Uh, the dominant side is stuck here. Okay, so that's one of the uh, classical examples uh, of uh, somebody possessing uh, GIRD. Uh, one of the best ways to assess is obviously make the patient stand, uh, put both the elbows on the wall, and ask him to try and go down. And if he can touch his palm onto the wall, making sure that the elbow and shoulder is at a 90 degree uh, position. Uh, and yeah, and you'll clearly see another way you can also check is in lying down position. Uh, so glenohumeral internal rotation deficit is, like I said, an adaptive process in which the throwing shoulder experiences a loss of internal rotation range of motion. Now, it's not that everybody who ends up uh, losing internal rotation, we are going to put them under the category of uh, GERD positive. So there is a specific range uh, deficit that we look at. 
and for somebody to be called as GERD positive, we would look at at least more than 20 degrees of uh, restricted range of motion. So a patient or a player comes to you and he has a 5 or 10 degrees end range restriction, uh, which is going to be very common, not just in overhead athletes, but also in general population. We are not really going to tell him that you have a GERD positive. But if that patient or any other patient has a 20 degree plus uh, range of motion restriction as compared to the contralateral side, uh, we will definitely uh, put him under this category. And obviously then it requires uh, a lot more attention than normal. Um, when we look at patients with GERD, it's not just that the internal rotation range is restricted, but it is also the cross body adduction range uh, that is restricted. And if you uh, now go back again and think about the throwing posture, the the last follow through phase is where you are decelerating and the body rotates and the arm um, uh, does adduction cross body manner. So uh, along with internal rotation, even the cross body adduction uh, gets affected. Uh, so what is the uh, science or the theory behind why this happens? So what happens during uh, a forceful throwing action is especially in the deceleration phase when uh, the arm is moving at uh, 7,000 plus degree per second velocity, it has to be controlled. Now, if the shoulder or the ball and socket hasn't been controlled, it technically would just pop out of your uh, glenoid fossa and end up in an anterior dislocation or something. So this work of controlling the motion is done by your posterior group of muscles uh, and the posterior capsule. So all your infraspinatus, your TVs, your lats, your posterior capsule, posterior deltoid, all these are your muscles which are going to contribute into the eccentric contraction to decelerate um, that arm. And when these muscles are contracted eccentrically, so they are kind of lengthening in a, you know, in a controlled manner and still producing a lot of uh, tension in, that, in them, uh, there is always a micro trauma that is happening. It's not necessary that somebody has to throw thousands of uh, balls to get into a micro trauma. It can come up with every uh, throw also. So over a period of time, there is going to be accumulation of those micro trauma and the micro trauma will end up um, in a scarring effect. And we know that when there is scar, the scar will um, contract and the contraction of the scar will lead to a contracture of a muscle or the tightness of the uh, posterior capsule. And that's the most uh, likely proposed uh, thesis for why a, a GERD would uh, happen. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I already explained that. So what does uh, internal rotation deficit would do on shoulder biomechanics? So the posterior superior uh, humeral head translation during caulking uh, leading to possibly leading to an encroachment of the rotator cuff tendons against the posterior superior uh, clinoid. So I have a shoulder uh, model here just to explain. That's the anterior view of the shoulder and uh, that's gonna be the lateral view. So whenever there is tightness around uh, the posterior aspect of the capsule and the muscle, there is gonna be a little bit of the tendon. So if I use a pen right there and put it that way, that's how your rotator cuff, uh, your supraspinatus mainly would come out. And that's basically your insertion of that uh, tendon. So whenever there is tightness here, the tendons are also getting encroached and it will lead to impingement of uh, those tendons. Uh, there is also a reduction in the acromiohumeral distance. So you see the distance between the acromion and the head of the humerus. And like I said, that's the supraspinatus coming in. The distance, ideally the space as it is, is very narrow. And with uh, repeated uh, throwing and tightness and everything, the space will further get reduced, again, due to slight elevation of that uh, head. Uh, on the scapula, there is going to be a passive pulling of the scapula laterally. So if these guys get tight here, so all your TDs and infra gets tight, your shoulder wants to go out, but these guys are so tight that it's going to pull the shoulder blade along with it. So it's a passive pulling. It's not an active uh, muscle contraction. It's because of the stiffness, it's getting dragged and not uh, the natural movement. 
there is also slight anterior tilting of the scapula during the humor, humeral uh, internal rotation. So again, a lot of uh, biomechanical errors happening uh, with that GERD when uh, we look at the glenohumeral joint as well as the scapular positioning. Now, so one common example that I give to all my athletes, all my physios working with me is imagine you have a shoulder which doesn't go beyond this, okay? And your throwing motion requires you to go all the way here and then get into a crossbody adduction. So if your shoulder doesn't go beyond that point of internal rotation, what will happen is your overall shoulder blade will go into protraction, anterior tilting, the scapula is going to move out and eventually this will end up in, uh, you know, the, like I said, the impingement would be a reason uh, due to this. Uh, you may end up a repeated impingement may end up in a rotator cuff tendon inflammation. Uh, somebody with a restricted internal rotation again may end up in AC joint uh, arthritis or inflammation because again the acromion is going into an anterior tilt and that puts more pressure on the um, AC joint. So multiple uh, things. Uh, I've been working with a couple of uh, pro and top Indian level, Indian uh, tennis guys and uh, who have I mean these are the guys who have. Uh, slap tear, uh, one guy having slap tear, another just an anterior labral tear. So what was the one common finding that I saw in both was the uh, restriction of the internal rotation motion. So if uh, the player has played multiple tournaments and he's doing well in the tournament, so he's making semi-finals, finals, so matches after matches and um, the shoulder is getting stressed week, week by week and in usually in tennis at least uh, a player would play five to six weeks in a row. So if you're doing well, there's a lot of uh, work that the shoulder is doing and there's not much time uh, to rest. So uh, over the prolonged exertion of that shoulder with an increased, uh, will lead to an increased internal rotation uh, deficit. And then the patient or the player may experience an uh, increase in pain uh, at his uh, labral, labral region. Now here, uh, you know, so the, we know that MRI shows that there is a labral tear, but the player was playing normally. It's just that the strain got increased, the stiffness of the shoulder got increased, and then the symptoms got precipitated. Now, what we usually do in cases like this is try and uh, manage the range of motion, do a lot of mobilization work, do a lot of uh, scapular setting exercises, a lot of strengthening work, a lot of proprioception work try and bring the range of motion again into play and in few weeks time the patient the player is going to be again ready to compete uh, so there is also a safety guideline uh, well obviously not most of the players actually follow this but this is guidelines uh, given in the research uh, to protect the athlete's shoulder and it's advised that uh, the side differences in internal rotation uh, range of motion should be less than 18 degrees uh, and the difference in total range of motion uh, which is the combined range of internal versus external should be not more than five degrees so this is uh, like a safety guideline and if a player technically has more than uh, this uh, as a deficient range then he is going to be a high risk and it's important that we work on it before the player participates in any um, explosive throwing activities uh, next, we move on to scapular motions and that way we'll head on to scapular uh, dyskinesis, which is going to be the second important uh, reason for your shoulder injury. Uh, when we look at uh, scapular motions, scapula will move in uh, your sagittal, coronal and transverse plane. It has, uh, you know, trans two translation movements, which is the superior and inferior translation and the protraction, retraction uh, as a translation motion. It also has three rotational movements which is your upward and the downward movement. So if I go there, so upward and downward rotation, you have internal rotation and external rotation, and you have anterior tilt and posterior tilt. So these are the three rotational uh, movements uh, that's happening. I'll just pull out an image just for you guys to uh, understand. Uh, so the first image is your upward downward rotation where you see the inferior angle goes out and in. Uh, if it moves outwards and upwards, that's your upward rotation. Uh, 
So that's the, the figure A is your posterior view that you're looking at. Uh, figure B is your uh, top view. Okay, so you have uh, the internal and external rotation wherein the medial angle, uh, medial border of your scapula goes out and in. Uh, the third is a lateral view that you're looking at and which uh, depicts your anterior and posterior tilting of your uh, scapula. So these are your natural range of motion that has to happen for a smooth overhead motion. Uh, but a lot of time there can be excessive movement happening or sometimes there could be a lesser movement happening and that could result in injury. Uh, so if you see this image, this is like an extreme case of uh, scapular dyskinesis. Uh, we can't even grade him technically because he is showing all, all grades of uh, scapular dyskinesis. There is elevation, medial angle, medial border coming in, inferior angle coming out. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a bad situation here. And most likely there could be a, a nerve involvement that uh, would have happened and not really a muscular dysfunction. Uh, so in overhead athletes, uh, they have a very high prevalence of uh, having scapular dyskinesis, uh, about 61% as compared to non-overhead athletes. Uh, the common symptoms, somebody who comes, uh, comes somebody who has, an, uh, has a scapular dyskinesis, there could be an anterior shoulder pain, a posterior superior scapular pain, there could be a superior shoulder pain, there could be proximal lateral arm pain or any combination uh, of the above. And uh, like a lot of time when a patient uh, comes to me in my clinical setup, uh, he will not really know if he has a scapular dyskinesis. He may come saying that my shoulder hurts in front or side or my arm hurts or I have pain around my scapular region or I have neck pain. And when I try evaluating him and look, try looking for uh, uh, the scapular dyskinesis and if it's present, and then I show him the picture and he obviously had uh, no clues what's going on and he always probably thought that something like this would be normal. So a patient not necessarily may walk in into your clinic uh, saying that I have scapular dyskinesis or I have unstable scapula, but that is a finding that you will have to assess and find out and possibly link that uh, biomechanical abnormality to the complaint that the patient comes with. And always and always uh, these symptoms which is produced due to scapular dyskinesis are in serious. It's a, a progressive onset uh, of symptoms. It's never a one-shot uh, injury that he would come with. Uh, classification of uh, scapular dyskinesis. Uh, again, Kibler has classified it uh, pretty nicely. Uh, the type 1 or the inferior dysfunction wherein you only see the uh, inferior angle of your scapula bulging out, which is you see in figure A. Uh, the type 2 is your medial dysfunction, wherein your entire medial border will bulge out along with the inferior. And the type 3 will be a superior dysfunction, wherein your, uh, there is excessive elevation of your scapula during overhead uh, motion. And it's commonly, it looks like uh, somebody who's uh, hyperactive in traps and something like that and you will see excessive shrugging or a hiking uh, shoulder movement when you ask your uh, athlete to go into an overhead motion. So that's the classification. Uh, now, uh, what are the biomechanical mechanisms uh, which can lead to deviation in scapular movement? Okay, so these are some of the muscle and joint related uh, problems that will end up into something else. So if your uh, serratus anterior is not strong and is not, um, or it is strong but can't activate adequately, uh, that would lead to a lesser scapular upward rotation. Now, if you know the glenohumeral, uh, not the glenohumeral, but the scapular humeral rhythm, then you know that the serratus anterior and the upper trap, upper fibers of your traps will form a torque, which will, you know, uh, laterally rotate uh, your shoulder blade. So beyond 90, if you have to go, your, your head will get fixed or the, the GTE here is going to get into the acromion and there's no gonna, not going to be enough space to move. So the scapula has to align itself and that's the work done by your serratus anterior and your uh, upper traps muscle in combination. So if you have an inadequate uh, activation of your serratus anterior, there's gonna be lesser uh, scapular upward rotation. Also, 
uh, lesser posterior tilt and it would lead to more anteriorly uh, tipping of your uh, scapula. If there is uh, excessive upper traps activation, there's obviously going to be an increased elevation of the scapula. If your uh, pec minor gets tight, now the insertion of that is on the coracoid process. So when that gets tight, it will again tilt your scapula anteriorly and there will be an increase here now, not decrease, but an increase in uh, scapular internal rotation. So like I told you, I mean, there could be uh, structures which may increase or decrease the scapular uh, movement. Uh, posterior glenohumeral uh, soft tissue tightness, again, greater scapular anterior tilting. It's all pulling uh, the scapula more forward and tilting it anteriorly. Uh, somebody who has a fixed thoracic uh, posture or an increased thoracic kyphosis, there's again going to be a greater internal rotation. There is going to be an excessive anterior tilt and there's going to be a lesser upward rotation. So all these things you can now try and think or you know look at next time when you see a case with shoulder injury it comes with you think if there's an impingement or um, any shoulder uh, uh, injury you try and think about this structure and see if it makes sense in your assessment and uh, in your rehab uh, i'm going to quickly run through this one uh, so this is again scapular kin kinematics during arm elevation uh, in healthy and uh, pathologic states uh, so the Primary movement of the scapula in healthy uh, person would be an upward rotation. Uh, the secondary motion is the posterior tilt. So when you get into a, a throwing motion, there is an upward rotation when you abduct your arm to 90 degree. And then during an internal external rotation, your, your scapula has to go into a posterior tilt. That's the secondary motion. And there could be a few other things along with the secondary motion that may happen called as an accessory motion. Now, a patient who comes in with impingement or a rotator cuff injury, there is going to be most likely chances that he has a lesser upward rotation. Okay, so the primary movement of the scapula, which was upward rotation, that is reduced. So now, if, if that's the socket and that's the ball, and if my ball here is getting stuck, and there is no proper movement of the glenoid to give it a proper leverage to increase the further range of motion, there is going to be a reduced space in the subacromial space. Also, there could be an internal impingement. Uh, same thing. Uh, so again, in impingement, there is going to be lesser rotation. There is going to be lesser posterior tilting. So again, the scapula is more positioned anteriorly rather than posteriorly. That again reduces your subacromial space. Uh, and there is going to be a greater internal rotation. Uh, when we look at glenohumeral joint instability, we look at again lesser upward rotation. Uh, there's no consistent ev uh, evidence for the secondary uh, motion, which is the posterior tilt. And there's going to be adhesive capsulitis. We don't really want to talk so much about it. So that's how your uh, scapula will uh, behave again with the previous slide talking about uh, with structures either getting tight or weak and how does that affect your scapular kinematics and when you look at an injury a patient with or a player with impingement or uh, instability comes to you what are the certain things that you should uh, definitely look at uh, the third uh, for your uh, injury in the shoulder would be rotator cuff strength and balance and uh, so when we look at rotator cuff uh, as uh, a muscle, it's a four, a four muscle. Uh, it is a mover as well as a stabilizer. So it will create internal external rotation, but also step your um, head into the glenoid fossa. So it works both uh, stability wise and mobility wise. Internal rotator is always stronger than your external rotator. Even though there is only one internal rotator, your internal rotator will always be stronger. Uh, and like I explained to you previously, when we are looking at a throwing action, there is during your cocking and early and late cocking, there is a concentric work that happens uh, by the external rotator and an eccentric work that happens by the internal rotator. And when we go on to uh, acceleration and deceleration, phase, we are looking at a concentric work happening in the internal rotators. Whereas the external rotation will contract eccentrically and you know control the overall uh, you know, one of the studies by Tate uh, et al. in 2008, they uh, found out uh, 
the effect of torsion on rotator cuff strength. So somebody, so this is not really somebody who has a structural posture or a permanent posture. Even uh, you can practice among uh, you guys when you sit in a very slouch posture and you assess your. So somebody who has a uh, who has access to an isokinetic uh, machine for shoulder can always do that. Sit in a bad posture. Try and sit in a slouch posture, wherein your shoulder is more protracted, scapula is more tilted. And then try and test your shoulder in a 90-90 position, and then get into an erect posture, shoulders retracted, and then test. So you'll always see that when your uh, posture is proper, you when your uh, scapula is protracted and the ball and socket uh, position, and your thoracic spine is properly aligned, you will be able to generate more strength. And uh, when we really look at uh, Athletes who've been playing, say, tennis players in general will have rounded shoulder. Just because of that, and you know, hundreds of thousands of balls they've been hitting, so they will generally have a tendency of having a rounded shoulders and protracted shoulders. So, which we know that is a reason which could lead to an uh, reduction in strength of the muscle. So, always uh, working on that is really important. Uh, so that's the. Uh, isokinetic I was talking about. If you have access to it, uh, please do test yourself. Um, again, here in rotator cuff, there is also a cutoff values uh, that we can uh, put down. And when we look at um, strength between uh, the same side, internal versus external, and at the same time comparing internal, internal, and then external, external, there are certain guidelines for that. So uh, your uh, strength can be tested isokinetically, eccentrically, or isometrically. Uh, isokinetic is one of the most favored uh, tests, but obviously the machines are expensive, so it's not very handy to do this. Uh, so you're uh, on an isokinetic uh, testing in a 90-90 position, your uh, ER-IR ratio has to be 60%, 66%. So your external rotators have to be at least 66% of the strength that your internal rotators would generate. Uh, on the same thing, if you look at an isometric strength, then your uh, external rotators have to be at least 75% uh, as compared to your internal rotators. Uh, and when we look at non-dominant dominant side, there should not be more than 10% difference. Or in other words, your uh, dominant side should be 10% stronger than your uh, non-throwing side. Uh, so what this is also one of my experience that I have seen working with so many tennis players is no matter three times a day I am making them do rotator cuff strength work, all the internal external rotation and everything. Uh, when they come post the match and when I assess their external rotation strength, it, they are always going to be weak and they will probably be weaker than you know what they went into the game with. So they always finish the game and come back weaker and that's also a reason to look at why somebody, uh, you know, if you continue playing without breaks and the muscle doesn't have time to recover, recover it will end up uh, in an injury. Uh, so these days, a lot of focus has been shifting on uh, eccentric strength testing, um, uh, you know, uh, so especially targeting that uh, deceleration uh, mechanism, which is the most common reason why rotator cuff imbalance and strength uh, injuries would happen. And uh, there are different ways, again, you can test your uh, eccentric strength. Coming on to thoracic spine stiffness and hyperkyphosis, uh, I also mentioned previously, when you have a slouched posture, you have increased thoracic kyphosis, there is going to be a reduced scapular upward rotation. Okay? There is going to be a reduced posterior tilting. And why this is happening? Because the normal position of the scapula is already in an anterior tilt. So from that position to come back into a posterior tilt is going to be a lot of effort. There's going to be an increased uh, scapular internal rotation. There is going to be increased scapular elevation. There's going to be increased scapular anterior tilt, like I told you. Uh, and eventually, all these things contributing to a reduced uh, joint space, um, reduced space between uh, the humerus and the acromion, and at the same time leading to strength imbalance. So these are going to be your reasons why somebody who has a thoracic spine uh, stiffness or an increased thoracic kyphosis uh, may complain of a shoulder pain. So obviously, uh, targeting all these structures is uh, really important. Uh, then we come to the muscle activation pattern. Okay, now when we look at muscle activation, 
the major muscle we can look here is the serratus and the uh, traps. Uh, so your previously mentioned here, the upper traps and the serratus anterior uh, are your muscles which are going to help you in the overhead uh, motion and it works as a torque. So if your serratus anterior gets weak and your uh, upper traps get hyperactive or starts doing too much to compensate for the weak serratus, uh, then it will again end up uh, in a trouble. So uh, in that case, what you would see is a reduced scapular upward rotation and reduced posterior tilt. Uh, so the scapula can't go backwards again. Uh, there will be an increased scapular elevation due to the hyperactive traps. Uh, again, overall leading to impingement and uh, rotator cuff uh, pathology. Um, if there is delayed middle and lower traps activation during overhead motion, it will uh, again end up uh, in a decreased posterior tilting of the scapula, which is one of the function of the lower traps um, and leading to impingement um, and similar problems. So in summary, if you are uh, assessing shoulder or you are working with shoulder athletes or you're working in a clinic and you have to see uh, an athlete who is overhead and not just think about overhead athletes, but also uh, think about a general person who comes to you. Uh, he may have a lot of imbalances in his body, a lot of biomechanical errors in his body, and that could be your primary reason why uh, he is getting into shoulder pain. So assess the range of motion of your glenohumeral joint, um, assess the strength of the rotator cuff, look for any alteration in scapular biomechanics, like we spoke about the tilts, the rotations, uh, things like that. Look for scapular dyskinesis. Uh, assess the mobility of the cervical and thoracic spine. Uh, look for postural, look for postural deviation. So, uh, like I said, if, if a patient walks into your clinic or if you're involved uh, in any sport uh, which requires overhead movement and your player suffers with shoulder injury, you try and tick all these points. And along with this, there's a lot of other things like I mentioned in the beginning. Um, your uh, stability in your uh, lumbar pelvic region, uh, strength of your core, mobility of your hip, your strength of your glutes, everything would matter. But as far as the upper body and thorax is concerned, these are the major things that you're going to look at because any of these things could be the primary reason why you have uh, a shoulder injury. Uh, to end with, I always say, uh, the best way uh, to deal a problem is to first assess it properly. If you can assess and try and find the diagnosis, that is really important. It's going to be great. But what is, what is going to be even more useful is try and identify the root cause of the problem. Because if a patient comes with a rotator cuff uh, tendon inflammation, uh, that is his symptom and his injury. But there could be various reasons because of which he has got into that state. And if you only target treating the rotator cuff tendon and not his biomechanics, he will again end up in the same problem or he may symptomatically get better and then go and play and again end up uh, coming to you with the same problem. Okay, so identify and treat the cause and not just the symptom. That would be uh, what I believe and that what I would want uh, all the physios to work also. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Yash. Thank you for that very informative presentation. Thanks. Guys. Let's have a look at the chat line and see if there are any questions. Yeah, so first. Uh... There is a question. Yeah. So, question for yes, sir is uh, Is posterior superior humeral head translation during elevation of the arm usually due to the rotator cuff weakness and or damage, or are there any other? So, like I said, there is obviously a tightness of the posterior translation during elevation of the arm. No, so like I said, there is uh, obviously the main reason is your tightness of the posterior uh, shoulder structures. But along with that, there is due to the constant playing and constant throwing activity, 
uh, it the shoulder naturally rotates backwards it uh, the lateral rotation of the head naturally happens and that becomes the normal resting position uh, of the shoulder also and definitely i mean everything is linked here so uh, the main primary reason is going to be your uh, tightness of the posterior structures participants kindly ask the question verbally if you want please unmute and ask your doubts increase the volume of your gadget please so just just uh, one second sorrow so i didn't get the previous question correct actually so i think karen asked me if uh, the posterior superior humeral head translation mostly due to weakness of the rotator cuff so it's not yeah. mostly due to the weakness of the rotator cuff but it is due to the uh, tightness of the posterior uh, structures uh, especially your teres your posterior capsules your annulus pollicis and those group of muscles it's more tightness related rather than weakness related. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Shri Gupta. Hi, Shri Gupta. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so, can you please repeat uh, the slide where you uh, uh, classified the uh, dyskinesia of the scapula, and also uh, uh, can you just repeat the point that you said mentioned the the uh, the adjacent structures which uh, leads to imbalances of the muscle and uh, yeah, exactly the same one. Thank you. Can you please? so see scapular dyskinesia like i said it's a it's a sign it's not a symptom so a patient is not going to walk in or your player is not going to come and tell you that i have dyskinesis this is what you will have to find out in your assessment okay so somebody who has scapular dyskinesia or dyskinesis may have associated problem which could be pain in front of the shoulder lateral shoulder you may have patient coming in with ac joint inflammation you may have patient coming with uh, neck pain ending up in spondylitis and things like that you see an hyperactive um, upper traps you will uh, you will have a posterior shoulder pain you may have a labral uh, issue but all these things could be uh, linked to scapular dyskinesis because your shoulder blade your scapula cannot move the right way and it, it doesn't give Uh, so there is going to be if the scapula is not stabilized properly there is going to be excessive work that will be done by the labrum by the rotator cuff to stabilize the glenohumeral joint and with stabilization if they are also trying to generate a lot of force that would be the reason why somebody is uh, injured okay so this is what the classification of your scapular dyskinesis is which is basically three different types uh there's an inferior there's medial and there is a superior uh, scapular dyskinesis the the second and third are your uh, you know more what you say problematic uh, areas that you want to really work on them okay so um, the, if uh, um, there is a patient with a, a slap lesion mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, has a uh, bucket bucket handle tear uh, that mm -hmm. shows in his mri Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, approximating uh, the the show, the scapula mm -hmm. uh, does it somewhere uh, helps in contributing to stabilizing the shoulder and i i know he is a he is a candidate for the surgery but yeah. how does as a physio uh, how do we like uh, like treat and conquer this kind of issues so again you'll have to really take a call on this depending on how his symptoms are coming up with uh, the slap lesion uh, and what is the sporting requirement of that if we work with a a bowler or a baseball pitcher or a tennis guy who has a slap lesion obviously the first choice of uh, uh, treatment is going to be rehab and my rehab is going to revolve a lot around uh, scapular strengthening work rotator cuff strengthening work a lot of proprioception work just trying to see if there is a uh, proper movement at the ac joint happening if the thoracic spine is all good so this is going to be my treatment that would be surrounding and i'm going to so like i'm i've seen multiple cases like this at a pro level uh, you know and the patient walks in with a lot of pain and general 
uh, external rotation positive, O'Brien's positive, and almost everything that you test in this uh, athlete will be positive. Now, if this guy is really a pro-level athlete, then you have to sit and discuss what needs to happen because uh, an injury like this, a tear like that, is not gonna be gone by rehab. That you have to be realistic, and it should be really important that you explain that to your player also. And at the same time, you give him that we have to try with rehab, and there is less chance that you will recover. Uh, and when I say recover, it does not mean your labrum will be back to normal. But you will recover and be able to do your sporting activity to your, at your highest level. But the chances are very less. Okay, so we will give it a try. And I would usually, for a really bad labral tear, uh, if I really have to give in uh, time, I look at three months time. Okay, twelve weeks time. In twelve weeks, if I see a significant amount of improvement, not just in his. Uh, biomechanics, but symptoms. And three months later, if I start loading him on throwing activity, and if he is okay, I would continue doing my rehab. Okay. If I do not see any significant improvement, test uh, special tests are still positive. Biomechanics has not improved, and the uh, functional patterns are still painful. So then you have to uh, be honest and tell your uh, player that you have to undergo uh, a surgery. So yeah, that that answers my question. But the point was that uh, uh, the patient has been having this tear for two three years, and he has been traveling, and he has not been having an issue until unless uh, lately he started complaining that the shoulder is popping out, which yeah. which really is a, a sign of instability of the shoulder. Right. So uh, so my my uh, treatment line. Uh, all around this uh, strengthening and uh, you know uh, biomechanically correcting the the scapular yeah. scapular uh, glenohumeral rhythm and scapular uh, humeral rhythm exactly. but at the same time uh, i convinced him to go for surgery or take an orthopedic uh, uh, opinion mm. and need to have a pre and post rehab both yeah. uh, because the uh, strengthening is uh, one part which plays very important role for good recovery in the post surgery also so yeah, uh, uh, right, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the there, but then he had a lot of issues with the shoulder. Every time he used to run, he used to feel that shoulder is popping out. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So next, uh, Dr. Sandeep wants to talk. Uh, Dr. Sandeep is on with you. Yes, sir. Yeah, can please. you? I can. I am audible. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yesh, I want to ask you a question that what will be the ratio for the external and internal? Uh, extensor uh, strengthening for the young athlete means adolescent athlete and the adult athlete. So, so I, I, have, can... I have not really come across uh, any specific research which uh, differentiates uh, the group yeah. uh, according to their age. Mm -hmm. But like mm -hmm. I said, it's like the general criteria between your ER versus IR if you are testing on an isokinetic has to be like a 66%. And you can... Mm -hmm. That constant for a pro or an adolescent also because why I would uh, say that is uh, whether it's a pro level athlete he's gonna give his hundred percent in his sport mm -hmm. or that he has to do uh, whether it's a twelve year old swimmer that comes to do to me mm -hmm. he's mm -hmm. also to give his best and push beyond the capacity so uh, here we are when we're looking at percentage it's not really looking at how much. Or really, uh, your external rotators would generate and things like that. So I think the ratio would more or less will remain constant through the age group. Yeah, you were mentioning in one of your uh, you know uh, uh, slide that internal rotators are more uh, stronger as compared to the external rotators. So we, when we are uh, doing a rehab or we are doing a prehab, uh, mm -hmm. should we keep more of uh, strengthening on a load on the external rotator and then give it you know. Ratio of like one is to two or two is to three uh, uh, for a research base or ex experimental base. No, for not experimental, but for sure that is required because you will mm. rarely see a patient or a player comes to you who says that I have a weak internal rotator. Oh, no, I mean he would not say obviously, but when you would assess, you would rarely find that there is a weakness in the internal rotation. I'm not saying it's not uh, possible. There could be. I have seen patients with uh, weak internal rotator. But if I see hundred uh, players with uh, you know in overhead activity sport, uh, I would say at least ninety-five guys would have external rotator weakness as compared to internal. 
so even during my prehab mm-hmm. work like when we do activation work uh, in the prehab uh, and working on the rotator cuff i would i mean combined rotator cuff scapular strengthening proprioception i would have at least 10 to 12 exercise in that group uh, yeah. and of, of which at least five exercise would be targeting external rotation and mm. couple targeting internal rotation and then along with that your scapular work on the rhomboids your lower traps your serratus your proprioception mm. like a, a, a activation uh, routine for the player okay any stabilizer activities uh, while you are giving this uh, external and internal strengthening exercises you have to look uh, you know uh, smartly or uh, very cautiously regarding any stabilizer who m- moves along with this also so smartly meaning what you are going to look at every stabilizer your serratus anterior yeah. resistor your uh, middle and your inferior uh, uh, traps lower traps are going to be your stabilizers so you will have to look at all these muscle activity now it's for and to look at serratus anterior activation it's it's quite easy especially looking at the winging uh, pattern and stuff like that but when, yes yes when you look at a uh, middle traps or a lower traps then you have to also look at how much um in the neutral position if if the scapula is naturally deviated a little laterally then you know that the rhomboids and the middle traps are actually not working okay okay so, yeah um scapula is actually tilted more anteriorly then you mm-hmm. know lower traps are not really having any effect in stabilizing and keeping uh, the scapula tilted posterior so these are would be like small inputs that you would uh, look at yeah one last question Uh, there are a lot of uh, players who have a dominant of a left hand in a cricket main majority if you see is a left hand bowler or a batsman he mm-hmm. has a uh, lower a low is a different kind of a posture lowering his uh, shoulder which is you know um, he is undominant upwarding to the other one uh, right right is upward so how to correct that uh, because they also showing lot of good changes um when we assess or they have lot of problem with the uh, internal or external rotation even the tightness at the stabilizers they are uh, i mean you so give you anything there doesn't equalize one shoulder is depressed and one is elevated yeah yeah elevated and uh, the stabilization also they are very tight and in external internal rotation also lot of difference and they are showing instability either or they showed lot of tightness over there and it is dominantly happens in the who bats on a right side and bowl on the left yeah. side so it's called as orthodox yeah so see here when we look at everything in place then mm-hmm. the players don't need you and they don't need me okay? yeah but that ideal athlete does not exist whether it's roger federer or rafa nadal or sachin or anybody that ideal exists yeah doesn't exist biomechanically at least okay mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. with the sport the amount of activity that Uh, the shoulder is doing or the spine is doing the scapula is doing eventually it has to adapt to that load and it will end up in certain uh, positional uh, you know changes that will happen in that so the only what you can do is keep working and keep assessing so uh, with in terms of like we spoke about the internal external rotation strength uh, assessment and ratio i usually recommend that a pro tennis player or a pro cricketer every 12 weeks he undergoes an isokinetic testing with or mm-hmm. without any shoulder problem or with or without any neck or thoracic or lumbar problem just to you know keep a track mm-hmm. on how he's deviating through the season you know start of the season you need to know his readings three months mm-hmm. later you need to know his readings and if you see that there is a downfall then you can always start start building up and doing more stuff with it and even if you uh, don't do certain things you know any bowler any tennis player any swimmer will have uh, you know a little bit of restriction in the internal rotation and if you don't work on it it will end up increasing increasing and then lead to injury so if you are working with a pro level athlete mm-hmm. then certain work has to be your daily task so for me when i travel on the tennis tour uh, my day starts with mobilizing the entire shoulder neck thorax hips you know everything and then doing a lot of dynamic work in terms of stretching doing a lot of mobility exercises which the, the player would do by himself so but i am going to get in there passively first to open those structures out then the player does his work then we do a lot of um, uh, strengthening work as an activation and only then he you know steps on the court to start playing anything so certain work yes. we, yeah 
Sorry. Yes, uh, Sandeep, yeah. uh, I'm yeah. going to have to yeah. cut in. I'm sorry. Um, sure, it's sure. 10 past, Thank you. 10 past Thank the you. hour. Thank you, Sandeep, for your interaction, your questions. Yash, thank you so much yeah, for your involvement. In case anybody wants to email me any doubts, I mean, they can. Yes, awesome stuff. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yash, yeah. if, you could, if you could put your email address in the chat line to everyone, that would also be great. And your web, uh, web address as well. If you could stop your slide sharing um, so we can move on to the next uh, speaker. As uh, Dr. Stephen Goldstein is got a few IT issues, so I've asked Stian Leroux to come forward with his presentation, and we will try and get Stian. Uh, we'll try get Steve Goldstein back a little bit later to do his muscle energy techniques. So I would like to welcome Stian Leroux from South Africa. Uh, he's a specialist sports physiotherapist. He has a private practice in. Paul Elizabeth, he's actually spent some time working in India. He can give you a little bit more um, information as to his uh, his work in India. But he's going to be speaking to us on an awesome topic called "Can you cut out shoulder pain? Conservative versus surgical management of the shoulder." I'd like to welcome Stian. I'd like to ask Stian to share his slides with us and. When Stian is ready, he can go straight ahead. Thank you, Stian. Awesome stuff. Sure, guys. Can you all see the slides and you can hear me? Yeah, you're perfect, mate. Great. Lovely. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, I am looking forward to chat to you all today um, about a, a topic that I'm quite, uh, quite passionate about. Let me just start my timer here to make sure I don't go on all day. Um, so, yeah, the, as you can see in the title, rehab versus surgery, can you cut out pain? I think that is a very relevant question for every physio. We all are facing this challenge of uh, chronic pain and we, do, we go through the motions of, of rehab and, and something I got a lot, especially in India, was people that um, has gone for lots of rehab and then end up with me six months later. And we've, we stuck with this challenge as to what's the best route to take um, for this patient. And I, I almost want to change my title and don't, I don't want to call it rehab versus surgery. Um, we're not in two camps and two teams uh, fighting against each other, actually. Um, us and so the conservative route and as well as the surgical options. We are all in the same team in the sense that we are all trying to help the same patient and we need to figure out what is the best thing we can do for that patient. Um, so yeah, the next question of uh, can you cut out pain um, is also an interesting one in my mind because you know we've got to ask ourselves, is surgery really the final solution? Is, is surgery the top of this treatment pyramid um, that our patient is is working his way up if he's got chronic pain. Um, is that going to be the solution for them? Um, so, yeah, let's have a look. Firstly, the epidemiology is, is rather important. I mean, we've got to figure out if there is a problem with chronic shoulder pain and with our management thereof. If there's no problem, then uh, we don't need to be here, right? So, Let's have a look. Lifetime incidence um, is about 20%, so it's, it's, it's rather high. More importantly, 50% of new shoulder pain cases will last for about six months or even more, right? So with all of these incidents sort of research that they do, the, it varies quite a lot. So I think 50% is, is kind of high, but it seems like it can be up to 50%, and I'm sure we've all seen those chronic shoulders that have been there for for ages um, and then 60% of patients with chronic shoulder pain have had it for more than a year. So if you do a study, you recruit people, um, about 60% of them um, that have got chronic pain will have had it for a really, really long time. Okay. Um, so yes, chronic shoulder pain is a problem. It has a, a large impact on people's livelihoods, I'm sure, or, or lives. Um, I'm sure you would know it does interfere with things like work and, and um, other activities, hobbies, or whatever it might be. 
but actually lo loss of sleep is, is a very common complaint. And if you don't sleep well, you get a whole host of other problems um, that go with it, right? So a large impact um, on society. Chronic shoulder pain is often managed surgically. Um, loads of surgeries every year. It's increasing. It's a massive health burden in terms of cost. Um, it's increased sevenfold in the UK um, since 2000 to 2010. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to what it would be now. I think the arthroscopic uh, surgical procedures have probably made it, it increase quite dramatically. Um, and the, the irony of it all is just any surgical procedure has got its own risk for developing chronic pain, whether it's musculoskeletal or other. Um, I mean, we're putting our patient at risk again for chronic pain just because they're being operated on. So that's, that's an interesting uh, thought to keep in mind. Um, so now let's, let's look at rehabs and, rehab and surgery. I want to focus on a few of the most common procedures. Um, and then I want to shift gears a little bit into this area of can we actually cut out pain and pain mechanisms? And, and is it worth operating or not? And hopefully I can shape our thinking around um, the assessment and the, just the clinical reasoning around that a little bit. So let's start off with subacromial impingement syndrome, which um, the name has been challenged quite a bit. Uh, as I assume some people might have mentioned it today. I've, I've had some technical issues on my side as well. My internet service provider decided to not pitch up today. So um, I've missed some of, the, some of the talks prior to this. But um, anyway, so I'm going to work with subacromial impingement syndrome for now. Maybe subacromial pain syndrome would be a, a bit better uh, description. So exercise is as effective as surgery. Um, and then, so we've got four studies at the bottom there. You can, you can look them up. Um, exercise has decreased the need for surgery by about 80%. And then there is a sham trial, uh, a really good sham trial um, available to, to look at. For those of you who are not familiar with that, it's basically comparing this um, subacromial decompression to a placebo surgery. So the patient does get operated on, but all they do is basically a, a, like they would do a diagnostic um, arthroscopy. That's all they do. They don't change any mechanics. They don't do anything so that is a placebo surgery. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So for subacromial pain, Seems like exercise is as effective as surgery. These studies were also quoted by Jeremy Lewis, um, who is a big shoulder expert, I think world-renowned expert. And um, so he stands behind this as well um, for exercise being as effective. We can get into exercise and, and it'll keep us busy for two days as to which exercise is better than which. But the point is, in general, it seems that the, the conservative uh, option seems to be a worthwhile one to take. If we look at rotator cuff tears, if it's a less than 75% thickness tear, exercise seems to be as effective as surgery. All right, studies at the bottom there, if we want to get into the nitty gritty of which exercises were done. If we have full thickness tears, exercise reduces the need for surgery by about 75%. Um, at the two-year mark, okay? So even with a full thickness tear, it's worth giving exercise and rehabilitation a shot. Um, I think the, the trick is that that two-year mark is, is quite far away when you're just starting out your journey with this patient. Um, and I think that is one of the challenges, which is something I'm, I'm also passionate about is about communicating with your patient and forming a connection with your patient and saying, okay, listen, this is the journey that we're on. If we can hang, if we can take this, this route, it might be slow, but you, there's a very good chance you don't need surgery, even with a full thickness tear. So two years is a long time. And I think that's about just communicating it well with your patient um, and getting them uh, to buy in to the process. I think that's, your patient is coming in with preconceived ideas and expectations and to really meet that. And I think I want that to be another sort of underlying theme for this talk is it's about so much more than just the shoulders, so much more than just the structure. 
it's about this human that's sitting in front of you. And if we, if we can get them to buy in and we get them on board, then that we can get them uh, at that two year mark where they most likely will not need surgery and they didn't go through the trauma of surgery. They didn't incur the costs of surgery um, and they didn't have the risks associated with surgery at the end of that two years. So it sounds, I'm biased because I'm a physio, but it sounds to me like a better option than, um, than getting the surgery done. All right, so that's rotator cuff tears. I wanna chat a little bit about the sham surgeries, which is the placebo um, surgeries. I wanna compare two of those. So the reason I'm shifting onto this now is, is this becomes really important because if we compare something to placebo, it needs to be better than placebo for it to be worthwhile, right? Otherwise, we can just use a different placebo with much less, less risk and much less cost to the patient. All right, so let's have a look at these sham uh, trials, the somacromial decompression and the second one for slap repair and biceps tenodesis. Two very mechanical sounding pathologies and procedures, right? So the first study, um, Group them into three groups, subacromial decompression versus sham versus monitoring only. And there was no significant difference between groups at six and at 12 months. They used the Oxford shoulder score as the outcome measure. So interestingly, if we let that, so it took me a while to sink in. I'm not, I'm not sure who is familiar with this study, but if you think about it, the actual changing the mechanics, by doing subacromial decompression had no benefit over a sham, which is just a placebo surgery. The monitoring only group, interestingly, were, were slightly worse off than the other two groups. So the other two groups um, at the six and 12 months mark were a little bit ahead with the um, functional um, coping or functional abilities but it was not statistically significant. And so huge impact. Um, patients at the end of the day improved. All three groups improved. I think that's important to keep in mind. All three groups improved, but the one where they actually did the surgery and actually changed the mechanics did not improve more than in the placebo surgery group. Okay. Going on to a slap repair, all these patients had a type two slap, um, slap lesion. Um, they, again, the three groups, one group label repair, the second group only a biceps tenodesis, and the third group was a sham. Again, um, open it up and close it. It was really high quality studies, both of these. They were double blinded, randomized controlled trials, and there were no significant between group differences once more at six or 24 months and there are the outcome measures that they used, All right? So no significant difference. So why would you wanna get a slap repair? I mean, we can debate about that. I'm sure there's a case to be made in certain situations. It's always tricky when your patient is sitting in front of you and this research works with groups of people, right? And this person sitting in front of me today is an individual and I need to figure out, is he one of the individuals that might actually benefit from this or not? So it gets a bit tricky if it's the individual, but I wanna at least put this out there for all of us to think about, because this for me was a huge paradigm shift in how I was, uh, was doing things, you know? Um, so interestingly, post-operative stiffness was actually um, present in nine patients and none of them was in the sham group. So they had no significant differences between groups, but actually the um, post-operative negative effects was present in some patients. Just a reminder of the, the risks involved in surgery. If the surgery is no better than placebo, then we need to weigh up if it's worth doing, right? Okay. So Chris Littlewood wrote a commentary um, and you, you can it's cited there at the bottom. So he says, we are still somewhat in the dark as to how different interventions have the overall similar effect, All right? So different interventions get us to the same end result, six months and 
12 months and 24 months down the line. And it's important here to, to keep in mind with placebo surgery, we could ask ourselves, what is placebo? I think it's got a very negative connotation. Um, but to keep in mind that placebo is all about expectation. If the patient expects to get better, so this is, this is very well proven, right? They walk into a room and tells the you, you, doctor tells the patient, this will decrease your pain and it gives them an injection into this drip or whatever. And the patient very reliably has got less pain um, 30 minutes later or an hour later, even if it's not an uh, analgesic substance, it might be saline or whatever. Um, and this, so it's about that patient's expectation, right? And so placebo, I think it has a bit of a negative connotation and we can look into that a little bit more. Placebo actually has got a, a strong uh, physiological, it's a, it's a biological thing, right? Um, I'm not sure if, if you guys know this. I came across this a while back and it's, it's another, so I'm trying to put these paradigm shifts in, um, into this lecture, things that shape me as a physio tremendously. Um, one of them was that you can actually block the placebo effect, okay? You can block it by giving someone an injection of naloxone. So naloxone is an opioid blocker, right? An opioid blocker completely eliminates the placebo effect, right? So they do one study, like I explained earlier, this will decrease your pain. Here's the injection. Very reliably, just about everyone has a significant decrease in pain an hour later. Now they just add naloxone as a second injection and an hour later, the patients are no better. What does that mean? It means that this placebo effect, the meaning effect, expectation is actually mediated by opioids that your own body produces. So endogenous opioids produced by the brain. Right. So keep that in mind for, for placebo. And when we communicate to patients about the possible surgery that they might be asking about or might be considering, maybe their doctor said something like, well, okay, you do, you know, six weeks or four weeks of physio. And if that doesn't work, we'll refer you to, um, to surgery or, or to the surgeon. You know, they need, to, they need to understand, they deserve to understand that there's a good chance that the, the positive effects of the surgery is largely due to placebo, not because they're changing the mechanics, right? Because if we don't change the mechanics in a placebo surgery, people also get better. All right, at the same rate than if we actually repair the labrum or do the decompression. So I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this, this communication to the patient and let, let them have all the facts before we, we sort of push them in a, in a direction. Okay, um, so the mechanisms behind why people feel better is actually, it's, it's, we're still a little bit in the dark. It's a complex system. And I would like to unpack that a little bit um, in the rest of this, uh, this session. Um, one more thing to mention here is asymptomatic MRIs of the shoulder. I'm sure you are all familiar to some extent with asymptomatic MRIs. Um, it's been done all over the place. So lumbar, cervical, you, you, you go look for it and there are plenty around. So 40% of overhead athletes had a full or partial rotator cuff tear. Remember, this is asymptomatic patients. They do not have pain at all. 46% um, of adolescent tennis player had some form of tendinosis, um, no pain whatsoever. Current shoulder pain versus previous shoulder pain versus no shoulder pain, three groups, MRIs, all groups presented with similar levels of pathological findings. All right, and then if you get older, in middle-aged people, 55 to 72% of them had slap tears. All right, again, asymptomatic. They didn't know they had a slap tear. I hope they didn't tell them that they've got a slap tear because that changes things again. Because remember, expectation, right? Um, so I'm trying to move away from the structure here, okay? Can we cut out pain? Well, we can cut out the structure, but it's not about the structure. If we go back, 
look at those structures. Those structures are pathological, full rotator cuff tears, partial tears. These are athletes um, and they are performing at whatever sport they are doing um, and they're performing well, I would presume, at least pain-free. Um, so what if we now find a, an, an MRI finding of a slap tear? What does that mean? Is that actually, is that tear causing the pain now or not? It's just not as straightforward as we used to think, all right? So I want to shift gears a little bit here. So I'm, I'm sort of at the fork in the road here in digging into more specific surgeries versus going into pain mechanisms. I feel like pain mechanisms would be more worth doing. Um, and I want to just add a few tools into the toolbox um, in assessing our patient and, and different things to consider. And um, when we consider referring them for surgery or further interventions, all right, our other option would be to dig into more um, specific surgeries, but they, these two trials, these two sham trials that I brought up was the only sham trials that I'm aware of where they've compared surgery, specific surgery to a placebo surgery, right? So if you have not compared an intervention to a placebo, it's, it's not worth for me for this talk to spend too much time on that because we just don't know if it's better than placebo. We used to think subacromial decompression is, is great until we compare it to placebo, right? Um, so let's rather dig into some pain mechanisms and have a look at the things we need to consider um, from a chronic pain and pain mechanism point of view. And um, when our patient is sitting in front of us on uh, Monday morning, if we're not in lockdown. So pain me mechanisms were summarized quite nicely um, by Notanet L 2016. Um, so they looked at chronic shoulder pain and what pain mechanisms could they find uh, were present. All right. So I just want to go through a couple of terms. Um, so the first uh, is pressure pain threshold. So that's something they use in quantitative uh, sensory testing. So they apply pressure to an area and they basically uh, see when the patient reports that they are starting to feel pain, they, they stop applying pressure and they measure that pressure. They've got a, a little machine, I can't remember what it's called now, um, to measure how much pressure input I need to get to give before this patient gets a pain output. Okay, so I just want to pause for a moment and just um, revise just quickly pain. The input is pressure, right? And the output is pain. And the patient feels the pain, they report it back and say, okay, this was 10 kgs of pressure, right, great. So that's pressure pain threshold. Um, hyperalgesia is another thing that's present in um, lots of chronic pain patients, but especially when the nervous system is sensitized. So hyperalgesia is pain to a normally, uh, sorry, an abnormal amount of pain to a normally painful stimulus, right? So a pinprick, for instance, would normally be painful and hyperalgesia is when that pinprick is more painful than you would expect it to be. They usually compare it if it's, let's say the shoulders, the affected area, they would, have, they would compare that with the opposite shoulder or another remote area. Okay, allodynia is pain to a non, a usually non-painful stimulus. So that'll be, usually they work with brush evoked allodynia. So it's just a soft paintbrush over the skin and often patients um, would have pain. So we can talk about that. That's another pain mechanism that we can, can find, which is um, a, a central mechanism. So it's a spinal cord that's really sensitive that creates pain potentially over the shoulder. If it's painful to, to soft touch, that would be allodynia. Right, condition pain modulation, also called DNIC, which is descending noxious inhibitory control. All right, so that's your the brakes basically. So your pain is const, your brain is constantly putting the brakes on all of the input, the nociceptive input that it's getting from all over your body. All right, so our brain modulates that input, and um, when we have chronic pain, that becomes a problem. More about that later. 
And then ex exercise-induced hypoalgesia, very, very self-explanatory. When you exercise, it has an hypoalgesic effect. Right. So let's have a look. So some research done on this on chronic shoulder pain. Right. Pressure pain thresholds in subacromial impingement syndrome. They found that there was lower thresholds um, in shoulder and remote areas compared to the control groups. Okay. Um, again, in chronic shoulder pain, the punctate stimulus, which is like just like a prodding stimulus, felt quite a bit sharper, which again indicates lowered thresholds. Um, so these lowered thresholds are signs of actually a central sensitization. All right. So it's not about peripheral sensitization. It's not about structure. It's about the, your central sense, your central nervous system, your spinal cord and brain are sensitized they are very sensitive okay so and we can see the effect of that hyperalgesia and referred pain predicted worse outcomes at three months after subacromial decompression okay is that a surprise well look at what your findings were if this is your patient in the clinic and you go okay they've got lowered pain thresholds um, which is a little bit tricky to test, but okay. Um, lowered pressure pain thresholds in the shoulder, as well as remote areas. Punctate stimulus felt sharper versus the control. Will this patient have a good outcome if we just do a local peripheral decompression where we change the mechanics? And the answer, according to this research, is no, because they've got a sensitized central nervous system because of that, the peripheral procedure was less successful in these individuals, all right? So if we can identify hyperalgesia, that's easy to test in the clinic. Referred pain, easy to see in the clinic. We must start thinking potentially central sensitization and this patient will not benefit from surgery, all right? Um, next slide. There we go. So pain mechanisms, again, pressure pain threshold, but this time for chronic rotator cuff, lower thresholds um, compared to the other side. And very interestingly, lower thresholds remotely, but only on the affected side. So they had lower pressure pain thresholds. If the pain was on the right, in the right shoulder, chronic rotator cuff in the right shoulder, they had lowered thresholds in the right quadriceps. Um, usually they do quadriceps or they do tibialis anterior um, for remote areas. And it was only on the right side in the leg um, and not on the left side, very interestingly. So you can see that widespread um, decreased pressure pain threshold. So obviously if your threshold is really low, it's gonna be firing with less pressure, okay? So that patient will be very sensitive to whatever stimulus they get, um, whether it's in the clinic or in everyday life, okay? So central nervous system definitely present in the chronic rotator cuff, as well as the previous one, which was the um, subacromial impingement. Another pain mechanism we can test for is super threshold heat pain response. So all they do is they give you five identical heat stimuli in a row, okay, but they, they, it has to be super threshold, so it's a painful heat stimulus, all right? So if we do five in a row, all of us will have, will experience the fifth one as being a little bit more painful than the first. It's a, it's a bit of a wind-up effect, but patients with chronic pain, and they found this in chronic shoulder pain, the fifth stimulus is a lot more painful compared to control groups, all right? So that is uh, called Temporal summation. Temporal summation is basically the wind-up effect that takes place in the spinal cord. That is a spinal cord mechanism. If you have uh, strong signs of temporal summation, this patient's central nervous system is sensitized. Okay. So again, and we've seen like in the previous study, if the central nervous system is really sensitized, these patients have got worse outcomes after surgery. All right, so again, so we've got three now. Um, three, sorry, let me just go from the first one there. So subacromial impingement syndrome, 
we've got chronic rotator cuff um, and here's a, a third one for chronic shoulder pain. Um, all of them indicating central pain mechanisms that are at play in these patients. All right, so if we operate them, it's less successful. So um, condition pain modulation, let's have a look. Chronic patients, um, chronic shoulder pain patients have less effective CPM response. And there's no change at three months post-surgery. So the hope that surgery would change the central nervous system sensitivity, which is definitely possible. The central nervous system is an incredibly complex system and loads of things change its sensitivity. But in this study, they found that three months post-surgery, the, the condition pain modulation was still not back to normal, which means they control and so the brain's um, inhibitory control of the nociceptive, potentially dangerous, potentially leading to pain. So all of that input must be regulated by our brains. And in these patients, when they test it, we can see in chronic pain, that system is not working the way it's supposed to. So they would then have more pain um, than controls. All right, so next, exercise-induced hypoalgesia in patients with chronic shoulder pain. A quads contraction increases, which is a good thing, right? Increases the pressure pain threshold in the quads as well as in the shoulder, all right? So a quads contraction, that's the exercise, caused increased thresholds, which means you'll have less pain because you, you will, it'll take a larger stimulus to reach the threshold. So we want increased pressure pain thresholds. But the infraspinatus contraction increased pressure pain thresholds in controls, but not in chronic shoulder pain. So chronic shoulder pain patients do not have the hypoalgesia that we would expect um, in a normal situation. All right, again, so the mechanism behind exercise-induced hypoalgesia is endogenous, oh, sorry, endogenous opioids that get released in the brain, okay? So your own opioids, your own morphine gets released in the brain when you go for a run. So it's surprisingly large amounts, actually, if you go for an hour run, um, that you get a lot of your own opioids released. In patients with chronic pain, and here cr chronic shoulder pain specifically, that system for some reason isn't functioning quite the way it should, and that patient's pain, therefore, is not modulated. Right, so some more signs of central sensitization in chronic shoulder pain. So the conclusion after this is the central nervous system is involved in the generation and maintenance of the pain experience, and you cannot cut out the central nervous system, right? Uh, not if you want to live in any way. So we must keep that in mind when this patient is sitting in front of me. Is this potentially a central nervous system issue? Um, they will not respond well to surgery, um, most likely. Um, and we've got some tools to, to try and test it. So we spoke about um, allodynia, hyperalgesia, um, and that's something we need to be mindful of when we have to discern the correct path for this patient sitting in front of us. All right, so I just want to shift up our, I want to keep shifting our focus away from the structure that we think is at fault. We can keep in mind that pain is a nervous system phenomenon, okay? Every single time, pain is about what's happening in your nervous system, right? <clears throat> so let's move on. Nociplastic pain is the new term that is being thrown around and used instead of chronic pain. So nociceptive pain is when there is a change in the function of nociceptive pathways. So remember nociceptive pathways are the pathways from the periphery to the spinal cord, to the brain that relay information about threat or potential threat. Okay, that is important to keep in mind. All right, so those pathways can change. Nociplastic, nociceptive, right? Noci. Plastic means malleable, all right? So their function and even their structure can change. And this causes pain to persist. 
So have a look at that model. So that's taken from um, one of the Mosley and Butler articles. Um, and so I highly recommend if you are interested in this sort of thing to have a look at their work. It is created, it's bent my brain multiple times um, and I'm better off for it. So from the moment of injury, you do expect the pain level to increase with the inflammation. You go into your scarring, remodeling phases, and we expect that pain to decrease as time goes on, right? You know, that patient that comes in hobbling with, you know, the calf strain from yesterday, we sort of have an idea of, you know what, it's a great to tear. We expect them to be a little bit better next week and a little bit better the week after, et cetera. And when the pain level stays up high, like you can see in this graph, that is because of changes in the nervous system. The nervous system is, has gotten ramped up, really sensitive, and it's keeping your pain levels where they are um, at this moment, six months or a year down the line. All right? No susceptive pain due to injury, we expect to decrease. So healing has taken place, but pain is still there. All right? It's a nervous system issue. All right. Next, so just again, nociceptive pain, changes in the nociceptors in the periphery, the spinal cord and the brain. They change in function and in decreased thresholds, but over time they actually change um, in structure. So you start to get, in certain areas, you start to get cell death. In certain chronic pain patients, the brain MRI looks similar to patients with dementia in some cases. So patients complain with chronic pain of sort of a fogginess, um, struggle with memory sometimes, struggle to gather their thoughts. And that can all be because of these changes in the system. All right. So I, we can't get into too much physiology here because that'll keep us busy for about three days. Right. Just keep in mind there are changes in these systems that maintain the pain right it's helpful to try and differentiate in our patients and um, between the different pain mechanisms so important questions to ask that i ask myself uh, with every patient is this a nociceptive pain nociceptors are activated due to injury inflammation or a mechanical irritant okay is this a neuropathic pain is there a lesion or disease to the somatosensory nervous system or is this nociceptive pain which is the change in function of the nociceptive pathways. All right. So we do have questionnaires that actually are, are helpful. If you wanted to, to look at, at something like that, that, I find that quite helpful. The, something like a DN4 questionnaire um, helps identify neuropathic pain, nociceptive pain, something like the CSI, Central Sensitization Index. It's quite helpful to try and identify which one is, is my patient? Is it nociceptive? If they sprained their, or, or let's, okay, we're talking about shoulders. So they threw a ball yesterday and their shoulders hurting today. It seems very mechanical, you know, that you expect more of a nociceptive pain. Neuropathic, you get that zipping, zinging, hot burning out of nowhere. That, that's the big one from, from neuropathic pain, right? It's that this pain, you're just sitting, minding your own business and all of a sudden you get that shooting pain. So nerves have this um, ability when they are injured to just fire for no good reason and it is incredibly painful, all right? Um, and then nociplastic pain, more about that. To try and identify nociplastic pain, we can look at duration. If the duration is longer than the expected healing time, we expect that the pain is maintained by the central nervous system, okay? So um, work on your tissue healing times that we all work with every day and know very well. If they used to use a guideline of about three months um, where you should start suspecting that it's more of a nociplastic pain issue, but um, whatever the healing time is in your, in your discretion. If this thing is lasting much longer, we've all seen that patient, right? Where they say two years ago, something minor happened. And ever since then, my shoulder's never been quite the same. All right. Um, there might be changes in the biomechanics, definitely. And it might be useful to address them, but the pain is generated by the nervous system. Okay. And 
Right. So we can also look at the pain behavior. Sometimes it, it doesn't quite fit what we would expect um, a nociceptive uh, injury to, to have. Um, there might be some spreading or referred pain, hyperalgesia, uh, like we mentioned earlier, there might be some allodynia. I'm reminded of a lady that I saw in Mumbai when I was working there, <clears throat> who, when I, I couldn't touch her shoulder, she had an, an immense amount of pain. She had fallen, I think it was maybe three weeks prior to that. She had had some mild uh, frozen shoulder sort of symptoms. She fell three weeks or so before she saw me came in and I, I could not touch her shoulder. It was incredibly painful, right? And I realized that there's some, I was thinking neuro, neuropathic. Um, it turns out with allodynia can be neuropathic as well. But in her case, the, there wasn't any neuro, like any damage to the nerves, right? But what was present was this allodynia. And I asked her, what does it feel like? What does it feel like if, if we just brush over your shoulder like this? And she said, it feels like a burn wound. It feels like my whole shoulder, the whole skin is just burnt off and it's just blisters. Okay, so it's incredibly painful in some cases. In some cases, it's less painful, but keep in mind, it can be pretty painful. It's an easy test to do. You just, I'm sure you, we've all come across that at least at some stage, right? Okay, um, then something like temporal summation, it's a little bit difficult to test. They use that more in, uh, in research. Um, but s sometimes you can see it with like with that heat pain response and um, supra threshold um, where temporal summation just builds that input gets more and more painful. I think physios would, would see it like I've seen it a lot in, in lumbar patients actually where you do your PA on L5 or whatever it is. And for most patients, they actually feel less pain as you, as you go on, right? But sometimes these patients, someone like, uh, maybe someone with fibromyalgia is a good example, and their central nervous system is really, really ramped up. And they've got this sometimes a strong temporal summation effect where if I stay on that L5 doing my PAs for uh, 30 seconds or whatever it is, they actually ask you to stop because it's getting more painful, right? So temporal summation again, as a sign of there's some nervous system and it's not pathology in the nervous system. I want to be clear about that. No, so plastic pain is not pathology. Okay. It's a change in the function and a change in the structure that takes place over time. Um, the, central, the central sensitization inventory is really helpful to look at uh, it's a it's a questionnaire. It's by, it's like one page. My I think it's one and a half pages um, for a patient to fill out. And it's interesting to look at because it it really focuses on the person. It doesn't ask too many localized questions. It focuses on what does a central nervous system that's really sensitive look like. And then patients that score forty and over for that um, seem to have some central sensitization that we need to take into account in our treatment. We can't then just focus on peripheral all the way and they would most likely not respond well to surgery. We know this, it was mentioned this morning as well um, in one of the lectures that things like anxiety, depression, um, fear avoidance, um, what's the other one, kinesiophobia. So just general fear of movement and being active and so that those are all signs those are things happening in your brain right and don't forget that your brain is a part of your nervous system so whatever's going on in your brain is going to affect the spinal cord it's going to affect the rest of the nervous system so the central and um, sensitization inventory is really helpful to, to identify these patients where you go wait a sec this pain might be mostly because the nervous system is maintaining it, not because of the rotator cuff or the impingement or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. Don't forget about the brain. So it is a part of the nervous system. It gets input from all over. No susception, um, heat mechanical, chemical. It gets, uh, so the context, the stress and anxiety, it gets input from itself, right? It gets input from Memories, past experiences play a huge role in how your brain responds to certain situations, thoughts, beliefs, and fear. 
right? So I want to I want to just in the background mention something like uh, context and memories, how those two just go together, right? So you we are we are supposed to learn from prior experiences. Our brain and our subconscious is learning from prior prior experiences all the time, and it creates certain outputs to protect us accordingly. Okay, so. A good example of that, let's, so I mentioned earlier about pain being an output, right? So if we use another output as an example, perhaps uh, nausea, okay? So I like using nausea as, a, as an example. The, the input is actually a chemical one, I guess we could call it chemical, where you have something that's really bad for you in your stomach. And the output is nausea that makes you vomit to get that content out of your stomach. Correct. So if everyone, anyone has ever had food poisoning, I've had it multiple times. You cannot eat that food. What that made you sick for the next, I don't know, two years, probably um, easy two years. It might be more. I'm still not eating some foods that made me sick five years ago. All right. So think about that. You see that food that made you sick six months ago, or whatever, and you feel physically unwell. Right. This is the output from and it starts with visual input, connects to a memory and goes and your brain goes, whoa, I need to protect you here. Yeah, this is this is bad. Remember last time you ate whatever this dish, it ended up uh, being quite bad. Um, and so your brain kicks in and protects you. Right. Um, and pain, once we realize that pain is not actually an input, once we realize, realize that pain is an output, pain can operate in exactly the same way. Right, three slides to go. Um, the best thing to prevent, the best, best way of addressing nosoplastic pain, chronic pain, is to actually prevent it. Once you're stuck with it, it, it gets really hard. And to be honest, our, even our best interventions are only moderately effective. Um, the best thing we can do is to, we can optimize our current interventions. We've got great skills already as, as therapists. Um, if we really connect with a patient, assess thoroughly, um, communicate well, realize that patients are on a journey and get their expectation as well. If we can tap into that, we can get that meaning effect. We can get their own opioids to start helping us to do our job. Okay. If we can assess that properly and get to know that person sitting in front of us, it helps us discern which modalities to use. Um, and the big one is to screen and identify early. You, you just want to prevent it. You just want to prevent nociceptive pain from tr to transition. So it never transitions into nociplastic pain. That is the best thing we can do. So a nice screening tool is the Keel Start MSK tool or the Keel Start Back tool for low back pain. Um, they, if you can identify them early and address the informed practice and psychologically informed care, um, these patients do better than with normal physiotherapy treatment. Okay, and that brings to to the next point: they addressing the psychosocial aspects. We first need to know what they are, so we need to screen for them. Okay. So check out that start MSK tool. It's really, really helpful. Um, and then targeting function, meaning, and, and their expectations. All right. So just one final thought is that you are treating a human. You're not just treating a shoulder. I think um, I'm definitely guilty of, of that. I'm definitely guilty of saying to my colleague, oh, my, my 1 p.m. is a shoulder and my 2 p.m. is a is an ankle, you know? Um, but actually, if we can keep in mind that this entire human sitting in front of us is, is the one we're treating and we can identify lots of other factors going on that may be driving the central nervous system sensitization, it can be really helpful to direct patients and help patients make good decisions when it comes to considering how to manage their pain if they're considering surgery especially. Okay, so that's more or less it from me. Thank you very much. Um, special thank you to Bev Bolton and the Train Pain Academy, who I've journeyed with for a long time, um, and also to Club Physio for giving me this opportunity. Thanks, uh, Craig. Dion, thank you so much for that. That's awesome.
Um, some really, really interesting pain stuff on the shoulder. Much appreciated. If anyone has any questions, please can you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Can unmute yourself and ask questions. Sorry, say that again. I'm saying to participants can unmute themselves and ask question. To stand that is waiting to interact you. Any question you can ask, please. for you how do you convince the patient that they should not go for surgery I mean how they will be listening to you rather than the surgeon that's how the question has come for you yeah that's that's definitely a challenge hey? I think a big one is to um, find out what their expectations are um, if they desperately if they have already made up their mind that surgery is the, the best way to go then that's going to be a challenge, uh, definitely. So uh, it's not like it's easy. Um, I think, and from from one uh, in one aspect, I respect them and respect that I'm not going to just overrule whatever they say. But I give them the facts. I mean, we've got we've got many uh, many studies and many of them that I cited now to say, okay, well, if we you weigh this up, you weigh this up, all right? A year down the line for these surgeries, you would have exactly the same outcome uh, with rehab versus surgery. Okay, so do you want to take, which route do you want to take, All right? Um, another thing is to, to just tap into their belief, actually. So we spoke earlier about the brain um, being the, the head, the, the control center for your whole body, and especially the nervous system. So what beliefs are, are driving them? Um, why do they want to go the route that they have chosen? Um, and they could explain something like, well, they'll probably say something like, um, okay, well, the MRI says I've got a, I've got a tear in my muscle. Um, so obviously it, it needs to be fixed. Um, and then we can, we can say, okay, well, if that's the, if that's the belief, the, the belief there is that, tissue damage or pain means there's tissue damage and tissue damage will always cause pain. And that belief we can then try and try and address. Uh, it's a personal question from my side. Like uh, uh, nowadays we have a, a kind of therapy. I mean, we have a kind of surgery available, which is quite uh, less invasive and uh, kind of uh, uh, not arthroscopy. I'm talking about arthrolysis. And many are people, they are opting for the arthrolysis. But even after arthrolysis, they have to undergo physiotherapy. So what is that like? Uh, uh, how can we say people like you will not have pain and maybe you can manage your pain after the arthrolysis also? Because many people, they don't go arthrolysis, fearing that the pain will be much more. So how do you manage those kind of people? I mean, they badly need to get arthrolysis and then therapy. Well, I guess the question is why, why do you feel that they badly need the arthrolysis? <laughs> it all depends upon the doctors. They, they, they feel that uh, patient must undergo because, you know, after uh, 10 weeks of pain and the rehabilitation process, he'll be all right. That's all. Yeah. Uh, look, I think it's, it's tricky because we don't... We, we don't always have the, the information at hand to, if someone has compared whatever that specific procedure is, I would love to see when that's compared to uh, placebo surgery and just to see, I mean, what the results are. If, if it's the same, then I don't see the point in sending them. Um, but like I said, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we're working with complex humans that they, their whole life has brought them to this point now and now I've got to come and bring this huge paradigm shift to them. So it's definitely challenging, but if I, I would definitely tell them, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's not better than placebo, then why do you want to do it? And if we don't know if it's better than placebo or not, well, then it becomes a little bit tricky. Um, it becomes a conversation between you and the patient and about what's best for, um, for them. Dion, thank you very much. Very, very, very interesting uh, talk um, 
there are two three questions and, uh, can I if i could uh, if i could just ask everyone guys we're running a little bit behind time now and jackie mccord has joined us her presentation is for 12 noon and i think what we're going to do is we're going to go straight into this presentation and then we will have a five minute comfort break after jackie at 1 p.m south african time and then again at 3 p.m and then we will finish at five so um yeah, thank you very much, guys. Stian, if I could just ask you to hang around for a little while. If you could go to the chat, you will see that there are a number of questions there for you. If you could answer those chats directly to those people, or if you could answer the chats to everyone so everyone can see the answer, it would be great. And if anyone has any further questions for Stian, they can send him a private message or they can send him a chat, an open chat, and uh, he can uh, spend a uh, 15 20 minutes just answering those questions on the chat that'll be awesome so stian thank you very much much appreciated um and uh all the best have a great weekend stay uh for the rest of the talk i just like to invite jackie mccord ace who doesn't really need much of an introduction in the sense that we all know a lot of you know who jackie is a lot of you who reside in india may have done her taping courses in india some of you may have done her sports uh, physiotherapy course that she presented a month ago on Club Physio Online. She is going to be speaking to us today on taping for the shoulder joint, different type of taping uh, protocols, procedures, different type of tapes that you can use. Uh, she has got a taping course coming up on Club Physio in a couple of weeks' time, so I would encourage you guys if you are looking to do a taping course i know it is online and it's not the same as as face to face and hands on but for today's climate uh, it's uh, certainly a, a good uh, course for us so jackie if you could share your slides with us that would be great jackie has also worked at the highest level she's um, in, currently involved and has been for many many years with super sports united professional team in south africa she's worked at the olympics she's worked at the all africa games um, so we are really uh, lucky to have someone with her experience presenting to us today. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Craig. I can hear you, Jax, yeah. Can you share your slides? I've got a lot of crackling on my microphone. I've tried my speak other one, but if you guys are clear, then I'm happy. I can hear you. There's a, there is a little bit of cracking coming through on your on, on your speaking. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's try it like this. I'm not sure my microphone is working. That's my problem. Uh, uh, let me just see. Did you share that screen? Um, no, it hasn't come through yet. Okay, hold on. No, 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 no. Still not coming through yet. Why is it giving me a source to demo? <laughs> your present the presentation okay. yeah bring it up and then go back to zoom and click share and then choose the slide yeah that's what i need to do just close it completely. Hmm. I even changed laptops and now it's not working. That's all. Okay, there you go back there. Still nothing coming through, Jax. Yeah, and no. I'm trying to get your, your 
image of the big AR, which was not working. Okay, there we go. And I can go share screen again. Files. I want to go to my screen. When you click share screen, Jax, it should come up with your files that you choose. Yeah, I'll have to click share screen. But it's not showing my files. That's what I would want to understand why it doesn't want to do that. Showing my screen, I can share that screen, but that doesn't help you. <laughs> you see, you sharing that. And it's but, coming through. Let me open up the PDF. Sorry, okay, I'm skipping me this. Can you see a document opening? Something is opening up, yeah. PDF document is opening up. Yummy. Yes, I can. Right. Yeah. I can hear you. Your your voice is still breaking up quite a bit, Jax. You try with uh, with a headset or with other headset. Your connection problem. Can you hear me, correct? Yeah, I can hear you. But nothing's coming through. It's just the um, document that you're trying to open. It's not coming through. Uh, do you want to try again, Jackie? Stop sharing. Maybe she can disconnect and then reconnect. Uh, to, to Zoom, Sarav, is that your suggestion? I think she can disconnect and then again on the login ID, she can reconnect it. There is a disturbance. So. Actually, yeah, the, the sound quality is not good. I think whenever you speak or move, we're getting a lot of a lot of feedback. Are you using a, a mic or a cord? Okay, guys, I think, guys, I think we're going to take a five minute break. We're forced by technology to take a five minute break. So, uh, Jackie, we'll try and get you sorted out. Everyone, you can uh, go off and grab a juice, tea, coffee, go to the loo and come back. We'll start up again at 20 past the hour. Or if you need here at 10 to. Okay, we'll take a five minute break. Max, um, do you want to log out and log back in? Becky, can you hear me? Becky, can you hear me? I think uh, says out, I think. Yeah. That, uh, Some network uh, Let me just see if Steve is ready to go, Sumanjit. Yeah, please. Oh, let's... Uh... Uh, let's find Steve. Steve, are you there?
So guys, I think what we, we might do is if Steve is ready to go and if we can get hold of him because he is... Yeah, he's ready, he's I think. Yes, yeah, so he's ready. He's, yeah, I think he was just... He was, he, was, he was seen in the video then. I think he left some five minutes before. No, he's still he's still here with us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think he is not at his terminal. So I'm just texting him. Yeah, yes, sir. To see if we can get him. Yeah. Let me give him a call. Yeah, I could jump in now if you wanted me to. Okay. Steve. Okay, so um, Sumanjit, Steve's ready to go. I'll send Jackie a message to say that she is on hold for another 45 minutes. She has him. Okay. That's fantastic. Well, that's a nice backdrop. Is that for real? <laughs> it's just for you from St. <laughs> yes, oh sir. my goodness. Okay, let me uh, close a few things down here real quick. So we quit mail. And we quit Chrome. I've got the PowerPoint up. Yep, oh, I gotta open it again. I rebooted. Come on. Oh, come on. Be nice. There we go. All right. So we come back to Zoom. All right. And then I have to reboot um, my video. All right. So I need to go and get that lined up. All right, hold on. A few things, just a couple things to line up. Uh, Sorry, mate, we're on a five minute break and we've got another one or two minutes. Okay, no, it's just good. I just gotta find what I was doing. Everything is good. Oh, I gotta go into Club Physio, scapular dyskinesis. There it is. Okay, that's the one I want. Okay, so I've got those and I can tee up the first one. That goes to 12, 10, 12, stop, stop, okay. Okay, are we ready? Yeah, let me share screen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Host disabled attendee sh screen share, okay. Uh, Oh, you got to let me share the screen. Um, please share. I'm not, just, yeah, the manager will sort that. See you, sir. Uh, so can you see the share screen button? Yeah, so I'm hitting it. It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. One so second. you're not allowing me. One second. How many hours, Craig? What's that, Steve? How many hours you've been doing this? We've been going since um, eight o'clock this morning, four o'clock your time. Okay. We've got another, uh, we're halfway. We've got another four and a half hours to go. So you oh, can share. Get on you, mate. Okay, okay you try can share it now, Steve. You can share now? Yes, got it. Okay, cool. And All right, guys, so welcome back. Um, welcome to Steve Goldstein from Melbourne, Australia. 
Uh, sorry about Jackie's technological issue. She's getting that sorted out, and Steve is going to jump in. Steve is um, very well known to India as well. He's taught his fascial therapy course in both Bangalore, Delhi, and in Mumbai. He's been coming to South Africa, and I've had the pleasure of knowing Steve for the last 10 years. He's been coming from South Africa and going to Europe as well. And he is, he's basically Fascial Therapy Academy Australia. And he's incredibly knowledgeable about uh, various um, techniques and understandings of how the fascia works. And today he's going to talk to us on muscle energy techniques for the shoulder and specifically for scap dyskinesis. Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, man. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, laughing at the technical difficulties. Uh, but uh, a reboot, a reinstall, and I am up to date. And here we go. Now let's see if this is actually gonna work or not. Okay, so I'm gonna minimize you guys so I don't look at your smiling faces, okay. And I'm gonna read through the PowerPoint. And we've got just a couple videos too. So what is a scapular dyskinesis? I'm sure most of you have encountered it at one point or another in your career, but that's the topic I've been chosen to play with. So it's the alternation in the normal static or dynamic position or motion of the scapula during, we know, the very complex coupled scapular humeral movements. That's had a few different names, floating scapula, lateral scapula, slide. So what we're working with, I'm just going to move a few things out of the way so I can read my slides. There we go. Um, okay, so to get into a little more detail, we're talking about uh, Kinetic patterns of normal shoulder complex explains that uh, the global elevation range of motion of the arm was mainly the result of coordinated motion, as we know, between the GH and the ST joints. So scapular movement involves clavicular uh, serving as almost a setting wand, and the convicular motion occurs at the SC and the AC joints contributing. So it's, it forms a mechanical coupling for the, for the motion. So thus the efficiency of the shoulder kinetics is based on a coordinated and combined movements of all these joints. Therefore, any modification of one element of the shoulder complex will have an impact on all the chain. So, you know, there can be a number of reasons why uh, you get shoulder pain and from a fascial a joint perspective, you really need to be paying attention to the ST and the AC. Um, the scapular thoracic is, you know, it's like a, not a true joint. It's a, it's, it's a joint that allows the scapula to make motion around the rib cage. And it, so, um, and it, of course, it, it's in very, very much uh, related linkage with the, the GH joint, of course. So what we wanna look at then is, you know, what causes this, in a sense, not to function as well as we'd like? So most shoulder pathologies have a dynamic component, which can be highlighted by your examination rather than by imagery techniques. The standard exam allows for assessing movement, not just static postures, but mostly it's been centered on the GH joint and didn't really take into account the scapula thoracic. A better knowledge of the role of the ST joint in the shoulder kinetics has modified the shoulder examination and, and thus now this concept of dyskinesis defined as any abnormality of the scapular posture or movement, whatever the cause. So it's characterized generally by a premature or excessive rotation of the scap during elevating and lowering the arm with a posterior displacement of its medial border or inferior angle from the thoracic wall that appears as a scapular winging from the thorax. Now reasons for scapular dyskinesis can be very or multifactorial. Gender, age, hand dominance, um, the plane of movement, a bilateral or unilateral arm movement, the speed of the movement, different load requirements, the sport they play, or pain. So it's basically broken down into um, three, uh, uh, three classifications. Uh, and Kibler, who is cited in a lot of the research material, um, is sort of the one they've attached his version of what the classification is. 
So the type one is considered an inferior one, and that's going to be probably our most common one. Uh, the primary visual feature is a prominence of the inferior angle as a result of anterior tilting of the, the scapula. The inferior pattern is better visualized uh, while in a hands-on hips position. Um, and during eccentric lowering overhead. So according to this one, that is the most commonly found with rotator cuff uh, dysfunction. Um, the second one is the medial border, and that external visual feature is the entire medial border is wung due to internal rotation of the scapula. And as with type one, the type two becomes more evident when hands on hips position or during the active eccentric uh, lowering from overhead. Your type three is uh, the superior dysfunction and it's characterized by excessive and early elevation of the scap during upper extremity elevation. And this pattern has been referred to as a compensatory shoulder hiking or shrug, like we would see in a sh frozen shoulder, and has to do with rotator cuff dysfunction and deltoid rotator cuff force couple imbalances. So, Shoulder-related causes then are the most common of the complaints, and almost all shoulder pathologies are accompanied with some degree of a scapular dyskinesis. The most are uh, either AC uh, joint instability, shoulder impingement, uh, rotator cuff injuries or tears to the tendon, glenolabrum injuries, a fracture to the clavicle, or nerve-related. Uh, when we look at shoulder impingement, uh, is associated with greater protraction in the resting positions, a greater posterior tilt during abduction, and greater internal rotation during plane elevation. Furthermore, the scap shows less upward rotation when the scap plane is elevated. The scap has a different performance pattern in shoulder instability with reduced rotation uh, when the arm's elevated, but increased internal rotation when the plane is raised. Um, I'm going to move through these fairly quick so um, you can have a sort of a look at them. Um, in frozen shoulder, the scapula externally rotates earlier and at a greater degree compared to normal scap. But research has failed to show that the increased mobility of the scap is the compensatory mechanism. And with adhesive capsulitis, uh, kinesis, dyskinesis is probably more secondary to the capsule. When the scapulohumeral rhythm can be disturbed either by an inappropriate pattern of muscle activation, too slow or too fast, or inappropriate force of muscle contraction, many muscles then are acting on a, a massively uh, different vectors and directions of influence. So the two key muscles that I found when I was doing the research, um, besides the rotator cuff muscles, are gonna be your serratus anterior and your trapezius. Uh, these are linked to the development of dyskinesis in both shoulder impingement and instability. And in impingement, the upper and lower traps along with the serratus anterior have altered their activation pattern, with the trapezius showing a greater strength of activation compared to the serratus. And so the, the, the scapulothoracic joint is sort of what they call a force couple. Um, they form an important uh, force couple defined as two forces of equal magnitude in opposite direction, which will produce rotation on the scap. In direct, in particular, the cup, force coupling acts to rotate the scap in order to dynamically position, now this is really important, dynamically position the glenoid and maintain the center of rotation with the humeral head. We're gonna see with a lot of dyskinesis that humeral head is out of position. And, um, in my practice, I try to do what I call humeral uh, head repositioning. Uh, I don't have any good pictures, but I can talk about what I do uh, towards the end of this when we, after we talk about the muscle energy technique. Um, almost done with the, these causes, then we'll get into more um, photos and whatnot. Um, soft tissue, of course, um, can cause a number of altered scapular mechanics, uh, both the pectoral, uh, major and minor, and the, and the capsule itself have been identified as important factors. Uh, tightness of the muscles of the pectoral region promote an anterior translation of the girdle, and of course then the scapula, and stiffness of the posterior aspect, which you can see a lot of um, almost capsular gluing on the back wall um, 
of the posterior capsule. That's a spot where the capsule and, um, and then gets really stuck and then it can really impinge on scapular movement. Um, even the neck is in, involved uh, and they had two syndromes that they related in the, in the research articles. Uh, mechanical neck pain can cause uh, scapular dyskinesis and we know uh, body, body posture and that's what they're going to say in a moment as well. Uh, nerve pathology is another one that you have to consider if you've got uh, that sort of problem with the scap. All the nerves that provide the sensory and motor supply um, to the shoulder originate from the brachial plexus, especially at the C5 and 6 roots. And the accessory nerve, um, it transverses the upper portions of the cord and lower parts of the brain towards the SCM. So pathology arises when the nerves inappropriately activate uh, one or more nerves around the scap, and this almost cause a disorganized rhythm of scapular movement relative to the main skeleton or upper limb. Um, and then finally, excessive thoracic kyphosis or cervical lordosis will alter the resting position. Athletes are more susceptible to these changes depending on their sport. They develop core muscle imbalances that alter spinal curves and soft tissue tension. So that's sort of the causes. Again, just a brief look at the types of scapular uh, dyskinesis, and there's a picture of the most common uh, type one, which is your um, inferior angle winging. Uh, number two is your medial border, and number three is your superior angle and upper area. Uh, just a, another one more chart to sort of just put it all together with the type of dysfunction, what are the um, weak muscles involved, what are the tight muscles involved, what's the lost or the abnormal uh, component of movement that's not occurring and what happens with posture. Um, so the shoulders are the scap in particular are just fascinating to work with. Um, and so uh, I had a lot of fun just diving back into looking at you know, this um, dyskinesis and a little more, any of the more recent articles and research articles around it. Um, they still don't quite have a handle on exactly, as they say, you know, nothing's clear because it's so complex. So these different types of dysfunction gives you, you know, a different organization around what structures you have to sort of look at. And so these, these sort of are nice little roadmaps. Um, the basic mo motion that I check and I'm going to use and uh, talk about MET is basically then um, I'm going after, I'm not going to be using MET for specific muscles. I'm going to be using MET for restricted planes of motion. So when I'm looking at a scap complex, um, these are the primary movement patterns that I'm paying attention to. Uh, elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, and those are the main two. And then I'll pick up versions of rotation or tilt if I can. But your elevation depression and your protraction retraction are the ones that I use mostly in practice. Um, look, at, there's probably 40 special tests that you could list, which I'm sure other people probably are talking about. I just picked up a couple that seemed interesting um, around isolating some of these types. And so... The scapular assistant test is a manually assisted examination maneuver. And what's happening is it's used, this one's used for impingement. Um, and are the results of poor scapular control or weakness in the serratus. And I was interested in the serratus and trapezius muscles in particular, because I think um, from a manual therapy standpoint, those are ones we can, we can sort of assist pretty quickly. And then there's, of course, all kinds of rehabilitation, which I'm not going to go into, but that can be, you know, in the way of different um, scapular exercises that, of course, you send your, your client home with. So on this one, the examiner pushes laterally and upward on the inferior medial border to stimulate the serratus anterior portion of the elevation force couple. A positive test is indicated by a decrease or abolishment of impingement symptoms or a paresis or inhibition of the anterior or lower trap muscles. Um, the second one was a scap retraction reposition. 
manually assisted examination maneuver. And on this one, it's, it's supposed to evaluate rhomboid strength. The patient's asked to retract both the shoulders and sustain an isometric contraction for about 10 to 15 seconds or longer. The inability to maintain that along with the pain or burning in the region suggests um, uh, you know, some sort of problem, uh, paresis with the, with the rhomboids. The other one that I really like, because this is one that really you use a lot just in checking range, and it has to do then with really the orientation of the kyphosis and the rib cage in relation to the scap, and that's the humeral glenoid internal rotation test. This is a positional test assessing rib cage alignment. The posterior rib cage as the foundation for the scapula determines scapular position and glenoid orientation. And then you're going to see why then I target the spine and rib cage a lot for shoulder work. Um, and therefore, it affects humeral glenoid mechanics. So they just sort of walk through how to do this. I'm sure every one of us has done this type just in natural range. So this one's just particular um, to see what, what happens when you take it into internal rotation. And if the ribs or the anterior rib cage are internally rotated, the intercostals adaptively shorten and the apical chest wall will exhibit restriction and limited expansion with inhalation. The scap is pulled forward by the pec minor and positioned in a state of upward rotation, uh, abduction, internal rotation and protraction. So now the humeral head is in external rotation relative to the fossa. Passive internal rotation will result in impingement on the glenoid fossa and range of motion will be limited. So those were the, I mean, those were the tests I picked out of about 35 or 40, of course, we can talk about. Um, so what do I do? Okay, so that's the background on scapular uh, dyskinesis. So I use a lot of sideline assessment. I'll sit on the table and put the scapula from in sideline position with a horizontal long lever position. That means you're gonna lift the straight arm to around 90, and then you're gonna drive the leverage to then go ahead and move from glenohumeral assessment into scapular assessment. So uh, what that allows you to do then from that position is you get to pull it forward and back, which is retraction and protraction. You can play with elevation depression. You can also check sleeve twists, uh, wrist and ankle in relation to the scap and the shoulder. So even though we're saying in all the literature that the AC and SC joints, which are critical, need to be worked, uh, this scapular dyskinesis can also have some problems from a myofascial perspective with the forearm component, the wrist or the elbow not doing what it needs to do. So your, your radial ulnar joint, your pronation supination is a player in rotation of the shoulder. Okay, so what do I do with it? Um, so the treatment is to, you know, you have a lot of different directions. So Craig asked me to talk about uh, how I use uh, MET. So I'm gonna give you a sort of perspective about what I do with it. Um, muscle energy techniques are a class of soft tissue osteopathic um, originally manipulation methods that incorporate precisely directed and controlled a patient initiated isometric or isotonic contractions uh, designed to improve uh, function and reduce pain. Pretty standard. Most of you are familiar with MET. Um, and so you can do isometric, isotonic, or isotonic with contraction. Um, now I use it more for direction and joint than I use for muscle. I certainly can use it for muscle. And your isotonic, if you have a lot of fibrosis in an area, then that would be the one you'd be using. But the isometric usually, or a little isotonic, uh, is often sufficient. And the reason is, uh, I'll get to it in a second. So then just sort of clarifying the distinctions between isometric and isotonic. It's you know, the region of the body is called on to contract or move in a specified direction in which that effort is matched by the practitioner effort, so no movement is allowed to take place. So we all understand that. Whereas isotonic allows for movement to take place. 
And the counterforce then is either greater or less than the client. And, you know, it has a tonifying effect on the muscles. And that's why you can play with concentric and eccentric motion, uh, depending on what you're trying to do and what you're feeling with your palpation based on uh, fibrosis or adhesion, that sort of thing. Um, and then the eccentric movement is the third or fourth way they go and do it. So you have these sort of controls on, on how much force. Now for what I've done with force is I decided long ago that I was going to use it more for uh, the sensory receptors of the joints or for direction. Uh, I wasn't as interested in the muscle in that sense because I found I could change things a little quicker if I went more directionally in joint when I worked with people. So that's how I've morphed it. And so you sort of a contract, relax, and it's gonna be a low force. So I call it a low load resistance, resistive for fossil therapy. So it's a modification of MET in that we're only gonna, we're gonna specifically use the force to stimulate mechanical sensory receptors in the targeted soft tissue so that we get an effect, an inhibitory effect that relaxes the tissue or targets more of the joint receptors in terms of position and direction. So we're gonna use only about five to 10%. Now, um, then how I use that is what I call, I, I've sort of stole the name from Eric Dalton and sort of co-opted my own definition because I like the term receptor enhancement. So what we're gonna use is then a modified low force MET and it really makes a fairly rapid change. And mechanisms are always under debate, but the best descriptor at the moment is it is affecting sensory mechanical receptor stimulation. And Dalton used the words enhancer to mean combining active and passive movement while applying static pressure on a tendon like he would do for G Golgi tendon organ responses. So with, with that sort of work, it's just, you know, you put an elbow or combine fingers down on a, a hamstring tendon and you would just, then he would use an active and passive movement to sort of enhance a response. That's how he was describing it. So we use, uh, you know, five to 10% maximum for the force unless there's you know some aberration there where i need to use more and the reason also low force is it gets your your lower smaller especially spinal muscles your your one segment muscles like your intransversales and your rotatores and you're able then to have a preciseness because you're not recruiting large motor units with this and your focus is not muscle it's joint and so we're going to use the, uh, the levering of the, the, the femur or the humerus or long or short levers to target thoracic and lumbar spine. And so this is the concept of articular receptor enhancement. Okay, so let's talk about then how I use MET. You can do it as gentle um, as you possibly can, and, and you're going to see that I'm targeting initially, I'm gonna target the spine. I learned a long time ago that uh, there's a lot of ways to get a shoulder to move in, in greater motion than the standard approach that people seem to be taking. A good example is if thoracic or lumbar facets are fixated, the moment they change, the scapula tends to move, the it affects the scapula thoracic joint. And also we're gonna see, um, I target and particularly the iliocostalis because it seems to have a seam where the curvature of the spine before the trench builds up with lots of adhesion for all the layering of the erector spinae, that, that particular seam, once that lets go, you get a lot more scapular uh, thoracic motion. So I use precise MET, in this case I will be using flexion extension. And we can be using it either in a segment, we could ask her just to lift her head and her chest and then go back down. Or as she holds and lifts, I might then have her press forward or back. I also use a lot of reciprocal inhibition. Uh, that idea that if 
you fire an agonist, the antagonist relaxes, or in the case when you're having troubles with where you're pressing, say here to monitor, you know, that T3 or 4 segment, I might have her push forward against my hand that's on the chest. So by having her push slightly into flexion, she reciprocally inhibits extension. So it's a really simple concept. Uh, Sherrington uh, wrote about it in 1906 and got the Nobel Prize for it, and I still find it very, very useful in practice. The other way, too, is uh, to get the scapula to work. I start targeting also mid-thoracics. So here's just a few, a little bit of a vision of what I'm doing. Uh, now, so this is what's cool. This is supposed to be about the shoulder, which it is, but I'm not doing all pure shoulder work. We're gonna work with the, all the adjacent structures that which that thorax, that scapula has to translate around. So the cross arm one's a great one. You get them to put their hands across, and then they're gonna put, bring it up and, leave, and let their forehead fall onto their forearms, okay? Real simple, you've probably done this one. And then you're gonna slip your hands through so that you're just gently lacing behind the neck so that their forearms and forehead are now can be controlled. So now if I pull her forward or back, I have really good control of flexion extension of the spine. But I also have control, I can get my marker to go. I also have control if I decide now to turn her scapula by rotating her body or spine slightly one way or the other. So I can access an MET to the spine or I can dab it into a vector or tangent towards one or both scapulas. Now, what would happen in this one to start with, as we try to move her up and down, I use what's called an ease bind assessment. So it's gonna move one way a little easier than the other. I'm always gonna place into ease and they're always gonna press into bind. I'm always gonna place into ease and they're always gonna press into bind. So in this position, let's say ease is now the position I have her in uh, going back and her bind is going forward. So she's gonna take her forehead gently and both elbows against my forearms and press forward, uh, probably five, seven seconds. I'll don't want a lot. And on release then, that's the active, I passively mobilize the structure and flexion extension through movement. So I might then drop down and come back up, drop down, come back up. Oh, let's see here. Come on, be nice. Oh, I think we missed one, hold on. Let me go back one. There you go, uh, let me go back one more. Okay, so what'll happen then, let's let this catch up. Okay, so then we move forward to the next one. Bear with me just a second. Be nice, there we go, okay. So then what can happen here? Now it's being a little, uh, it's just moving on the fine tune. Okay, so I'm gonna go back, okay. Let's see if it'll stop, please stop. Okay, so you can see how the control, she can either have motion pushing down against her forearms, she can have that person be pressing in the center, or she could be pushing down with the forearms and as she holds position, slightly pulling back at the neck. So you can get these co-contractions going. You can see now by beginning to put a twist in, you can start to now navigate one scapula or the other and you can isolate both the segments and you can isolate the scapula. You can see you can do a wide hand hold and she can be pulling back against those palms of the hands, which will basically be working your mid, mid trapezius area. So all these are really quick and they're really useful ways to just do METs. It's in a global, more regional manner. All right, so I'm gonna stop this and let me see if I can find the stop share button here. Oh, I'm having troubles. There it is, stop share. We're going to uh, share a video. Okay, so I'm gonna share again. I'm gonna pick up my, uh, I gotta open it up first, sorry.
Okay, now hold on. Stop share. It should pick up the video now. There it is. Okay. And we're going to play it. Now, the setup for this is I've got her in this position. Now you're going to see how I use the assessment and the MET. If we do, um, we put the arm here and we just check passive elevation and repression, there's motion, but there's lots of restriction going up. And there's also lots of restriction going down. If we attempt to do some roll, <laughs> so, so we're going to do it on several people so we get the idea. So if you've got a complex that's really tight, we're going to cut right to the chase. We're going to show the MET on it, and it'll open it up usually. So I'm going to block a little here, and I'm always going to check which is ease and bind. Now, interesting enough, she's sort of switched on me, hasn't she? See how it's not going back now? So I always... So as she settled in and really gave it up, the true barrier that I normally feel going back is restricted. So this is how I work my MET. I will always place into ease and ask for the resistive to go into bind. I will always place into ease and ask for the resistive to go into bind. So what it means is I'll roll over forward. And now I'm going to ask her to pull back. So what has to happen is I have to figure out her amount of force. So I'm going to ask her to pull back against my fingers. Perfect. I need to have more even. Beautiful. Relax it as you can go forward and drop your shoulder. There you go. Now, barriers have been held for a while. You need a longer duration on the force. Barriers have been held for a while. Okay, so that's sort of a good look on um, how I use that very global uh, protraction retraction. We'll go back to the PowerPoint. And um, I'm going to show some, a few other things in a little bit, but we'll move on. Um, look, at, there's a couple of quick things I just tried to point out that might be user-friendly in practice when you think about uh, the shoulder. Uh, that cross-body stretch is a useful one for the back of the capsule. The key with all those, of course, isn't just to pull one directional, but is to stabilize the trunk and the frame, make sure the shoulders is dropped as possible, the, the head and neck is relaxed. And as they then set it up slowly and isolate then that particular stretch. Um, so besides standard approaches then seen throughout the manual therapy world, um, my perspective is uh, we're gonna use MET on the shoulder probably right off the bat. Um, uh, because that receptor enhances the spine as I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, it also is um, the ability to also affect the AC, SC, and GH capsular joints, which you must. Uh, you also have the myofascial relationships of the fascial restrictions of the lumbar and thoracic spine. I mentioned the lateral fascial seam of the iliocostalis. Uh, if you look at Thomas Meyer's anatomy trains, all the arm lines connect up pretty well and need to be factored in as well. So that means... That's why the pelvis is involved with the shoulder. That's why the wrist is involved with the shoulder. That's why the cervicals are involved with the shoulder. So these are a more global perspective to work the shoulder, as well as all the things you already know uh, and all the, you know, all the air information coming from all the other fine presenters regarding what to do with the shoulder. Um, one also that'll affect, because it's a door opener for the rotator cuff 
and the pectoralis is how to approach the axillary fold. So I teach this in most of my courses and it's really just first this very little pressure. So that may look like there's a lot of pressure, but I always meet the first level of resistance. So with the first level of resistance, that is the first level right there. And I'm looking for dead center if I can. I'm trying to get a little bit of that light fascial membrane that sort of covers that area to, to just shift. So I get clarity and I'm, I'm always about not creating any pain if I can help it. I want a very compliant autonomic nervous system. I want a person who's not in any high sympathetic tone. I want them very parasympathetic, uh, very polyvagal. Um, and so we put the fingers together as a unit we pair and assess the depth and the resistance to the first level. Uh, you do not want it to feel pokey. So then you wait, you wait right there for a moment and see if you get any tissue change. Now what'll happen is sometimes change is not forthcoming. So then you put an ease twist as your next fascial plane of tissue engagement. So what you can see me now begin to put the, the twist in and they either clockwise or counterclockwise it's whatever direction is these, and you engage again the first level of resistance. This is now going to be considered in fascial therapy parlance uh, jargon, uh, what's called a glide fulcrum. So once you feel more change, then you're going to glide and move in several directions. So once that one is finished, and we've opened up the fold, The muscles that I did want to talk about that I consider sort of interesting for the joints uh, to help uh, get the joint motion and any adhesion around them uh, if needed are, there's three particular muscles I think that are really, really important, maybe four that I, I tend to do. And that besides the usual suspects, one is subclavius. So I use a lot of pin and shift. So um, I'm going to stop the share for a second. That pin and shift is basically you finding your subclavius. And once you have, you're going to take that shoulder girdle complex and you're going to move back and forth or up and down. And you're going to go ahead and pin and shift. So I don't do a lot of heavy friction. If I can help it, I do much more pin and shifting. So that's the stuff we're, we're sort of playing with. Uh, I'll use pin and shifts on most of those. Um, so your subclavius is one that's really, really important uh, to work. And you can see it's also a relation to when we get, you know, any neurovascular problems coming through a thoracic outlet, et cetera. Um, obviously pec minor, and that's a particular one that affects the coracoid process, but also affects the AC joint by its pull on the coracoid. So the AC area often gets very restricted and I've got a couple of moves that I do to open those up pretty quickly uh, for standard shoulder treatment when I have dyskinesis or most anything. And another one that's missed, I mean, pec minor everyone knows, but one that's not worked as much uh, for the glenohumeral joint is actually the coracal brachialis. So those three muscles in particular, um, are favorites of mine to check. And the subclavius coracle break, um, they just don't get treated as much as like the pec minor would. So um, that's a real important one, especially off the, uh, the pool, that it will affect uh, GH joint by virtue of its working on the shaft. Um, and that's your like a horizontal uh, abductor, adductor uh, position to get it usually. All right, what else? The scapula. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so let's just go through some pictures of sort of how I work with the levers. And again, the seated position on the table is for the GH joint. And then I lower myself in a chair to work the AC and SC joints. So I sit on the table to generally get the, the position for that. And that gives me a lot of control as a lever. You know, I'll, I'll have horizontal or vertical levering uh, that I use a lot. 
Uh, and so this is more of your uh, protraction retraction element. Uh, again, as I said, you can check these basic elements. You uh, put it in ease, they pull into bind and on release, uh, you mobilize. Um, and then, so then we look at, after protraction and retraction, we look at elevation and depression. Um, and the client will roll and or elevate to press the shoulder into bind. You can, they might roll that towards their cheek or roll towards the hip. They can, you can do a combo. They might be pulling against, you might have them placed forward and they want to pull back. And instead of pushing back against the scalp, they can pull back against the wrist. It gives you some sleeve leverage off the fascial sleeve, and then you can play with roll as well. Uh, you can begin now to put it up into moving it from horizontal into uh, oblique and vertical positions that start to assess um, anterior and posterior GH capsule direction. So you really get a lot of variety as are you targeting the, you can move from uh, scapula into stabilizing the scap and now press the GH joint into that hand and now it becomes now a capsular compression. So all this is taught in the fossil therapy programs uh, that I teach uh, for Craig around the world and levering is a really major component in the play. You can work with sleeve METs so by holding that position there you not only can have her move that she can now do an uh, internal external rotation uh, of the humerus and that's going to affect the elbow joint which can change scapular motion as well so you really always have to think arm lines because of the kinetic chain of links the whole upper extremity also is a participant in scapular motion so we apply that at the elbow uh, and because if you can't get full elbow extension uh, you don't always have to go after muscles you can go uh, after the joint. However, uh, if we were really thinking about bicep, one of the most important aspects of bicep, I didn't add it in here, but I teach is to get the where the bicep attaches by the radial tuberosity and get that tendon and then use a little pronation supination motion. And that often gets that bicep to relax. You can see now I'm down at table height. So I've moved from the table now down to the chair, and now I can have control of getting into that AC area, moving to the SC area. So here's a chance to see what I'll do with the AC joint. So we isolate the joint, and there's usually quite tender. The ligament in there is several ligaments that are uh, very um, high, have high degree of sensitivity. And then we put the arm down uh, so that the, uh, the hands resting on the table or even is resting sort of in a, uh, the fingers are splayed in a flex position, maybe going that way. And now I have isolated the joint and I have really good control. It's a short lever now because once you take, uh, put a bend in the arm, you move from long levering to short. So the vector is nice and tight. I could then he'll do a forward or back motion. I could also roll his body a little forward or back to pick up just the angle or vector. And then what he'll do is I'll hold and he'll pull back usually against me and on release, I'll hold that and I'll pull this forward a little more forcefully. And usually you break a really good adhesion, a ligamentous hold. And then all of a sudden that, AC starts to move better, and of course, that is going to affect your scapulothoracic uh, motion as well. Here's another one uh, looking at the AC joint technique. It's a good one, a little different vector depending on placement. And again, uh, we use body position, it's very important when I teach it, and just being aware of what's going on, not just here, but uh, you know, is the body aligned in a sense, and you can use rolling motion. So that's the AC joint position. Uh, we're just getting close to being done. So I'm gonna stop the share and play a couple. Um, I don't know how much more time I have, Craig. I'm gonna play a Steve, couple. Uh, Steve, you're out of time, but I'll give you another two or three minutes. Oh, I'm glad I'm out of time. That's perfect. Why don't we just, oh, bless your heart. Right on the money, honey. Um, <laughs>
That's See? why you and I are so tight around the world together, man. All right. Well, I couldn't ask for any better. We'll leave the paired levering out. Um, uh, Steve, I would hey. like to give one or two people an opportunity to ask a question. Absolutely. We've got another one or two minutes. If anyone wants to ask a verbal question, I think we'll take some uh, verbal questions, one or two verbal questions, and then we'll move on to Jackie. So um, please unmute yourself. Or if there are any questions in the chat, I can unmute you and you can ask your question. If there aren't any questions, then we're going to move straight ahead. Please unmute yourself. Okay. I guess there's no questions. Steve, I think everyone had lunch and now they're in that post lunch graveyard okay. period where they're having a little nap. That's why all the videos are off. <laughs> okay, mate. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you for stepping in. Um, to help Thank fill the, the gap because of Jackie's techno issues. I had them uh, too, but look at that. We got them straightened out. We got them sorted, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Okay. Nice to meet you, Sarav. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks, All mate. Right, I'm going to mute you. And I'm going to yeah. unmute Jackie. Hi, Jax. Okay. Welcome back. Thank you, Jax. I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, it's better that. Thanks, Jax. Yeah, they still a crackle. It must be our father. I don't know what, but let me see if I can share screen here. Okay. We'll have that one. Jax, um, Jax, we haven't had a break for a while. We, oh, we had a little break earlier. You can so. I take a break? No, it's fine. We had a little break. Uh, off now it's we, on load again. Your screen is sharing. It's fine. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's perfect. That's perfect. Can you Jackson, hear me now? We'll continue straight away. My Wi-Fi seems to be a problem. Okay, take a break. No, no I, what I said was that we, we had a break when you um, were having your problems while we changed over from you to Steve. So we've had a break. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue straight in. Let's see if I do my ball out spot to another internet. Your slides are sharing, Jack. Craig, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. you I'm, going to, I'm going to try and uh, do a different Wi-Fi connection through a hotspot. See if that makes a difference because it just bombs out. All right. Okay. I guess uh, your gadget has some problem. The voice is not clear. Yeah, sir, we know that. Yeah. yeah. So, one second, uh, I to see the voice, like a sticker. Uh, you can just mute and then you can again uh, restart, like something like that. Um. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Jackie. We can yeah, ma'am. But is it correctly? Yeah, ma'am. It's perfectly fine. You go ahead. It's fine, ma'am. Or maybe what you are yeah. using the micro or microphone for talking, no? So that is giving a bit uh, echo or kind of reflection. Uh, so. I've got the microphone on, but my screen keeps on telling me my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. That's the thing. 
Uh, yeah, right. so I, I've now gone on to hotspot to see if they can make because I've got fiber, it shouldn't be unstable, but I don't know why. Cool. Can you hear me you, clearly now? Yeah, we can hear you. Are you on the uh, hotspot, Jax? I'm going to try the hotspot for a while because the other one was for us, so let's see. Okay. Sure. Okay, can you see that? It's yeah. coming through. Yeah, it's coming through. Since it is in hot spot. Mm, it just freezes. Yeah, yeah. Can you advance your slides? The moment I share the screen, my internet seems to go. No problem. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Are you there? Yeah. Go ahead, Jackie. Let's see how it goes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Mm. Looks like it's not my turn today to do anything. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me now? I hear you, Jackie. So when you share your slides, is it not advancing? Is it not uh, going from slide to slide? Is that what's happening? No, no, it just my internet then just bombs out, then it freezes the screen. Right, then okay. It, then I can't hear you guys. Okay, all right. So um, that's for the moment. Yeah, I now can, I can hear you. And when I... Yeah. That's why I said take um, the, the, the people... Take okay, can I make a now. suggestion? Let me make a suggestion, right? Are you able to <laughs> save your presentation as a PDF and email it to the manager? I have also. I'll try it now. Then I will present now. I will Sorry. present now. Uh, you broke up. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm going to present now, and you email your presentation to Sumanjit. He will then share the presentation, and you will talk on, about your presentation. He'll advance the slides for you after me. Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. That's fine. That that will be great. All right. So, Sumanjit, can you Sorry, be in I touch with Jackie? I can't hear you. Give her your email address. Sure, ma'am. All right. Sure. Okay, I will bring my slides up now and I will present on dry needling for the shoulder. Okay. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Right, guys, sorry about that. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, here we are. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, sir, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so I've got a couple of slides. I'm gonna uh, present on needling around shoulder injuries, needling for the shoulder, needling for shoulder pain, and then I'm gonna show my videos on how we needle for certain muscles. Um, I'm just gonna quickly stop the share and go back to the gallery view, because what I wanna do is, I just want to see, and please guys, if you could just um, give me an indication, how many people are dry needling at the moment? You've done a course, just stick your hands up on your uh, reaction. So just do, do that. You've done a course, you're needling, you're familiar with needling, um, you've needled shoulder pain, shoulder injuries, post shoulder rehab. So that's about good. So that's about maybe 20, 20 people. Okay, great. All right. Now, the rest of you, okay, you can stop now. Thanks, Krina. Thanks, Priyanka. Take them down. Right. Now, the rest of you, I want you to show me how many people have got zero dry needling experience. So you haven't been a patient, you haven't been needled yourself, you haven't seen dry needling, and you haven't done a course. So if that's you, that like I've just done it. Obviously, I'm lying. I want to see how many people have no needling experience. So Avanesh, it's got no needling experience. It's you don't have to be shy, guys. It's not a trick question. I'm not trying to pull you out and condemn you for not having done a course yet. So, 
Joanna, thank you, Joanna. Uh, who else? Uh, okay, so just a couple of people. So most of the people that are listening now, I've got some kind of, so thanks, Karen, some kind of needling experience. And there's just a few people who have got no needling experience whatsoever. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so let me go back to the screen share. Okay. Right. When it comes to needling around the shoulder, We want to ask ourselves, what structures are we needling? Sorry about the slide being a little bit out of focus. Mainly, we're going to be needling the muscles around the shoulder. And I say mainly because there are quite a lot of different teachers out there, even quite a lot of clinicians who believe that sometimes they needle into the shoulder joint. Or they say, oh, I'm needling the posterior shoulder capsule. Or we're needling in the subacromial space, or now needling the AC joint, and whether they're needling just into the AC ligament or whether they're actually needling into the joint is up for debate. But, so mainly, we're gonna be needling around the shoulder muscles, and there are many muscles that control shoulder movement, and so mainly we're going to be needling the trapezius muscle, the rotator cuff, the lats, there is major and minor, and the pecs, that's both pec major, pec minor, we might even be needling serratus anterior muscle because serratus anterior controls not only scap control onto the, the chest for the scapula, but also breathing and uh, scap mobility and thoracic uh, mobility as well. The upper, the middle, and the lower traps, not only the upper traps that are involved with the uh, upper arm uh, issues. We're also going to be needling rhomboids and levator scap because that insert into the scapula. And then below the shoulder joint, biceps, triceps, deltoid, which lies over the shoulder. What about coracobrachialis? What about subclavius muscle? They're not necessarily directly related to shoulder movement, although coracobrachialis does do a little bit of uh, arm flexion and uh, horizontal adduction. But subclavius is that little muscle that lies under the clavicle. It's the clavicle stabilizer. It holds the clavicle down onto the chest. Do you needle subclavius? Do you needle coracobrachialis? And the question mark is there because in actual fact, we don't teach needling of coracobrachialis. And in, on some of our courses, you won't be uh, um, taught how to needle coracobrachialis. What is the reason for that? Why don't we teach coracobrachialis? Well, the reason is that it's so closely connected to the plexus and the axillary artery. So the position is such that it's very much in the axilla and it's just too dangerous to needle. Subclavius, there again, we don't needle underneath the, uh, the clavicle. There again, because of the lungs and also because of the pectoral plexus. Okay, what about the posterior capsule? Some people say they are needling for posterior capsular stiffness. Some people believe that they are needling just into the distal fibers of infraspinatus and teres minor, which are inserting into the posterior capsule. If you're attempting to needle the posterior capsule, can your needle be going into the shoulder joint? Should we be needling intraarticularly? Here again, I just want to clarify our position on our courses. We do not teach needling into the joint, but I have had conversations with friends of mine who are physios and with physio colleagues who get in touch with me and they say, I've been needling into the knee joint, I've been needling the meniscus, I'm getting very, very good results. And I say, okay, well then that's great. You know, keep going, I'm, I'm very happy for you. Uh, however, we know that there aren't any muscles inside the joints. There's no muscle inside the knee joint. I don't know whether needling the meniscus is actually going to be beneficial for the meniscus or not. But in actual fact, maybe what's happening is, that the therapist, or my, my buddy, my friend is needling, not into the meniscus, but he's needling towards meniscal pain, and he's not actually getting through the capsule or the synovium. He's uh, creating some form of reaction in and around that area that may be alleviating meniscal type pain or other forms of uh, 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 medial knee pain. Okay, so we don't actually um, know whether um, intraarticular needling is actually being done by, by some of our colleagues. I don't needle into the joint, and I don't teach needling into the joint. So what about the AC joint? Can we needle the AC joint for AC joint pain? Well, you can certainly needle around the AC joint. And if you have any um, muscular stiffness, if you have any um, tightness around the AC joint, 
in your kind of like mid to end stage AC joint sprain re recovery or rehabilitation, you can needle around the joint where there is uh, scar tissue and where there is pain associated with movement of the AC joint or with, um, with palpation. Certainly not going to look to needle the glenoid labrum, much like the meniscus of the knee joint. We're not going to try and stick a needle into the shoulder joint and needle the glenoid labrum. Um, and then what about into the subacromial space? Um, me personally, I will open up. I have needled into the subacromial space. I take a very short, very thin needle. I do not attempt, or I'm not saying I'm needling into the ursa. I'm not trying to needle into the rotator cuff or, or, certainly, or specifically the supraspinatus, the distal fibers of the supraspinatus um, tendon. And I'm not saying whether I'm needling for uh, arc of pain or for a positive empty can sign or for a painful supraspinatus on pressure. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm needling into the subacromial space as a kind of a test as to whether the needling is going to cause some kind of reaction for subacromial inflammation or for uh, which is presenting like an arc of pain or pain at full elevation. Okay. And what about the coracochromial ligament? So there are a lot of structures around the shoulder, and I've got question marks here because a lot of these structures you're not going to attempt to needle for, and we know that mainly with dry needling, we are needling the muscles, and we're attempting to needle mainly the trigger points associated with um, the muscles that control the shoulder movement. Right, so moving on to the next uh, slide. We must obviously, before we attempt to fix the patient, we have to be safe and we have to be cautious. Okay, so when we're needling around the shoulder joint and we need these specific muscles, especially the upper traps, we must be very cautious of an apical pneumothorax because this is where the most common pneumothorax can occur. And that's needling straight down through the trapezius muscle and into the lungs. Now, that is not something we attempt to do, so we always elevate the trapezius, we needle straight down with the trapezius pincer gripped and lifted up off the chest wall, and we take a short needle, and we only stick the needle in, uh, say, halfway. So if you're taking a 25 or a 30 mil needle and you're only sticking it in halfway, you're doing that because you've assessed your patient size, you've assessed the size of the trapezius, and you want to make certain that whilst you are fixing your patient, you're not going to give them a pneumothorax. Okay, the same goes for rhomboids and levator scap, because they move the scapula and the rhomboids retract and levate, a scap, levate and rotate the scapula. They are involved with shoulder function and shoulder dysfunction. So we have to be cautious there again of sticking the needle through the ribs and causing a pneumothorax. Same with supraspinatus. You're going to be needling your supraspinatus muscle with um, rotator cuff issues, uh, post uh, rotator cuff or supraspinatus surgery. And when you needle your supraspinatus, you're going to be needling through the trapezius muscle, but your angle of your needle is different now. Your angle of your needle is firstly over the supraspinous fossa, and secondly, a little bit backwards towards the base of the spine of the scapula. Or you might be angling, angling your needle slightly medial or slightly lateral. The reason for that is you've got the suprascapular nerve in the artery, the neurovascular bundle, which goes through the suprascapular notch. You want to make sure you do not needle straight down towards the fossa over the anterior margin of the scapula in the midline. In the midline of that anterior margin, if you can imagine that this is lateral and that is medial and that is your anterior margin of the scapula. In the middle, approximate, is where your suprascapular nerve and artery go through your suprascapular fossa. So if you're needling in that area, you needle posteriorly and angled away towards the of the spine of the scapula or in the medial or lateral direction. The same goes for biceps and for triceps. We have to be cautious in the medial compartment of the arm, of the median nerve, the muscular cutaneous nerve, and the ulnar nerve, the radial nerve, and the brachial artery. So your big neurovascular bundle that courses down the medial aspect of the arm. So on our courses, what we say is no needling, biceps, triceps, or brachialis from the medial side. Everything is done anteriorly for biceps and brachialis, posteriorly for triceps, or from the lateral side towards the medial side, avoiding to cross past two-thirds of the upper arm, because we don't want to go towards the medial aspect. Okay, the same goes for your deltoid muscle. 
the axillary nerve uh, courses around from medial to lateral or from anterior to posterior, and you've got to be careful of the axillary nerve. Your infraspinatus, um, the infraspinatus muscle covers the spinous fossa, and in a very small subsection of patients uh, who are in the older generation and who might have advanced osteoporosis, there may be a fenestration or a couple of fenestrations in the scapula, which are old osteoporotic holes in the scapula. The scapula is a very flat bone. So if you stick a long needle down through infraspinatus muscle and you're expecting to hit the uh, bone of the infraspinous fossa and your needle is going further than normal, then you could be going through a fenestration and you could give your patient a pneumothorax. It's very, very rare, but it is possible. When needling teres major and teres minor, you've got to be careful that you don't miss the scapula and give your patient a lateral pneumothorax. And then again, if you are attempting to needle the posterior capsule, you've got to be careful that you don't stick the needle into the joint. How do you know when you're in the capsule? How do you know how deep you need to go? So we just don't teach needling the uh, articular structure. Okay, also, when needling your patients and for shoulder pain, you have to be cognizant of these general uh, precautions. Firstly, you always have to get consent from your patient. I'm looking here on my uh, Zoom thing, I can see Karine. Karine is a name of just the one person there. If Karine is my patient, it's come for shoulder needling, I have to get Karine to consent to being needling. And nowadays, you have to have written consent. In the litigious society that we live in, you have to have a backed up, signed document that says you have explained to your patient what their diagnosis is. You've explained to them what type of treatment you want to do. Your treatment is going to consist of dry needling. You've asked them if they have any contraindications uh, to be needled. Uh, you've asked them if they're on any form of medication. And you've asked them to say, yes, you may needle me. And now you have the consent of your patient and you have that written and documented such that if in the future your patient came back to you and said, you were the reason for giving me a dropped foot or you were the reason for giving me a pneumothorax or you were the reason for giving me a, um, for causing my convulsions, you can then bring out your notes, bring out the signed consent form and say, well, this is the type of needling I did, this is the needles that I did. Uh, you bring in as your defense in the, the court of law or to your medical uh, counsel uh, hearing an expert needler that would confirm that under this type of needling there is no chance that you cause those issues to your patient okay but you have the consent signed you've also got to make sure that your patient um, being of sound mind is not needle phobic and any patient that is needle phobic or has a severe uh, fear of needles you must not be needling those patients you must also know the underlying medical conditions there are a couple of conditions that if your patient has, you need to be cautious or you mustn't needle them. For example, you must be cautious with your diabetic patient. You must be cautious with your patients that had, have circulatory disorders because needling can cause blood pressure changes and it also causes an increase in superficial um, circulation. You must know what types of medication your patients are on. And certainly, if your patients are on any chronic medication, you must discuss with the doctor. If there are on blood thinning types of medication, needling is likely to cause more need, uh, needling in them than other people, that you want to needle them, but you're going to needle them very gently, such that if something were to happen, then the doctor is aware of that. Before I show you the shoulder needling techniques, I also want you to be aware of the positioning of your patient. It's important that we position them correctly. We always say the patient must recumbent. Recumbent doesn't only mean they must be lying down, recumbent means that they must be safe, such that if your patient were to um, have a, a, vagovagal, a, a, vagovagal, a vasovagal attack, or if your patient were to lose consciousness or just to faint because they can see a needle sticking out of their body, they're in a safe position, they wouldn't fall off a chair or a stool or something like that. You must also assess the state of your patient's injury or pain. Okay, if they're in an acute state, for example, if your patient walks into your clinic three days after dislocating their shoulder, okay, they are still acutely sore. You're not going to attempt to needle the shoulder joint or to needle, let's say it's an anterior dislocation, needle the sensitive anterior structures. You're probably not even going to attempt to do any form of needling. 
Okay, so you need to know the state of the injury. Are they how acute are they? What is the uh, condition? Where are you going to needle? You may needle the traps then, and maybe the posterior structures which have not been injured but which are in spasm because they were stretched or because they're now in spasm to protect the shoulder joint. Do you then want to needle the the, the structures that are in spasm because the spasm might be there as a protective mechanism. You also need to know what type of needling you're going to do for your patient or you need to be cognizant of the type of needling. Cognizant of the patient. Does your patient tolerate needling easily? Does your patient walk through the door and said, I am here because I want dry needling and I hear that you are the best person because my uncle can't see you. That patient is obviously sort of with a positive disposition towards needling whereas the the patient that walks in through the door wants just to be touched and just to have a nice little massage and maybe some ultrasound and now you want to stick a 75 mil needle into their shoulder and you are going to be having them out the door. Another thing you must be aware of is the length of your needle. Safety is very important and safety is determined by number one, where you are needling, what are the underlying structures, what is the size of the needle that you are using and what is the angle that you're going to stick the needle into. And then you must also be aware of the needle reaction. You must be observing your patient and know that if something mild is happening, why is that happening? And you're certainly going to maybe change your needling technique or change the needle position. Okay, so again, is the diagnosis suitable for needling? Is the needling the primary or the secondary treatment modality? Because, for example, needling might not be the first a required treatment. You may be dealing with a, a facet joint injury of the lumbar spine. I'm just giving you a different example. And your patient may require muscle energy techniques or mobilizations or a, an adjustment before you're going to needle the surrounding uh, structures. And for example, for the shoulder as well, there again, if you're dealing with a post anterior um, dislocation, is uh, maybe some. Uh, mobilization exercises or some isometric exercises, the first choice of treatment as opposed to sticking the needling in. I always tell my our attendees on our courses that you're coming on a needling course to learn, learn to needle. You're not only and always going to be using your needle. Sometimes the best form of needling is not needle. All right. Then certainly you must needle under sterile conditions. All right. Clean needles. They are reusable. Then and there in the the treatment uh, circumstance, so in that 10 to 15 to 20 minutes of treatment uh, time, you can reuse your needles, take them out, regard them, put them in. But you don't reuse them between patients and between uh, appointments, clean rooms, uh, clean equipment, wearing gloves, tops, and nowadays with uh, COVID-19, I'm sure you're all wearing uh, extra uh, um, PEs and um, uh, other forms of uh, taking other forms of sterile uh, precaution. <coughs> okay, so what do we needle? What shoulder injuries? Yes, for rotator cuff pathologies. Yes, for secondary pain as a result of slap tears or labral uh, injuries. Yes, for impingement, arc of pain, and overhead pain. Yes, for scap dyskinesis, either to turn off upper active muscles or to try and stimulate hypoactive muscles. Yes, for anterior instability, but certainly not into the acute painful area. Yes, for uh, shoulder girdle issues, upper trap, the trigger points, or, or stress pain. Yes, for short frozen shoulders, but be careful, especially in the acute um, first phase of, uh, of your frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis. Yes, say for biceps tendinopathies. Okay. So we've spoken about consent and the phobic patient, positioning, diagnosis for the suitable needling and avoid needling into the shoulder joint. Right, when needling for shoulder injuries or for pain or for sports conditions, we must obviously be cautious of the fact that needling can cause bruising and soreness. Depending also on the type of needling that you do, some uh, therapists needle very aggressively. So you're going to cause more, more bruising and treatment soreness, whereas other patients, uh, other therapists needle a bit more passively. Avoid needling your acceleration muscles within 24 to 48 hours of your athletic competition. So for example, if you're treating a shoulder patient and they are a javelin thrower, do not go and needle your acceleration muscles, your biceps, your deltoids, your anterior rotator cuffs, your back majors, 
not go and needle them and then aggressively and then have your athlete go out and, and exercise two to three hours later because of the uh, micro tearing and micro bruising that, that has happened within the muscles and also dependent on the type of needling you do. Non-acceleration muscles can be obviously needled at any time. You may want to needle your patients because there are fewer side effects than injecting or medicating and it also has a strong for some sports people. Okay, so let's take a look at some videos. Before we do that, are there any questions? Any questions from anyone about needling around the shoulder, needling in the upper quarter? Any questions whatsoever? You can unmute yourself. If there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead. I'm just having a look at the chat line quickly. Some people here, mostly those who've said that they haven't got any needling experience, and then one Craig, can you needle subscap? Can I needle subscap? Yes, I can. Uh, Ashutosh, do you have a question? Okay, so I'm just going to get the videos up. Sorry, can I ask a question? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Of course you may. Go, go for it. Um, if you've got quite a lot of calcification with the rotator cuff um, pathology, you know, would you still be able to needle there because you're needling the muscle mostly? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, let's just think this through now. So, if you've got some calcific deposits and the calcific deposits are probably mainly in the area of supraspinatus, infraspinatus, probably intracapsular, most probably, I'm just surmising, yeah, then yeah. you're probably not going to be needling the direction of your calcific deposits. No. Okay. So you can, you can needle superficially. So and then when I, I mean that you would then be needling deltoid, the superficial muscle overlying the area of the pain. Um, you know, it really also or, or depends on muscle. How. So, like Sorry, in the that, trigger okay. points, or if you're doing the trigger points of the supraspinatus muscle, infraspinatus yes. muscle, you're not. Yes, near you would definitely the... be needing okay. the trigger points. Okay. Oh, correct. That's that would be different. I mean, the calcific deposits generally are found more intraapsular, yeah, okay. um, near to the. But could it be benef Could it be beneficial to needle though um, into that calcific area at all, but or not? In your experience my experience i have no experience <laughs> i have no uh, intracapsular needling experience into the shoulder joint for specific deposits no okay okay yeah so if you um if you are a, a bit more gung-ho and you want to try that out and you have a patient who is prepared to go for it um i'm not telling you to do it i'm just saying try it Certainly needle the the uh, the supraspinatus muscle belly, infraspinatus muscle belly, and needle deltoid. You'll find a lot with, with chronic shoulder conditions, there will be a lot of trigger points in the deltoid muscle. Okay, so I want to uh, bring up my videos now. I'm going to start with trapezius. And share screen. There we go. Now... I'm just going to flick through the videos. Can everyone see? And can everyone hear? That's the most important thing. Can you hear? Sarav, could you hear? Was the sound good? Sound was good. Okay, great. All right. I just wanted to be sure of that. Okay, so let me go back to, to sharing. Right, so it's coming up now. There we go. I've got a couple of videos to go through, and I'm just going to get right to the point where we stick the needle in. Pincer grip in the muscle. So let's get to the part where we actually start needling. So this is a video from a course we did in Bangalore two years ago. 
we're going to get to the meeting. Oh, sorry about this. There we go. So let me just go a little bit further back. Right, here we go. We pincer grip the muscle. Hold the guide on the skin, push it down, and in that 30 mil needle goes. Now I'm only wearing one glove because that is my hand that is in contact with the patient's skin. You can wear two gloves. When I stick the needle in, I'm feeling for the nature of the muscle. I'm also holding the palpation to feel the twitches. Now we can also needle from the anterior or from the posterior angle. So I'm going to go from the anterior angle now. So we're needling from anterior to posterior. Now along the trapezius muscle. And what I'm saying is you've got to be careful that you don't stick the needle all the way through into your finger on the other side. Okay, still from anterior to posterior. And if we pop ahead now, I'm going to be needling from posterior to anterior. Now I'm going to go from the posterior side. There we go. Now when you needle AP or PA, provided your needle is in the muscle, it's 100% safe from not going into the lungs. So the safest way to needle traps is AP or PA direction. But you must be confident and sure that you don't stick the needle underneath the trapezius muscle. That's the most important thing. All right, so that's trapezius. Any questions on the trapezius muscle, guys? Just unmute yourself. If there's no questions, I'm now going to bring up meeting Craig, for. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't make any difference that you're needling anterior, posterior, posterior, anterior. I mean, does it make any difference um, yeah, with what it you're does, doing? Actually makes a little bit of difference in terms of your success because with people who have very forward sloping forward uh, um, rounded shoulders you find the majority of the trigger points are in the anterior band of that uh, trapezius muscle so if you're needing from the anterior side you're going to be a little bit more successful in getting uh, that band deactivated and getting a lot of twitches and deact um, re releasing the uh, the, the the, the tightness in the muscle. Sometimes you get more um, uh, reaction by needing straight down, vertical. I mean, in the plane of the vertical patient, but when the patient is lying down, it's actually horizontal. In the plane of the vertical patient, it's much more um, accessible that way. So yes, you will find. So what I always do is when I'm when I've got a trapezius patient, I always try AP, PA, and in the vertical plane, and I see which one gives me the best response, and I stick with that. Okay, next, um, next video, I'm going to uh, show levator scap and rhomboids.
Jeffrey, ma'am, are you there? Jeffrey, ma'am. Unmute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, you can start. Uh, it seems some problem with the cracks or computer. So it you can start so. your presentation. Okay, yeah. we'll do that. Let me share yes. screen and see if we can start. And uh, your voice is very clear. So it it's seems better like now. Problem. Yeah, I think it was my device. I've taken my husband's laptop now. So let us yes. trust okay. this will yeah. be better. Wonderful. Come, yeah, bring it to the full screen, then it will be even better. There we go. Can you see there? Yeah, perfect. Yes, yes. Perfect. Please, wonderful, please. Wonderful. please go ahead. Okay. So I'll go ahead. All right. I was, hi everyone. Sorry about all the technical difficulties. I was asked to have a look at shoulder instability and um, a more a, at an approach with taping. Uh, when Craig asked me, I was reminded of a lecture that I attended of um, Joel Cook. Uh, where she said that I only work with from the waist down. So um, that is more my expertise is from the waist down as far as sports injury is concerned. But definitely taping is a love of mine and I have done many in my life. So I decided to have a look at how we would tape more sports specific for the shoulder rather than a general shoulder taping. But in order to do that, we need to have a look and say, what is shoulder instability? Go and see, it basically it is the shoulder's inability to maintain the humerus head in the glenoid fossa. So the shoulder cannot keep that humeral head stable there. So that is what we mean by instability. So the balance of ligaments and muscle structures are therefore disturbed. So there is not a good balance between the structures. So if we had to um, classify it or divide it in, you mostly get traumatic and atraumatic um, instability injuries. So traumatic, there would have been a dislocation. Um, and it's a, it's, there's normally a high recurrence rate of these shoulders. Once they've had the first time dislocation, invariably the second and the third. Most common uh, is obviously the anterior dislocation. And they actually found that 75% of the dislocations is in male patients. Um, when it's atraumatic, it's from somebody develops an instability over time from maybe repetitive overhead movements, which would have caused microtrauma with instability of your glenohumeral joint. You get congenital joint features, so they were born with a laxity of certain structures, which then is typically the patient that can just dislocate his shoulder out of choice. Now, you also get post-surgery complications like glenoid rim lesions, which will then uh, lead to chronic um, dislocations. So basically, in our sportsmen, we either have your repetitive overhead movement problem and your traumatic problem. Now, mostly it would be anterior. You Rarely we get posterior dislocations and sometimes you get multi-directional dislocations. Now, what is important for us in glenohumeral stability? You've heard quite a few speakers today talking about uh, all the muscle structures around the shoulders. And I definitely think your capsular ligamentary is very important. So it's our static stabilizers. But then what we can use in our taping is our muscular tenderness. So your dynamic stabilizers. They are... Uh, uh, can I say we can activate them with some taping. So what are the important factors to consider in our taping of shoulders is the area and the degree of stability, instability. So if you're going to take a look at a shoulder that you need to tape, we want to see where is the instability and how unstable is the shoulder? How much security do we need to give the patient? Sporting activities and the demands on the shoulder is also very important because certain sports demand far more from a shoulder stability than other sports would. 
Now, the question is, can tape really help? Are we wasting our time in applying this tape just to keep the muscle between the ears happy? Um, Definitely, it has been proven that proprioception plays a very important part in shoulder stabilization. And that is why you would rather apply tape than a brace. Because with bracing, you cannot activate the proprioception factor. And as you can see by the fact that I wrote down, that they've done various histological studies in anatomical specimens to confirm the presence of afferent nerve endings. And they are distributed right into the capsular ligamentous complex. So that is what we need to stimulate. Failure of the static capsule ligament is stabilizing and it will lead to instability. So if we can stimulate that with proprioception, we can increase the stability. Um, a delayed proprioceptive message is due to the inhibition of the afferent endings. Therefore, as I'm saying, is there's an error of coordination of the corresponding muscle response. So our dynamic stabilization is altered. And that is definitely a loss of proprioception has a huge factor there. So if we have a look at what are quickly, I think they have been mentioned, but just in summary again, what are our dynamic stabilizers? This is our rotator cuff muscles, our biceps long head and our deltoid, those are your primary ones. And then secondary, we will have the influence of teres major, lats and pecs. And then they also talk about your rotator cuff interval having a huge um, influence. It's the triangular shaped space between the tendons of subscap and supraspinatus, and the base is of the choroid process. So they say if this area has a large um, increase in problems, then you get more anterior tr translation of the humeral head. So those are just subscap and supra are two of the muscles that we will like to use in our stimulation of our taping. Now, there's various classifications and I've gone through, or I went through quite a few of them to see what applies to us and the taping. And in the olden days, we, they always used tubs and ambry to classify for instability. But they definitely have found that there's quite a bit of overlapping. And if you look at the triangular um, classification, they say muscle patterning, and we've heard all about uh, muscle energy and using other muscles like in your lats and everything, that I do think when we assess a patient to see what, how, in what group we're going to add, put them for taping, we need to consider all the muscles together with the type of instability injury, whether traumatic and atraumatic. So your influence of that is very important. Many patients may have symptoms, especially pain without instability. Um, laxity exists in many patients without symptoms then. So some have symptoms, no instability. Others have instability, but no symptoms. Some patients can subluxe their shoulders without symptoms. So two elements must be found together to define instability. Patients must have discomfort and a feeling of looseness or slipping or the shoulder going out to meet the def definition of instability for us to tape it. Um, <clears throat> taping, does it help? Now, as I said to you, definitely with the proprioception, that we need, if we need to assist a shoulder for support in sport, we need to go and have a look at stabilizing over the joint for capsular proprioceptive activation, as well as muscle activation of the muscles assisting in the stabilizing, whether we're going to stabilize for anterior, posterior, or inferior dislocations. And then you need to go and see how much range do you need to limit in this taping? So that brings me back to taping. First, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about the tapes that we'd like to use for this. Um, 
the one thing that you must know, and I say it later on in the one video I'm going to play for you as well, is that I do not believe that any player that needs tape to be on the field should be on the field. So it's extremely important that they are stable enough and strong enough to be able to do it without tape and that you would rather tape to assist them that 5% more. Now, if we have a look at what tapes are on the market, you get your dynamic tape, um, which would be, as you can see, this tape. You also get it in the brown one, which is on my picture and a more fleshy colored tape. I'll explain to them you about that later. And then we get our kinesiology tape that you all know. And then when I talk about athletic taping, we're talking about our EABs, which is our stretch and our rigid. That falls under athletic taping. And then you get the McConnell taping with the Fixamol and the um, Luco P. Okay. Um, if we look just quickly at the explanation of the tapes, athletics is an EAB, rigid, and obviously bandages also classifies under that. So mostly for stability type of work, we would be using rigid taping. Now your EABs come in various sizes, your 25 mils, 50, 70s and 100, your rigids, um, your Luco S and Strapple. The nice thing about the modern rigid is that it's got a serrated edge. So you don't struggle to cut it anymore. Uh, it can just be torn. Um, yeah, you can see the various brands that are available on the market. As long as it's got for your EAB enough of a stretch and the stickiness is good because often when you're buying fakes, the stickiness is not good and it just falls off. And with your rigid that it's not too thin if you're buying a generic brand. Um, now, athletic taping is very rigid. So we would be using this in a case where we really want to stabilize that joint anteriorly and posteriorly, and also for a more aggressive sport like a rugby match. Uh, we use it preventative, and it's left on only for a short period of time. This athletic taping, cannot be applied long before an event. Preferably, it needs to be applied within an half an hour to an hour of the event because it loses its effectiveness as time goes on. You must just be careful with athletic taping because it has a latex content. Um, it's possible that it can cause skin irritations. So you need to make sure that people are not allergic to the tape. And if you are applying it incorrectly and with too much tension, you will get quite a bit of joint and muscle compression, and this might also be an irritant to the patient. It has no rehabilitative purpose. The only purpose for this taping is for support. A little bit of proprioceptive, yes, that we do get. If we have a look at your McConnell taping, that consists of your leukopia and your fixamol. Um, as we know it, it comes from, it was originally uh, um, found by Jenny McConnell from Australia. And this is basically a retraining type of taping. So I like to use it when I'm doing rehabilitation of my patients in the gym with exercises to actually tape the joint into the right position and then do the exercises so that they can strengthen in the correct manner. Um, it's super rigid and it's a very tough taping, mostly used for um, subluxations, yes, and you can also do very nice scapular stabilizing with that. Uh, but it is quite suffocating and you cannot leave it on for more than 18 hours because like the athletic taping, it might cause a skin irritation. But definitely for neuromuscular re-education, I like to use McConnell taping.
Now, just a little bit on kinesiology taping, and I know it's very controversial out there. A lot of people are saying, yes, it's just a gimmick. It's a nice fashion statement, but it's been around for over 40 years. And if something's been around that long, there's got to be something useful in there. And I always say, um, are we looking at research or are we looking at what the benefit the patients are feeling? And when we do the courses, we have great fun, as you can see by the legs taping there. Now, there are many brands available on the market for taping. Um, just have a look. It doesn't matter what you use as long as the glue is sticks properly and that there is not too much stretch on the tape. Now, just a little bit on history for those of you who don't know. Uh, founder was Dr. Kenzo Kays. He's a chiropractor from, um, actually from the US. And he's, the, his reason for looking at the tape is said that pain most often causes a dysfunction in the muscles and the muscle tissue, especially around the joint. So he wanted to do something to reduce the pain. And to reduce pain, he had to get tape to restore normal muscle function. Now, I have used the tape extensively and I really find that there are some great results. And as I said here in the red, I have experienced results, but as with anything we use as physios, it's not a standalone therapy. And that's what a lot of this testing is happening, is they're testing it as a standalone. It is something that you add in addition to your manual therapy, to your massaging, to your muscle energy techniques, everything. So it's something that you add and then it will have an effect. As we can see, this is just an example of the tape. It's a little easier to see. It has a wave pattern and it has some areas of glue and some areas of non-glue. So just a hint, when you're applying the tape and some people are lazy and they don't want to clean the skin properly and then they spray glue all over the skin, it's not going to help them. Then you might as well use an EAB tape. So you're only allowed to use glue in the application if you're using it as a support tape or on the ends of the tape. For the shoulder taping, if we're using it, um, you will see in my video, there are only certain areas that are glue for that. Now, the basic principle for this is that when you've got an inflammation and you've got pain, you've got compression of your nerve endings, your lymph system, and your blood vessels. By applying the tape, we get a little bit of a lift, which then they have actually proved by MRI studies that you get, there's a change in the interstitial space, which then gives us this lift and a reduction in pressure in that area. So um, the idea is that we normalize your circulation, which then enables the body to heal itself because Everything we do, we're actually kick-starting the body healing processes. Uh, and definitely the improvement in circulation for bruising and edema is fantastic. Now, for purposes of our shoulder taping, um, the improvement of muscle function is when we get muscle activation. Um, and that is what we like to use for our shoulder stabilizing. So if somebody has weak scapula stabilizers, we will activate with Kinesia on the scapula stabilizers and maybe use, uh, you will see my one, I use a, a combination taping of dynamic and Kinesia for support. But you can also do an athletic rigid with a Kinesia in um, a shoulder taping. Pain relief, that's just the, to say, say what in theory what the pain relief is, is due to the irritated nociceptors and the increased pressure on them. And by lifting that pressure, our normal um, inhibiting of pain, our feel good hormones, as we always uh, jokingly say, get released and we get a reduction of pain. But now for the shoulder taping, is the fourth one joint support and function. Now, if you really, really need support, you're not going to be using Kinesia tape. It's not strong enough. But what's very nice about the tape, when you take up the tension of the tape, it becomes like a rigid. And the fact that it is latex-free helps that you can leave it on for a longer time. And you will see when I explain, the other factor is why we like to use it for support is that it stays on in water. 
And this is the only tape when you're taping that stays on long enough for a water polo match. Unfortunately, it's banned by swimming uh, uh, bodies. So you're not allowed to use it on swimmers. So what is the properties? It's latex free. It's water resistant. We can use it for most clinical conditions. And jokingly, we always say your colors, um, your darker colors increases the temperature. Uh, so you would use it for uh, muscle spasm. Uh, whereas your lighter colors is more for reduction of temperature and then you will use that for inflammation and so on. But the nicest thing about kinesiology taping is that it allows for a full range of movement. And that is why we like to use it because it's not a POP you're putting on. Patients can actually move through that. So how would I apply kinesio tape? You have a base, you stretch the muscle where possible, and then you put the tape on and you touch the paper and not the tape so that we don't ruin the glue on the tape. Those are basic rules for that. And then just other basic rules is there must be no oil or excessive hair on the skin for you to apply it effectively. And then decide if you want to support or act, uh, in other words, you're going to take up all the stretch or you want to do a muscle stretch, then you just apply the tape. Then we don't stretch the tape if we want to get our muscle activation. We always like to round the edges, you will see in my video, because um, it will be, it stays on a little bit longer. Then I put in a block here that says assess the patient before applying the tape. And that goes for all the tapes that I have been explaining now. The reason for this is that sometimes you would apply, as I said, stabilizing maybe anterior, but posterior, you want to do muscle activation. So you need to go and see where is the weakness in the patient. And as I said in the beginning, you need to know, am I taping for an anterior instability, posterior or inferior? If we have a look at dynamic tape, the last tape, you will see that this comes from Australia. It's developed by an Australian physio, Ryan Kendall. And if I had to just differentiate between dynamic and kinesio, I would say kinesio is my healing tape, whereas dynamic tape is a great movement tape. So you would apply this to reduce the load in the muscular tenderness area. Um, taping allows for multiple planes and unrestricted ROM, but the big difference is also it has a four-way stretch. It will stretch that way, and that way, whereas your kinesiology tape only has a two-way stretch. It has no stretch across. Um, you can see the one that I've been showing you on the video is the black one. That is a far stronger and tighter tape. Uh, then you get the other two, which is slightly less tension. Okay, so if you've got, to, you want more support and more stability, then you can use that uh, black tape. But if you want more movement, I'd go for the other two. This is just um, a little bit of, um, how can I say, useless information, a comparison between the two, uh, so that you can see the difference between Kinesia and Dynamic, because when Dynamic first came out, everybody said it's a replacement for Kinesia, but it's definitely not. Both have a function on their own. And you can see that the stretch of your kinesio tape is far more than uh, uh, your dynamic tape than your kinesio tape. Uh, kinesio tape has an end point, whereas dynamic tape does not have an end point. And generally speaking, when we apply a kinesio tape, it will be the mus muscle in the lengthened stretched position, whereas dynamic tape is applied in the shortened position. There's also just some other neurophysiological factors. Um, lifting of the skin is a big part, improvement of circulation. Whereas with a dynamic tape, it, it works almost like a bungee cord. Okay, so you imagine um, the cord uh, tape absorbs the load, decelerating the movement, thereby reducing the eccentric workload. 
as the muscles then shorten, the stored energy is re-injected to assist with the concentric contraction. So that's why I term it a movement tape. Complete effect results in reduced loads, less pain, and metabolic demand. Okay. Um, there is just some other articles and stuff that I cited, which is not important for us now. Uh, the benefit is to, on both of these, um, you can leave it on for three to five days. They're both latex free and they actually nice and exciting. They soft touching and people love wearing them. And that, that's where this fashion statement comes in. Mostly contraindications are the normal uh, contraindications for applying tape. Um, obviously, um, I would not apply any of the tapes in the first trimester of pregnancy, um, just because I'm being overcautious, but a pregnant lady would not go and do sport where, uh, with a shoulder needing taping for that is the purposes of this lecture. Okay, so let's have a look. I want to show you guys a video. So I'm just going to stop share uh, of the different tapings that I did. Let's go back to share screen here. Yeah. See, can you guys hear this one? Uh, the last typing that we're going to oh, be looking at one. is typing for hold a on, throwing. Hold on. Let me just find the other one. I'll just show you the other one here. There it is. <clears throat> okay. Show the screen. Today we're going to be looking at taping of shoulders for instability. We mainly get anterior dislocations in sport. That is the most common in a month. Sorry. I'm going to just share it again. It just left me there. Today we're going to be looking at taping of shoulders for instability. Can you hear this? We mainly uh, get we can see the thing. In can you see? That is the most common in a In a rare occasion. Can't see. Yeah, we can't see. Let's try to please. X uh, share screen. Stop share. <laughs> share screen. Can yeah. you see this? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Let me play it. Do you see it small or full screen? You would get a posterior dislocation and an inferior dislocation. For taping, we're going to be looking at different sports and different ways of taping. Now, personally, I do believe if a player needs taping, you shouldn't be on the sports field. But we need to assist the high demands of our sporting generation these days and help a player to get back, even if a lot of the effect is for the muscle between the ears. Stabilizing needs to be done with a thought behind it. So let's have a look and see how does an anterior dislocation occur. It occurs with abduction, excessive external rotation, popping the shoulder out 
and Terry. Sometimes it can be with an extended arm and a blow to the posterior humerus, as I explained before. Now, for an internal adduction, you would get a blow to the anterior shoulder, causing a posterior dislocation. Rarely, you would get a blow from the top, causing an inferior dislocation. We can mostly uh, see, uh, look at stabilizing for an anterior dislocation. Now, for a rugby game, which is rough, and it's tumbling, and it's gripping, and it's turning, we need to have a far stronger taping than I would, for instance, for water polo or cricket. So firstly, we're going to have a look and see what do we want to stabilize. We want to stabilize the shoulder from moving excessively out the weaker anterior structures. Yet, we want to shorten it for the posterior structures that are overstretched and weak. So mostly if you take the shoulder, you will shorten your angle slightly of your pecs. Then we will tighten it to posteriorly to prevent the external rotation that we had before that caused a dislocation. So shortening this angle prevents excessive external rotation, causing a popping of the shoulder in that, in that instance. Use something to stabilize so that you've got a good angle. Now to get your humeral head into the fossa, we need to make use of deltoid as well. That is why I like to stabilize with the deltoid as well as shortening of the pecs and stabilizing my capsule posteriorly. Firstly, we would put a base down with your cover plaster, which is called your fixable. You do get, for bigger patients, you would get a 75 mil. Be careful with the fixamol. Don't try and remove the backing too quickly because once this folds, you might as well return it to the dustbin. So we will place our base plaster to fix everything over, just over the acromion, down onto the shoulder. This gives you a base to work from. We will do the same over the arm to get a good attachment base there. Making sure when you take it around the arm that you're at least four fingers below the apex of the deltoid. Making sure your patient does do a little bit of tension on his bicep so that the cover plaster is not too tight. Now I make sure my position is correct with my shortened angle, and then I use rigid tape. You can use any brand of rigid tape um, as long as it is, there is no stretch and it has got enough stickiness to apply. We will apply it in a cross from posterior onto by fix them all there, and then pulling up to get my humerus head into the fossa there. And then I will bring in a second cross on both areas onto the arm, and pulling up to shorten that angle. I like to add a third one to make sure I've got more stability on the anterior side. From there, we use an elastic adhesive bandage. Depending on the size of your patient, you would either use a 50 mil or a 75 mil. Your elastic adhesive bandage must have a stretch and normally they have a yellow down line down the center. So we take the tape easy around the arm, making sure you don't have excessive pressure that will compress the uh, bicep and tricep. So you take it there, place the ball there for comfort of the patient, 
and the same is done for the posterior area. Here we go. This side, place it down, and we come around. Make sure you don't put the tape too tight. Remember, tape is applied, not stretched on. Because obviously the guy has to play the match. So it must not be like a POP. Now, you can test and see what his limitations are. You can see in testing he cannot do excessive um, external rotation and adduct of an extension there, which is exactly the effect that we want. We will then reapply a strip over to stabilize it. You will then reapply your fixamol to stabilize it over the chest area. If your patient is going to be doing a lot of lifting, and you're concerned that this will not stay, then I suggest you put a strip around the body fixating this. You also get braces that they can then apply over this to keep your taping there. So the patient will hold his arm there and he can immediately feel it stabilizes and it prevents excessive external rotation abduction. Let me just show you the next video. Uh, where did that one go? Okay, hold on. Okay. Can you see this one? Yes, ma'am. Now we're going to take a look at how we would tape the shoulder for water polo. Now, uh, the rules of swimming is that you're not allowed to use any tape on any swimmer. But fortunately for water polo, they haven't banned taping in water polo. And this has been very nice when Kinesho taping came out because it's the only tape that really stays on in water. I have found though, if they play consecutive matches like in tournaments, it's better to use a spray glue to make sure that it stays on the skin. And make sure that you put the Kinesho taping on at least an hour before the event. Now, the areas that you would spray would be on this chest area where you want to get the stabilization and around the arm area where it would come loose. Easy. The idea of a water polo is for us to allow the player to still take a proper shot. And for taking a proper shot, they need to come right back into external rotation before releasing the ball. So we're not going to limit a lot of the rotation, um, the um, external rotation as we did in a rugby tape. So we're going to be measuring to stabilize it from there. But now because we will be using the tape as a stabilizing tape, you will cut your strips slightly shorter and not the exact length of what you want to take. I have often varied the taping according to the need of my patients. This is just a general stabilizing, but if you go obviously have assessed the patient, you've seen that there is a greater need for him to pull the humerus into the fossa and stabilize it from the deltoid, you would emphasize that more. 
if the player has more of a need of getting a little bit of stabilizing anterior, you will pull more on the anterior side. We will apply two strips to the posterior side to activate the, the posterior muscles, being your external rotators and your abductors. So we have glued this area and we have glued that area. We want to stabilize. So if we stabilize, always with kinesia, do not put any stretch on the base because that will cause blistering for the patient. So as we do it with a rigid tape, we will now take up the stretch over the joint line. The rest you just lay down without any stretch. So my only stretch on my tape is in this area. My second strip, I will take from there, no stretch there, stretch over the joint line, and then because I want to help with muscle activation, I will then bring the muscle on a stretch and apply the rest of the tape, if you can, patient can turn, you can see that is applied from there to there with the muscle on stretch and no stretch on the tape. Try to get no folds and creases. Then we will do a second strip. Face down, no stretch. Stretch over the anterior area, no stretch for the rest of the muscle. And our fourth strip, I'm going to do slightly longer because I want to help with a little bit more muscle activation over the scapular area. So once again, we place our base down with no stretch. Our stretch is over the joint. You activate, then you put the patient on a stretch. And we come down to the inferior border of the scapula, helping with infraspinatus as well as teres minor and, and major. Okay, and we bring that back. Now you can do. A throw, but that would have been glued down there, and that will stop him from uh, activate the muscles to stabilize the shoulder to prevent anterior dislocation. If the player feels he is not stable enough and you would like to add a little bit of pressure of the humerus into the fossa, we do a singular strip. Your pressure, your position is about two fingers just below the chromium. In line with the shoulder joint line, you push up into the shoulder there. Okay? There, and then we lay down piece there. And lay that one down. Remember, end, no stretch to avoid blistering. Okay. And you feel the stability is more in that, keeping it very tight there with the humerus. Okay, so this is a humeral strip. If the patient turns sideways, you can see that is the cross strip. Okay, last video coming up. Um, okay, let me just open that last one. Share screen and share. The last 
typing that we're going to be looking at is typing for a throwing sport like cricket or basketball or something like that. And I like to use a combination of dynamic tape with kinesiology tape. The reason being you want to see if you can get a little bit of muscle activation and the dynamic tape I fondly term a movement tape whereas I, I refer to the kinesiology tape as a healing tape. But together, for a throwing sport, I find I get the best effect. Now you get uh, the brown dynamic tape as well as the black. I find the black is stronger for sport, and if you can get hold of this, this is a nicer one to use. Now the idea is we're going to be applying the tape in a spiral. You know that our dynamic tape works to, uh, as I said, just like a spring. So it's actually doing part of the action of the muscle. So what we want to do, we're going to take this and bring the tape around and pull it up to create more internal rotation to prevent the arm from doing excessive external rotation. Okay, so if I want to create internal rotation, okay, you saw here, this is external rotation there. And that will cause dislocation. And that is what's causing pro problems for the player. We don't want that. We want more internal rotation. So we are going to assist with better internal rotation. All right, so that there's not excessive external rotation. This is for instabilities. So we will once again place a base down there and then we will take the tape and you will put a stretch on it bringing it into an internal rotation position there to there. I like to add um, a second stroke if it's going to be for sport and I think we should have it a little bit longer on there. Always round your edges slightly because that makes for a better application. So once again, remember with dynamic tape not to put any stretch on the end because this can really cause excessive blistering. Exactly what we did now, we pulled it a little bit more in there of the patient to side flex so that there's no tension on the neck muscles there. Okay, and then from there, we are going to stabilize with a little bit of a combination of kinesio tape. There are many videos about taping on YouTube and I suggest that you play around and see what you, what your players, your sportsmen find most comfortable. But stick to the basic principles of a dynamic tape assists in the movement, a kinesiology tape you can use because it sticks longer and better and it's not as strong. So it won't be for your very aggressive sports whereas your rigids and your EABs you would be using in your more aggressive sports like your rugby matches. So here we will then once again have a bit of a stabilization, no stretch on the base, and then bringing it around onto the arm. As you could see the whole time I was using a ball, it's much easier if the patient can stabilize his arm on a movable object that you can change your angles that you are taping rather than trying to hold the arm in a position. And yeah, we will do some posterior stabilizing. Pulling there and no stretch as we come around the arm. Always when applying tape in combination, apply dynamic first and then add your additional tape. So that will then, now you can bowl, give me a bowling action, and it will assist him in the movement 
thus making the muscles work less hard in this situation. But yet, I've got a stabilizing strip for the anterior portion. Thank you. Um, that is basically just the videos I had for this. Um, let me just go get back. Stop sharing. Okay. Um, if you want to use the uh, rigid tape with Kinesio or dynamic, you're also welcome to do that. So that's basically a summary on shoulder instabilities and taping. Um, and that is what I have for you this afternoon at last. <laughs> Thanks for that, Jax. Uh, I'm back. I had a technical uh, issue as well. Apologies for that. <laughs> See you back. Uh, you're in good company. <laughs> We're making a meal of this one. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I'm so thank glad you were able to you were able to um, pop in for me there. So thank you very much for that, Jackie. If anyone's got any questions, we can take two or three minutes of questions, and then I'm going to finish showing my demonstration videos for the needling. And then we will be inviting Kareen to uh, present Question from... For Jackie, ma how, how to eliminate skin irritation or formation of blisters from using kinesio tape? Um, definitely for not to put any stretch on the tape. You will get blistering with kinesio and dynamic and especially dynamic. And it's mostly because people are stretching the tape and not just applying the base first and overstretching causes blistering. Dear participants, kindly unmute yourself and ask questions if you have anything. Uh, good evening, ma'am. It's Mr. Sujit speaking. Good day. Hello? Yes, I can hear uh, you. Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, what about the taping, use of taping in uh, neurological condition just like uh, stroke patient, uh, shoulder, uh, shoulder pro problem in stroke. Yes, definitely. Um, I don't work personally with stroke patients, but some of my colleagues have, and they've said it's definitely assisted them in their rehabilitation, especially with the subluxed shoulder in the stroke patients. And they find that um, your dynamic tape to assist the movement helps uh, quite a lot in that. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Hello, I have one question. Can I ask? Yes. I understand it. Yeah, Jackie, ma'am, I want to ask you uh, what, how you will use uh, dynamic uh, tape in case of uh, instability of the shoulder because it's a movement tape. It may uh, increase the movement, but there is chances to increase instability also. So what are the way you can use uh, dynamic tape, alone dynamic tape? A low dynamic, I would use to change the movement. So yeah. where you would, they have a very weak um, internal rotation movement. You will assist the internal rotation to make that stronger. And then in that sense, protect it from going into the stronger movement that they were used to doing. So players develop what we call cheating movements. Yeah. So you will assist, use your dynamic tape to enhance the weaker movements and get them out of the cheating, cheating movements. Okay. So it's a movement pattern you will be looking at. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next is a question from Esha. What should be the duration of taping? As in um, how many times must you tape? I would guess as in maybe how long would you leave the tape on for? Okay, I explained that, that dynamic and kinesia can be left on for three to five days. But if you're going to do a stabilizing taping for an event, it must be removed after the event. I would also not tape forever. Uh, but in a sense, I would tape for every match if a player has a problem. So I would tape him right throughout the season because what's the point in him getting injured? I would uh, tape him for the match and make sure his rehabilitation program is on par, that he does all his exercises and everything because a lot of people believe taping makes the muscles lazy, but rather do your rehab properly and protect it for the event. Okay, Jackson, there's one last question from Trina in Belfast. 
use taping and I find it really helps. A lot of physios recently calling it a sham or passive treatment. Can you comment? Yes, early in the beginning of the lecture, I said that, yes, a lot of people are saying, yes, it's a sham, but if it's been around for that long, there's got to be some benefit. And as I said, this is not a standalone. And I think that is where the sham comes in, because if you're going to only use Ganesha, it's not going to work. You've got to use it with all your other techniques. And um, basically ask the patient, do they feel better and does it make a difference? And if the yeah. patient does, then I'm sorry, then I carry on using it. Sure, exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, lots you. of different opinions. Um, mm. Some patients like being taped, some players don't. But uh, great talk. Thank you, Jackie. I'm very sorry I missed uh, some of it. I'm glad to be back. Glad you're and, back. Thank uh, you. <laughs> you're welcome to stick around. I'm going to complete uh, demonstrating and showing you my dry needle videos now, guys. So I just want to apologize for my technological malfunction earlier. Uh, laptop decided that it was time to do an update and it just went boom, on the screen. So I'm really sorry about that. I'm going to share my videos. It can go back to the uh, video that I was um, uh, going to show you guys, which was the levator scap on the rhomboids. So let me open that now. Share the screen. There we go. All right, so we start with the rhomboids. So we're starting with the levator scap. So I'm standing at her head. And I'm just identifying the scapula, the outline of the scapula. And the strongest anatomical reference point is the spine of the scapula. Let's go a little bit further ahead. I'm just going to go ahead to the actual needling position. There we are. I'll just go back a little bit. Okay, so the angle of the needle is quite important here. The angle of the needle is about 45 degrees to the floor through the trap and into levator scap. The reason we're angling the needle is so we don't go perpendicular straight down and through the ribs. So the needle is going to go along the levator scap muscle towards the insertion. Okay, so that's levator scap. Let's uh, toggle along towards the rhomboids. There are three ways you can needle the rhomboids. There are two very safe ways. One is either across the ribs in the direction that I'm palpating, so superior, inferior, inferior, superior. One is the lateral direction with the fibers towards the scapular insertion. The other technique is the vertical technique, perpendicular to the skin straight down towards the ribs. But that is the risky technique because if you don't know the depth of the ribs, you could easily go through the intercostal space and into the lungs. So let me toggle ahead to the point where we're actually needling. Now what I'm demonstrating is how to palpate the ribs, estimate the depth of the rib, hit the rib. 
So if you can actually hit the rib and you know the depth of the rib, then you can safely needle to that depth. If the depth is 20 mils, you can take a 30 mil needle and you can safely needle only to 20 mils and your needle will always stay out on the chest and you won't give your patient any methorax. So I'm actually missing the rib now or I'm not hitting it. You're either not hitting the rib because your estimated depth is not correct and so you still have a little bit further to go or you're in the intercostal space. And that's why it's important to set yourself a depth that you're not going to go past so that if you're in the intercostal space, you're not going to go into the lungs thinking that you've got further to go to hit the ribs, but in actual fact, you're not over the ribs. Okay, so now I've hit the rib. And now if those are the ribs there and the needle is hitting the rib, we can needle anywhere along that rhomboid muscle to that depth and the needle will never go into the lungs like that. We'll always just needle to that same safe depth. Okay, so there's one of the participants feeding the rib. So the rib feels like a door, feels like a wall, it's hard, it's firm, it's bony. The only way you can get through the rib is if you dig a hole, but you're not trying to do that. Okay, so let's have a look at the other techniques. If I'm demonstrating, that's another vertical technique, into the trigger point. The main trigger points of the rhomboid you'll find are more commonly in the rhomboid minor muscle just before the insertion into the scapula at the base of the spinal scapula. Very, very popular spot for your rhomboid, major rhomboid minor trigger point. Okay, so that's rhomboids. The next um, thing I'm going to share with you is subscapularis and pectoralis minor. These are two quite tricky, I uh, don't want that, I want to share it in the correct format. There we go. Okay, so, so two very tricky, difficult muscles to needle are subscap and pectoralis. Now, the anatomy of subscap, let's just turn the volume down. The anatomy of subscap is from the ventral surface of the scapulus. In other words, the space between the scapula and the chest wall, laterally to the humerus. So when you palpate the scapula, as most of you know, it's quite difficult to get your fingers into that space and to palpate subscapularis muscle, unless you've got about 10 to 15 minutes where you can slowly get the muscles to relax, get the tissues to relax, and you can slowly get your hand in there. But it's a very tricky space and a tricky area. What I'm palpating here is in that area of concavity is the lateral border of the scapula there and the chest wall over here. And that concavity over there is where the needle is going to go in. So we're going to put the needle in over there. We're going to I'm going to be needling with probably a 60 or a 75 mil needle. And the most, most important thing with subscapularis lateral approach, this is the more difficult approach, the most important thing, is that your angle, angle has to be approximately 45 degrees so that it's not going towards the chest. It needs to be going parallel to the curve of the ribs. As the ribs are curving from anterior around to posterior, the needle is about 5 to 10 mils away from the ribs and it's parallel to that curve. And so the needle goes along the broad width of the subscapularis muscle and often your patient will experience a very deep ache Often they'll experience a referral of pain to the shoulder joint or the elbow or the forearm, sometimes around the wrist. There was a big twitch. If you can just imagine that your 90 degree angle of vertical and horizontal is like that, the needle angle is at 45 degrees into that space. 
Very important, you do not needle up into the axilla. But do not needle up in that direction and do not start up here because of axillary artery brachial plexus. Minor, let's move along to pec minor. The pec minor muscle arises from the coracoid process of the scapula and goes down. It has three heads mainly, and it goes down to the third, the angle of the third, the fourth, and the fifth rib. The fifth rib corresponds approximately to the nipple, and the pec minor muscle does not insert medially to the rib cartilages, but it inserts laterally at the join between the rib and the rib cartilage. So the angle of the muscle, the direction of the muscle is always slightly outside the rib cage. You're going to see I'm going to needle from proximal in the process distally towards the insertion at an angle and you have to go through pec major to the pec minor muscle. So I always stand at the head of the patient and I look down the length of the muscle. I imagine the medial head going medially, the central head and the lateral head going straight down. So the obvious reason that I'm showing you the needling for pec minor is that many shoulder issues are complicated by a protracted shoulder and a protracted shoulder is often exacerbated by a short or overactive pec minor and the needling of the pec minor is a brilliant way to release the muscle to try and get a little bit more, or sorry, a little bit less protraction of your scapula, your shoulder blade. When you hit the pec minor muscle, the patient will 95% of the time feel a deep ache. It will definitely reproduce their symptoms. And you will feel, and this is a common occurrence, you will feel that whenever you go into the deeper muscle, because pec minor is deeper to pec major, the deeper muscle has a stiffer feeling on the needle. So you know when you're in the muscle. It's just very important here that the line of your needle does not go medial towards the chest. It goes straight down or slightly lateral. So there again, we're needling with further distal fibers, and I'm needling in a lateral direction. You can also needle the proximal fibers straight down through pec major into pec minor. You are also pretty safe up here because remember that your first, your second, and your third ribs are short ribs. So the position, the anatomical position of the proximal fibers of pec minor are already lying outside of the chest. So the proximal fibers have absolutely no risk of going into the chest provided you don't have a long needle angled medially. Okay, we've got time for one last video. I'm going to stop that one. If anyone has got any questions, those are quite tricky knee, uh, muscles to needle. Any questions, please just uh, unmute yourself and ask me quickly. And I'm going to now demonstrate uh, needling. I've got a video for supraspinatus. It's not me. It's uh, our Indian instructor. Um, Right, here we are. The Indian instructor, Sukumar. So here's the head, there's the neck, there's the head. There's the supraspinatus there like that. There's the traps overlying supraspinatus. It's palpating the spine of the scapula. Important points with supraspinatus are number one, you don't needle too medially because then you miss the scapula and you go through the uh, traps into the, the lungs. Because remember, supraspinatus is a deep muscle. Number two, you angle slightly inferiorly so that your needle's going away from that suprascapular nerve and artery. Number three, you also make sure your needle is angled slightly cordad, in other words, inferiorly, because you don't want to miss the anterior margin of the scapula, anterior border, 
Because if you miss that, we'll be going towards the lungs, towards the first, the second rib space, or the thoracic outlet space into the apex of the lungs. So your definite angle of your supraspinatus needling is slightly inferiorly, slightly caudad, slightly medial, slightly lateral. Make sure you are over the supraspinous fossa. Make sure you are not too medial over the rhomboids or the traps. And also, you can needle in a lateral direction the lateral fibers with your needle at about 30 degrees going underneath the acromion. Okay. All right. All right, guys. So it's uh, five to three. Um, I think we can have five minutes of questions with regards to the dry needling presentation and the videos. Green Bezadenet is lined up to take over. We can also probably now just have a five minute, uh, while we're taking some questions, we can have a five minute comfort break. If someone wants to go and make a cup of tea or a coffee, or go to the loo, that's absolutely fine. If you've got any questions for me, then please just unmute yourself and fire away. Or if there are any questions in the chat, then please um, send them to the chat or I will have a look. I don't see any questions. I'm Craig. Yes, Karine. Uh, with levator scap, do you also try and angle into the edge of the scapula? Actually, you say the, the edge of the scapula, do you mean the uh, superior medial superior. angle? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Okay. I find it very effective if you hmm. target those distal fibers in actual fact the tenio osseous uh, junction there. Yeah. Okay. And then sometimes and then, what we also. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. If, no, you can finish first. Uh, sometimes what we also do is um, we it's quite tricky to actually locate and to hit because that superior medial angle's got a bit of a lip to it, and then you've got the the fossa. If you can hit that lip of the superior medial angle, then you can needle vertically because then you know the depth of the scapula, and if it's sitting on top of the ribs. If you only needle to that depth, you're going to go into levator scap, and you're going to be safe in a vertical or perpendicular direction. Otherwise, we needle at an angle down the length of the fibers. Okay. Um, and then I'm sorry I'm, I missed a little bit of the supraspinatus video um, when I was taught we lay on the side I think with the arm um, elongated next to your body yeah. uh, does it matter so much no, um, it doesn't Not at all. Okay. you can needle your patients on their head you know that's comfortable <laughs> for them no the, the only thing um, I find Kareen is that I like to, just from my positioning and from my perspectives, I like to always have my patients for certain muscles in certain positions. So for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, levator scap, um, rhomboids, generally uh, for traps, I will always try and have my patients in prone because then I know the angle that I'm looking for. I've needled a lot of different positions, so I can, I can easily change to side lying. Um, Obviously, you're not going to do it in, in supine. But I find that uh, when I teach or when people are learning on a course to learn um, needling supraspinatus in sideline, um, then now the angle is different because the angle is no longer in perspective to the vertical. Now the angle is in perspective to the horizontal. But to get that 45 degree in relation to the horizontal is a little bit more difficult to, to, to conceptualize. So... You can, I mean, rhomboids, you can uh, needle in side lying with the hand behind the back. Um, levator scap, if it's comfortable for the patient. The other thing is I always needle my traps in side lying because I want to be able to needle on the anterior, the posterior, or in the vertical plane, depending on my, which is the best, um, most effective direction. Yeah. Okay, then it also is dependent on the patient. You know, they're, they're coming in with pain. What is their most comfortable position to be in? Maybe they would actually be in a forward seated chair, you know, with their hands uh, on a pillow, like a forward massage chair. Okay. Okay, Thanks. cool. Thanks for that question. So, Any other questions? I can see Karine is ready. A lot of questions in the chat options. They are? Okay, let me have a look, look at the chat options. Thank you. Sorry, Karine. Um, yeah. Uh, Dear participants, kindly unmute yourself and ask questions. Yeah, consent form to your standard patient. Do you ask him to sign as you're about to needle? So from Danielle, 
Daniel, is that to me or is that to Jackie? I guess it's to me from for consent, right? Okay, so yes, uh, consent is important. You must get written consent. It's uh, recommended by the WCPT and the SASP and your dry needling special interest group. And signed written consent is important and you must actually explain to your patients what dry needling is and why you are going to be needling them. Craig, how long do you leave the needles in for and what is your indicator to remove them generally? Okay, you need, leave the needles in for a period of time like you know, how long is a length of string? But you're not going to leave your needles in for two hours, all right? And, you you know, it's pointless sticking your needle in for five seconds and taking it out as well, unless you know you're definitely in the wrong spot. But generally, I leave the needles in for two to three minutes. It also depends on how acute is the patient, how tolerant are they of needling, how many needles am I using. How many needles I'm using is also dependent on how the area is that I'm needing. If I'm going to be needling lateral pterygoid, which is through the mandibular notch, it's a very small area. I'm going to be using one needle. And I'm going to be leaving my needle in for shorter than for longer because the uh -huh. patient's going to have their mouth open with two fingers. And it's a very, very uncomfortable, stressful needling area to experience. So that's going to be a short needling time. Whereas if the patient's lying on their tummy, they're sleeping, you're needling their hamstrings, you've been fishing around a little bit, you know, you've had four or five needles going, and, and what I tend to do is I, I fish, I fish, I fish, I find I get a really good reaction, I stick another needle, I fish, I stick another, I put three needles going, I'm moving the needles around. Now when it's been 15 minutes, now I want to leave one needle in, I can leave it in for about three or four minutes just to let it do its thing while the patient is lying on their tummy, and then I'll take the needle out and and either send them on their way or send them into the gym to go and do what they need to be doing to augment the needling. Okay, Craig, can you share us experience about two points developed by cardiac problems around major sternal attachments? Well, I can't share any experience because I have absolutely zero experience of treating two points developed by cardiac problems around the pec major sternal attachments. So, but I can imagine that if, um, if your patient has had a, a mild cardiac arrest or if your patient and when I say mild I mean that they've survived uh, or your patient has cardiac arrhythmias or your patient has had a myocardial infarction or they are getting referred pain cardiac referral of pain down the arm up the neck in the chest that feeling of and I can't describe it because I've never experienced it but feeling that we know of tightness in the chest um, the overwhelming feeling of um, uh, you know, anxiety and that then I, I believe there certainly will be issues in some of the muscles where the, where the patient is feeling those, um, those symptoms. So weeks or months down the line, you, you may uh, be needing those areas. Okay, guys, it's 3.03. Uh, Karina's waited patiently. She's, um, she's ready to go ahead. Um, Karina's a friend of mine uh, from Johannesburg. She is a physio. She's an athlete. She's also a yoga instructor. And I was really, really keen to get Karine involved on this uh, econ because I wanted a different perspective in terms of rehabilitation. You know, Yash gave us an amazing presentation on the biomechanical aspects of assessing and, and managing the shoulder. And I didn't want someone to teach us on, on rehabilitating, getting the guy into the gym and doing tech deck, doing bench press, you know, doing Swiss balls and that. I wanted something a little bit more different. And with Kareen's yoga um, intuition, I asked her to present something thinking out the box in terms of practical rehabilitation. So I'm really interested to hear what Kareen has to say. So Kareen, thank you very much for accepting. And I would just like to invite you to come forward with your slides and to start. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen here. Like Craig introduced uh, me, yes, I'm a physiotherapist, an athlete, a yoga teacher. Um, I treat most of my patients are either competitive trail or very um, avid trail runners or rock climbers. So yes, I. Uh, 
I'm often challenged to, to work with shoulders. So, as with most of our rehabilitations, keep it simple and start with the basics. And then make it fun and relatable, creative, and involve the patient. Often we find our patients are well, actually quite involved with their bodies and they, they really want to get better. Um, they're often already quite educated by Dr. Google. Um, involve them in the process. It's, it's their bodies after all. So um, this is just the basic shoulder test. Um, I'm sure we've, we've discussed it also previously. Um, I did, wasn't there for the previous presentation. Um, if we just look at the quick dash and often our basic assessment is also our first treatment. So maybe my patient is not coming in and saying they struggle to open a jar, but maybe they're saying they're struggling to reach up and find a cup, you know, from the top shelf. So basically what I'm taking from this quick dash is from your subjective assessment, listen with care, make notes, they, those areas where the patient is struggling and the reason why the patient is there, that's where you're gonna start. That's where the patient has pain. Um, like I said, your basic assessment is often also already your first treatment. Um, while the patient is telling you him or her story, look at how they breathe. How are they sitting? Um, where are they holding their tension patterns in their body? What is their shirt on their body telling you about their tension patterns? Um, where are the lines of the shirt showing you where their fascia might be slightly tight? Um, I know these are all basics for us as physios, but it's often just good as a reminder. Um, these positions on the left is often where I just start, both assessing and introducing functional movement patterns. In, in a seated position, on their bellies, on their back, um, weight bearing. So it, like putting weight on, reaching across the table, um, obviously often overhead activities, um, whether it's for the rock climber or for the lady who says, I actually can't tie my hair up. And of course, as always, it's important to look at the cervical, the thoracic, the elbow and the wrist. These are the obvious ones. And then my personal bias as a yoga teacher, how do they breathe? Are they bracing? Are they holding their breath going into that painful pattern? Um, and what are their general body coordination and, and body awareness? Um, are they walking in quite slouchy? If you ask them to walk on a line, is it something that's that's just not within their awareness um, to do, but then they still try to climb um, their gold climb or you know keep up with the other oaks in CrossFit. Um, what are their general body awareness? These are all aspects that fill in the bigger picture. And what I mean by often the assessment is the first treatment is I prefer to already have my hands on them have your hand on the belly, have your hand on the back, tell their nervous system that they're safe, already start cueing breath, already start cueing gentle postural cues, um, so that from the start that you, can, that you can get them on board. So seated, we're all um, in agreement that sitting is unfortunately the new smoking. Um, we are sitting a lot. Um, but when we are assessing and, and working with our rehab within that seated position, they might complain of, you know, working on the mouse or putting the seat belt on is something that I'm sure we all have encountered. So we start there. Show me how you put your seat belt in. Is the shoulder creep up next to your ear as you're trying for that seat belt? And often, yeah, we're going for efficiency. The language that we use is important. We're going for efficiency rather than perfection. We see what their thoracic spine is doing and sitting, obviously. We ask them to, while we chat maybe and ask them questions, we go stand on the right, we go stand on the left, see what tension patterns are happening as they look left and right. What's their breath doing? Is it all, yeah, are all these accessory breathing muscles pulling on 
all these structures, putting them in an inefficient place. And from the word get-go, when they assess their seating, a seated posture and position, maybe introduce alternatives to sitting. Um, a lot of our patients, including ourselves, just, just take it for granted that I'm sitting eight hours of a day. Says who and, and why? Who made these rules that, that we have to just accept that we sit eight, ten hours of a day? Um, and already I'm going to introduce, as part of my assessment, our first movement pattern. And I invite you to join me because I know a bunch of you have already been sitting since early this morning. So as you are sitting, yes, start moving, get present in your body. Imagine there's strings pulling you nice and tall from your collarbones and the crown of your head where you can see my bola is. Effortlessly tall, now drop the shoulders away from the ears. You can have your palm in front of you and just start swinging it about in a big infinity sign, palm down, far across your body and palm up towards the ceiling, maybe in a little bit of a rotation, reach far behind you. Then palm down, reach far across your body, allow your thoracic spine to rotate and rotate out and big. Just feel how nice it is to move in your body. Remind your patient that movement is natural, that your body is very well evolved to actually move throughout the day. Let's also do the other side. So we're making a big infinity sign. Reach far across your body, get that delicious stretch in the back of your shoulder blade. Palm up, open it up big. Look over your shoulder as you reach behind you. And this is something nice that they can do at their desk wherever they are, where they assume that they should just be sitting. Another really nice one, what I just say, open and close. Your palms are facing up to the ceiling. And now as you draw your collarbones towards the screen, your thumbs reach back, you look slightly up, and you take a big breath into your belly. And as you exhale, you reach your hands far in front of you, and you push your spine through your shoulder blades, duck the chin in. Inhale into your belly, expand, open your chest up, and a long exhale, reach far forward. You're not focusing on form just yet. You are just getting in your body, enjoying how good it feels to move. Yes, and I can see already there's some intuitive other neck movements, and that's great. That's what you want from your patients, to, to enjoy moving other than just competitively when we're moving um, for the set goal. And in the eagle pose, which we'll go through later on, so it's a yoga pose, that I find very beneficial and efficient to release our posterior capsule. Here are some examples of introducing just an alternative to setting. We're on our phones all the time. And that's a very nice reminder, a, a nice cue for your patients. So they pick up their phone and they're standing around, scrolling through Instagram. Go and do that deep squat. Why not? In the beginning, it's really uncomfortable in the hips. Go on to that deep squat. You can encourage them to have the weight on the outer edges of the foot. You keep that apple tuck between your chin and your chest. Of course, these are all our normal physio postural cues and a nice upright, effortlessly tall back. And then you can add one stretch, like I'm showing here on the left, just a thoracic stretch, and you can remind them about their long exhales. These are things that they can incorporate the moment they walk out of your initial assessment. Let's start moving, because no matter what's the actual problem in the shoulder, if we introduce gentle movement, all throughout the day, we just reconnect our patient with their body. So let's start with our supine position. There's loads of tests that we can do here. Before I even assess movement, I look at their breath. Our diaphragm from all our sitting and loads of complex reasons, very few of us are reminded to use our very big muscle for breathing our diaphragm. So from the word get-go, when we assess, start cueing it. Place a yoga block or a book on their belly. Ask them to close their mouth. 
and just ask them to breathe. Pay attention to their breath and you'll see the moment they think they should breathe, they start tensing up and that starts telling you already about the movement pattern. We breathe all the time. So every inhale, every exhale, if we add tension into the system, um, no matter how beautiful we construct our rehab protocols, if we have this inefficiency that's so subtle but constantly there of inefficient breathing, then we might, you know, be working much harder than, than, than what we need to. So this is a, I know this is a very familiar uh, uh, rehab protocol that we use for our shoulders. Um, I'll play the video. Just become aware of your breath. And then slowly encourage the breath to be a little bit more diaphragmatic. So inhale, inflate a big balloon in your belly. And an exhale, deflate. So inhale, inflate a big balloon in your belly. And an exhale, deflate. Continue with deep, comfortable breaths and match your movement intuitively to your breath, what feels most comfortable. And you know, sweep your hands on the floor, up over your head, and then in the exhale, sweep the hands back down to your hips. Now, as you move, you gently more and more squeeze the thumb and index finger into the floor. And you can make your exhales a little bit stronger with slightly more on the floor and lower after the your activation. Inhale, sweep, sit up. Exhale, squeeze small, but flat. 5% contraction of the pelvic floor as you sweep your hands towards your hips. The movement should become more comfortable and also as the range become more comfortable. You can make the movement a bit more active, squeezing harder and harder with your thumb and index finger into the floor. Make sure your face and neck is really relaxed. Just to diaphragm the muscles around your short legs doing the work. You can remove the block from your belly and turn around onto the side. Make sure you're comfortable. You can place the left on the other underneath your head. And then we now reach the top hand far forward, getting that comfortable stretch behind your shoulder blade. And then your exhale, sweep the hand over your head, staying quite back on the floor. Do swap your chest towards the ceiling. In our walnut circle over your head for your hands to match. So these are links that I also share with my patients but they're also often part of my first assessment. How tense is the patient moving through? Often these are patients that, that's already quite competitive in their sport, but they can't do this very basic full range. So whatever the diagnosis, we always aim to restore function. So this is a nice supine, both assessment and exercise. It's something that I often invite my patients to do first thing in the morning. So not necessarily this full hour of rehab. As you wake up in the morning, your breaths are often already diaphragmatic. And this is a very nice way to invite mobility into your body and hopefully set the tone for your day. This is prone, again, a very, a very familiar move and position for us as physios. But so often, and which is why I've started to make videos also, is even the online videos on YouTube so seldomly cue breath. And we all breathe all the time, often really inefficiently, not using this big diaphragm, diaphragm um, that's our biggest breathing muscle. Obviously, this um, is a good position to start activating um, all our scapula stabilizers and mobilizers. And this video is the very base, the very first, 
and then you can make it functional for your patient but we'll talk a bit more after the video and as you exhale, gently pull your belly button away from the mat, tilting your sit bones towards your knees. And inhale, melt your belly onto the mat, pointing your sit bones slightly up towards the ceiling. And then exhale, pull your belly button away from the mat, pointing your sit bones towards your heads. Settle into comfortable, deep, slow, and long breaths. And then bring your hands out into that cactus shape. You can point your thumbs up to the ceiling. Stay with your comfortable expansive breaths. And on an exhale, as you point your sit down to your ears, you just lift, hinging at the level of your bra. Just lift, keep that chin tight as if you keep an apple between your chin and your chest. Stay with your breath and slowly make the movement better and bigger. You keep on squeezing your armpits towards your hips and your ears reach far away from your shoulders. So this movement again, it's a very familiar move. We all know the Superman's um, what I want to drive home here is the breath cues, the core cues, um, slight pelvic floor activation or contribution to the core. Um, these are the ones that we often just forget as physios um, to, to make part of our REAP protocol. Um, to make this functional for the patient, um, of course, if it's an already strong patient, you can add an elastic band for that slight resistance. Um, have your hands on the patient to give that proprioceptive input around the shoulder blades to make sure the shoulder blades are being squeezed towards the back pocket and the ears are far away from the shoulders. And if you have a strong patient with a small baby, make it fun, make it relatable to the patient. Let the, ba the patient lift its baby in this position or if it's a patient loving its beer, tell them before they drink their beer to have a glass in each hand doing it with that. Um, I'm, I'm just using really our examples here. Um, but make these simple things, these simple exercises, functional for your patient to give them the reminder all throughout the days in daily life to sneak an exercise into their daily life. When they play with their baby on the floor, do this. When they play with their kids on the floor, that's your reminder. Let me do a few supermans or a few cactus arms lifts. Weight bearing. Um, of course, there's so many variations. We can be so creative with this. I always start simply um, with good breathing, good postural awareness, and then you can fill, fill the, 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 the picture in, color it in for your patient. Ask your patient to come back with exciting exercises of what they've added. Um, if it's a little bit of a game, they often you know, step up to the challenge and come back with a kid sitting on their back or whatever. So yes, these are the very basic ones. Um, I'm taking you through a very short yoga you sequence. Your Make sure your hands are right underneath your shoulders. Make it a little wider depending on comfort for your body. Look at your fingers. Spread them really wide. Get the distance between your fingers wide. Now gently grip the floor with your fingertips. Make sure your inner elbows are facing the front of the mat. And now again keep that upper between your chin and your chest. Make sure your knees are more or less below your hips. And as always, we settle into our breath, this time with some easy cat cow positions. And if I can interject, yeah, I invite you to, to move along. As physios, if we understand the movement in our own body, we can communicate this so much better to our patients. And I know all of us have been sitting for quite a bit. So join in on the cat and cow. <laughs> 
familiar for you I realize um, and I just wanted to to again drive that message home of making sure that the fundamentals of good efficient movement is established for your patients and then make it fun then tell them to crawl around once they've engaged their scapulas then tell them to make a fun game with a pet freak their pets around in their house crawl around and um, patients surprisingly like it they feel a little bit silly but you're just crawling around but it's important to first establish these pelvic or the lower um, the lumbar spine awareness as well as the scapula awareness and then this one here is quite a nice um shoulder mobility as always you sit up for your strong black fingers are spread wide gently go to that inner others face the front Shoulders far away from the ears and lower abdominals active. Gently tucking the tail towards the heels. Bend into the knees, but will shift back, getting that delicious stretch across the lateral side of the body here, underneath your armpit, and move with your breath as you shift your right forward into the back. Inhale, shift your right back, exhale, shift your right forward. Create some heat, move with control. And feel your shoulder blades moving through their full range with comfort and control. Okay. Again, I want to drive the, the message home of the words that you use, the language that we use as physios. It's important. Um, 
and see what resonates, what language resonates with your patient as you are communicating this movement to your patient. Um, this video here is a side plank. It's all familiar. I've just included it. And um, obviously you can see it's from the pre-ab guys. Um, it's just a strong side plank variation um, to bear weight with control through out the whole shoulder joint. Again, once you've established these very basics, um, then you make it fun. Then you tell them to do it with a kid, with an elastic band, with a partner. Now we come to overhead activity. So yes, often these are some of our most uh, popular positions to, to cause pain. For our overhead activity, the standing posture and the scapular humeral rhythm is like this is where we often assess it and also pick it up. The patient shows, oh, I can't lift my arm up or I can lift my arm up early this much. Um, so then and there, as you're assessing, you get the patient to focus on her breath or his breath. Start with some gentle movements, not into pain. Keep the armpits down. And you can see here at the bottom right corner, this is one of my favorite positions to cue that um, slightly more efficient scapular humeral rhythm. It's an elastic band tight at the top. I enjoy using a pull up bar for that, but you know, like a, a rail in your room or, or wherever in the gym, just to cue that shoulder blade or that armpit being squeezed to the floor and the ears are being cued up to lift towards the sky. And then from this position, you can see then you can do all your normal Sharapovas, washing the window, external rotations, whatever it is that after your assessment, you find um, that's the, the, the problem area. But this bottom right one is one of my ultimate favorites because of the, the seatbelt position or, you know, often this, this external rotation where it impinges to then set them up with an elastic band and with a softer elastic band, just cue. Let's move gently in that direction. Let's move and teach your body how to move in this range without pain. With the breath cues, with the postural cues, spend time with your patient, have your hands on her belly, on his belly, keep on cueing, relaxing the face and the shoulder. Um, yeah, so these are the ones. You can see the top ones um, are specifically for uh, climbers or all our overhead um, sportsmen, so the, the CrossFit Oaks. Even our patients who doesn't climb or doesn't do CrossFit, climbing or hanging from things is a very normal, functional movement for humans. So it's, it's good to introduce it. You can see here on the left, I'm just a bag of bones hanging deadly. All oh, the stress is just on um, my, my joint capsule and ligaments. And yes, it's not wrong, but your body might take quite a bit of strain here. And eventually there's going to be pain and impingement. It's still an active movement. My feet are off the ground, yeah? To just to lift those ears far away from the shoulders and squeeze the armpits to the floor. So it's the same scapular cues of what we did in weight bearing on all fours. It's just those same scapular cues for hanging, a different kind of weight bearing. Um, so it's basically small straight arm pull ups, like same what we did the straight arm push ups, straight arm pull-ups and patients remember it because we've already established the straight arm push-ups so now it's just the straight arm pull-ups breath cues core cues spend time even if the whole session for today is just on establishing an efficient movement pattern here understand let the patient understand that not one thing is wrong or right but with time if we move efficiently that we're going to be better sportsmen so this video, and also often a, post, a tight posterior capture will be the reason why there's impingement there. Um, so this following video, I again invite you to follow along. Um, it's relevant for all our desk bound humans. Um, a very nice cervical and posterior capsule stretch. You can place your left hand behind your back, maybe tuck it in your pants 
or maybe grab your thigh or just grab that other of your right arm. Now squeeze this left arm towards the floor as you tilt the left heel up to the ceiling. Yeah, you're just rolling that head around, gently squeezing that arm but down. Keep on rolling the ear forward and backward until you find your line of tension. Now you take your right hand, pin the skin of in the front ear of your left shoulder, just pin it down, put it slightly down towards your belly button, and then get back to those gentle rolls. Getting all the layers of your fascia and muscles in your neural tissue gliding gently over each other in this position. You're going to repeat on the other side, right hand behind, right shoulder, squeezing down towards the floor, and not tilt that right ear up to the ceiling. Your left hand grips the skin in the front ear of that right shoulder, just pin it down and pull it down towards the belly button. Tilt that right ear up to the ceiling, and again gently roll it around, finding your line of tension. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so it's the same on the other side. Pulling you up to the ceiling and then on your exhale, keep a gentle chin tuck as if you're just holding a big apple between your chin and your chest. Your fingers and maybe join your index and your middle finger and go part around in your neck. Go find your skull, the base of your skull, and see if you want to dig your fingers underneath the base of your skull. Now squeeze it up and down towards the floor. Dig your fingers in those tender areas, and when you find it in this spot, you just hold it there. And then you hinge at that level. Roll your neck upwards and tuck the chin down. So I see I've actually posted the, the cervical mobility. This is all familiar for you guys as well. Um, the, the video that I intended to post there that I'll invite you to move with me now is the eagle pose in yoga. So exactly as you are, wrap your left elbow underneath your right. And then see if you can clasp your hands together. And now bring those elbows in front of your nose and squeeze your armpits down towards the floor. Now take your hands far away from your head. Keep that chin gently tucked towards the chest. Keep those armpits towards the floor. Now bring your attention back to nasal breaths, expanding into your belly. As you inhale, you slide your forearms up on a wall that's in front of you. And as you exhale, you squeeze your armpits to the floor, sliding the elbows down. You keep on pushing your face far away from your forearms, sliding your forearms up this imaginary wall and down this imaginary wall. Feel how this release gently, that posterior capsule. It's quite a deep stretch. So obviously prescribe this exercise with caution. But it, I find it very efficient to release this posterior capsule. And obviously, as I'm chatting, you can also do the same on the other side. So this is the eagle, eagle pose in yoga that I find very efficient to release the posterior capsule with those postural and breath cues. So here we go to fun variations to add to the basics. And like I said, it's, it's important to get that postural and that breath cues really right first. Otherwise the patient just cheat its way through and often exercises are actually, you know, making the pain worse. But once you've established some good functional movement patterns for your patient, then you can make it a little bit fun. And again, I invite you to join from the neck, within the neural pathways, between different fascial layers, 
And we are just gliding and sliding all these different layers over each other. So it's always going to a comfortably tall posture. Heels underneath my hips, tailbone gently tucked in, chin gently tucked towards my chest, effortlessly tall, shoulders and ears far away from each other. Bring your attention to your breath. In our through nose, expansive inner. And on the exhale, 5% contraction of the thumb through deflating. And inhale, inflate. And on the exhale, deflate. And bring your left palm in front of your face. Just look at that left palm. You're going to balance something on that left palm. And this side of the object that you're balancing keeps on facing the ceiling no matter where you are moving it. And you know, reach that left hand far forward, getting a good stretch behind your left shoulder. As you exhale, take it far out towards the left, bend the elbow. As you reach over your head, getting a good side body stretch here, it crosses your nose, it still face up to the ceiling, and you reach far behind your back as you reach underneath your armpit forward. In and out to the side, exhale over your head, cross your nose, far behind your back, underneath your armpit. The following mobility exercise stand your upper body through. Sorry, I guess I just want to get it out of there. All its different layers, all the I don't know how to go out of this full screen. Let's see if that worked. Yes. So you'll see. I'll show you another video of the same, the same pattern, and use your clinical brain to just see in your mind's eye all the layers that's gliding over each other. We're taking our shoulder joint through quite a complex range of motions there. Why I find this helps with patients is because it, it engages the brain a little bit. It makes it a little bit fun. So you can balance something on, um, you're thinking three-dimensionally, so a few different parts of your brain lights up to be involved with this exercise. Um, let's go to the next screen. And here I've used a hammer. And I find a hammer specifically... Um, for our wrists, you know, because there's heavier weights on the one side, um, you just have that eccentric, um, the potential of making it an eccentric exercise as well um, to, for certain muscles to lengthen against uh, gravity. And guys just love training with a hammer. Like they feel like Thor. So <laughs> it's like quite a fun one. So let's see the same 3D figure of eight with a hammer. You can also use a functional object around your house to add a little bit of weight and eccentric load. Um, if you use a hammer or a pan, just make the handle a little bit bigger or smaller to match the need of your sport specifically. Start off with your elbow in, at your side, 90 degree, bend that elbow. And now on that inner, reach the hammer first down towards the floor. Then far forward. Exhale out to the side. And now as you inhale, reach over your head, cross your arm, nose, far behind your back, underneath your armpit, forward. Far to the side. Big over your head, cross your nose, behind your back, and forward. Stay with expansive breaths. Move with control, finding that balance between mobility and strength. And then we're almost done. I see uh, we're running out of time almost. Um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with your Sharapovas, your external rotations, your wall slides. So use whatever you are using. And once that movement is really established, Again, make the exercise fun for your patient. And let's go. Before we get back to the challenge of the shoulders, find your comfort on this unstable base of the ball. 
Open your body is soft. You allow your body to move with the ball. Don't overthink it. Find a spot on the floor to help you with your balance. Now you wrap the elastic band around your arms so you don't have to grip it. There's a little bit of resistance. Um, shoulder width apart from with your hands. Otherwise, bend up your sides, 90 degrees, arms um, facing each other. Keep a gentle chin intact, as if you're dangling effortlessly from a string from the crown of your head. So bring the elbows in front of your shoulders. Find your balance. Gently squeeze your arms towards your floor. The right hand is going to stay perfectly still as you move through your shoulder pelvis with your left hand. Small movements, washing the window up and washing the window down. This right hand is staying exactly still. I'm with the left hand. I'm exploring now full ranges with my shoulder. I'm allowing my body to move comfortably with the wall. This right shoulder is working really hard, keeping perfectly still as the left one is washing the window, exploring movement in all directions. Repeat on the other side. Before so obviously this one with the ball and balancing on the ball, um, you'll first just introduce the ball, balancing on the ball. And um, again, it engage patients, it engage them that it's like a fun, um, small challenge. If you have two um, people in a house together, let them challenge their kids. See so you can stay on the ball the longest. Um, ultimately, yes, make it fun. And then you introduce an the, an exercise that I've already mastered with good form, you introduce that exercise then to, um, with this unstable base balancing on the ball. Um, I've got two more sequences. Um, I don't know exactly, Craig, do I have until four o'clock or to, to quarter two? Um, you have until five o'clock, including questions. Oh, okay. so you have another 12 minutes and you can either uh, continue with your presentation or you can stop and you can take some questions and discussions. Okay, so, so these, both these poses are, or sequences, um, and refer back to them, do them in your own body as well. Um, the, the message that I want to drive home here is that even if we look at our shoulder, mobility and function our shoulders doesn't function like completely you know on its own without the rest of our body right <laughs> so if we have that hip restrictions if we have thoracic restrictions they, they it will add up and even if we do have a labrum tear in our shoulder um it's just making a structure that's already struggling to heal, put more tension on that. So again, like we did with the ball, take your normal yoga, or your normal um, shoulder rehab, and then add complexity to it by adding mobility to the hips or uh, adding um, complexity to the movement of the rest of the body. So the one, your first one is actually a hip mobility exercise. Um, but patients really enjoy this. So we are in deer pose. 90 degrees in my right knee, 90 degrees on my left knee. You know, the hands reach up to the ceiling. And yes, make this movement soft. You just shift your weight side to side. Your hands for now just holding balance. You shift your weight side to side. If this is really hard, you may also have your hands just behind you. If your hands are in the air, as you shift your leg over towards your right feet, leave your right arm and reach your hands over towards the left. Inhale, knees to ceiling. Exhale, knees towards your left. Big and lift the left arm. Reach your hands over towards the right. Feel that expansion over your left side body. Inhale, knees to ceiling. Exhale, knees to right. Big and lift the right arm. Reach with the hands over towards the left. One more time on the other side. Knee underneath the left armpit. 
reach your hands over to the right. Place your hands in front of your left shin and keep that right leg back. So yes, we are pigeon on the other side. So there we just go into the, the hip work again. Um, this is quite a three-dimensional move and requires a little bit of, of coordination. Again, I find patients enjoy this move. So even instead of just the normal side body stretch or the, you know, this lat stretch or posterior capsule stretch, add the complexity of our fascia system and how we move, add that into it, add that hip mobility. Um, because we, we function as one whole human. And then this one here at the bottom, it's quite a long one. Um, this one I call the world's best stretch. It's whether I'm getting an ankle, a hip or a shoulder patient, often I also use this as an assessment tool to take them through this simple movement sequence. Um, it, it tells me a lot about their coordination. I'm moving the thoracic spine and moving their hips. Um, I can add and take away exercises once the sequence is established. As always, first, bring your attention to your breath. I'll just put the settings to play a little bit faster because it's quite a long one. So I'm going to speak super fast, but you guys can get the idea of, of the movement. So basically, it's just the same on the other side. So to finish our presentation off today, it's good to remember both as a physio and also to remind our patients that they're in their body all the time. <laughs> and how we move throughout the day is as important as how we move within our rehab session and when we do our sport. 
um, movement, breath, to pay atten the ability to pay attention to our thoughts. These are all part of Riyadh. And then another, another really nice hack that I find works really well to get patients to do, to really change their habits, to, to affect their movement patterns. Whenever they do something in the day, and let's use the seat belt again as an example. If they take that seat belt and, oh yeah, they still feel that shoulder, that pain is a reminder. Um, you can give them three cues. You can WhatsApp into them so that they can then and there open their WhatsApp and see, oh, these are the three cues. So whatever the three cues for your patient is, maybe it is to be effortlessly tall, maybe it is to tuck the chin, maybe it is to squeeze the armpit towards the floor. Three cues. Um, to, to see if they can make that movement a bit more efficient so that they eventually won't have pain with that, for example, SIPA position. Um, and then also, when they feel that pain, give them three exercises that they can choose from to alternate, to not do the same one every time. So you also tell them, once you've had the pain, you got in your car and you got that pain, you get your cues to move more efficiently, and then and there, stop at the traffic light do one of these three exercises. By giving them three to choose from, you're also allowing them to become their own therapist, to understand which exercise is the most appropriate. If I do my eagle, does it relieve the pain? Okay, not today, it doesn't relieve. If I do my scapula push-ups, does that relieve the pain? Oh yeah, that actually feels much better. Or if I release my neck, oh wow, there's my shoulder pain gone. Obviously, this is patient specific, um, but this cue of three cues and three exercises, our brains work like that. We remember things in threes. Um, just remind the patient um, to do the exercises then and there and all throughout the day to influence their movement habits. And then, of course, this is obvious, but get the patient on board. Understand, truly understand this patient's life. The patient's challenges, what motivates this patient, what is this patient's needs? Because that's when you, once you've understand that, you're going to be able to influence the patient's habits. And then I've got one last fun challenge. Um, this is for our strong patients, um, but it's a nice challenge to keep things fun for our patients. And I can definitely, if you've got teenage boys, um, get them to, to do this as a nice lockdown challenge as well. with that table challenge i will greet you guys today <laughs> um, i hope you got some fun ideas to keep rehab exercises fun for your patients but also real to their life um, does anyone have any questions you can unmute yourself and just pass it away thank you so much <clears throat> yeah so Karine, if you could stop your slide sharing we can get the gallery view on okay. thank you yeah, I got some lot of lot of question in the chat options. Okay, I see Green Peters. Yes, um, I mean obviously this is a challenge for our patients who really, I mean, and this is why it's important to understand our patients' need. It's not for me to understand or to to decide what is a worthwhile goal for someone. So if that's their mental health, to bench press hectic things, then ask them, what's your goal? Like, what is something that you really want to do? So if it is their, like some arb weight to press until infinity, like I said, it's not for me to understand why that's their goal, but to use that then as an incentive to be like, okay, if you want to do this, if you follow my advice for two weeks, commit for two weeks, 
And every time you feel that niggle, do your scapular stability exercises. So that when you go into the gym with your buddies, that you, that you can bench press what you want. Um, another thing for those oaks are to also influence their habits to make them understand that whole thing of that they're in their bodies all the time. For them to be able to bench press the, or whatever they want to do in the gym, that their movement patterns all throughout the day should help build towards that. If they're going to sit for eight hours, 10 hours in their big corporate job, then, then maybe that, that doesn't match up, that doesn't enable them to reach their own goal. Um, so, so yeah, that's where it comes into really understand the patient and to have like small little lacks, like every time you drink water, at least do the ego. Um, every time, oh, I don't know, find out what, what works for them. It's so nice in lockdown because people are working from home. So I find people are actually doing their scapula exercises. But specifically the push-up, the straight arm push-up one with a kid sitting on their back, that's when I find it's quite fun. If they've got a kid sitting on their back or their girlfriend, let them post it on Instagram. They love that type of thing. <laughs> Any other questions? Dear participants, kindly unmute yourself and ask question. Karen Ma'am is waiting for your questions. Anyone? Well, Kareen, your timing is absolutely spot on. Your presentation and your questions have taken us to 4.01 p.m. South African time which is absolutely perfect. Thank you very much. Um, if any of you are curious, being physios, and you would at some stage like to incorporate yoga into your training, or you'd like to understand more about uh, what yoga uh, athletes go through, Kareen teaches a yoga for therapists course. She's in the middle of doing it at the moment. She's taught level two. Wednesday, Friday this week, and she's teaching her module. Kareen, thank you very much. Great, for thanks your, everyone. For your presentation, for your insights, for your knowledge, for your enthusiasm. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so we're um, at that part of the day where we have one last to go. So, would you like to introduce Pilsen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, K. Pulsen, sir, is one of my favorite. He has been my teacher, so I know about him since more than 10 years. He completed his uh, post-graduation from University of South Australia in year 2000, and he's the person who has been uh, uh, who has been getting trained under David Butler, also one of the known personalities across the globe. Sir has uh, extensive uh, teaching experience in the manual therapy uh, and uh, uh, like he is a uh, manual therapist at Padmasri Diagnostics in Bangalore. He is a professor, senior professor in Padmasri College of Physiotherapy in Bangalore and he is a, a member of, uh, he's a founder member of uh, Indian Address, International Federation of Manual Therapists. Apart from that, he is a member of International Myopan Society and International allied health professions also. So with all his great credentials, uh, I welcome Dr. Person. Yeah, sir is here. Thank you so much. It's very good to see you after, after two, three years, I believe. Sir, yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, it is coming, sir, yes. Kindly yeah. full screen. Yeah. Thank you, Club uh, Physio, Dr. Greg Smith and uh, Sauro, uh, for having me over here with uh, all of you guys uh, who have been talking through the morning with, uh, you know, shoulder. So mostly, you know, my topic is on comprehensive manual therapy for subarachnoid impingement. Okay. So is that uh, voice is audible? Is that fine? It's fine? Yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah, when you say, yeah, good. Uh, when you say subacromial impingement, you know, 
uh, it takes around uh, more than 50 percentage of the shoulder pain. And as we all know that uh, shoulder pain has been the second most common in the musculoskeletal after low back pain. So definitely, you know, the uh, subacromial impingement plays a major role. And uh, I, I've been uh, putting across uh, my thought and uh, you know a few other evidences to talk about uh, like how manual therapy or how mobilization will help uh, for subacromial impingement. Definitely, you know, all the guys would have been taught. Uh, talked about the uh, various aspects in which uh, we do mobilization or exercises and uh, Karen was uh, talking about the uh, rehab part you know all this uh, plays a major role and there is a role for you know the mobilization also so as we look in you know subacromial impingement we know that we have a clinical prediction rule for the same saying that you know the positive Hawkins test or positive painful lock test or uh, external rotation limitation, or even you know if you have any kind of uh, uh, pain or weakness while doing these activities or the movement over there. So whenever we do this test and we confirm that oh these guys have a you know, subacromial impingement, but we we also know that like when you talk about uh, subacromial impingement, there are various reasons for that. Okay, so already like you know we we have been talking through with the eagle stretch, which we can add for the posterior capsule tightness, which could lead into the abnormal anterior superior translation of the humeral head, and the rotator cuff weakness. Yes, of course, rotator cuff weakness that we need to do a lot of exercises, a strengthening. And then chronic inflammation of the rotator cuff. That's why you know the NSAIDs helps and rotator cuff degenerated tendinopathy also one of the reasons or the causes for the subacromial impingement syndrome. And secondly, impingement or you know the various other various factors which might lead us into the surgical intervention, like you would have come across with hooked acromion or different shapes of acromion acromioplasty we have to do or subacromial decompression surgeries which has been done due to the acromial spurs or even like you know, as a physiotherapist or as Karen was talking about the postural dysfunction can be our postural treatment which also can be given for any kind of subacromial impingement. So as you look in here I just want to Reconfirm saying that, like you know, the posterior capsule tightness. So when you say posterior capsule tightness, which could be you know various factors like uh, infraspinatus or posterior capsule itself, or or like you know, is that uh, helpful with the help of uh, guide needling? Yes, of course. You know, all this uh, all these therapies can help us to uh, do the things better, or in a sense, you know, which will help us to overcome the uh, tightness in this region. And when I say like, you know, overhead, that's what uh, the most of the activities like, you know, which we tend to do in the uh, subacromal impingement syndrome. So when you do this uh, movement of uh, uh, abduction with the external rotation, you could see here like, you know, it can cause the impingement. So that's why like when you have these various factors. So as I repeat again, you know, the rotator cuff becomes impinged on the rim of the of this arm in when you do the abduction and the external rotation. So that's the reason why we talk about scapular dyskinesis and various other muscle factors or the extrinsic factors, you know, which could be causing or leading into this. And I'm not here to talk about the various reasons for that, but I'm here to, you know, convey you saying that like, you know, what are the other possible uh, thing which we can explore or which we have to look around, you know, when we talk about subacromial impingement. And again, the excessive external rotation or the capsular instability, that's what, you know, uh, Jackie was talking about the taping, which could be useful when you have a instability factor where you can do the taping, which can be trying to help the patient, you know, in order to come down this inflammation and then keep moving into the better stage of you know exercises which also could be useful for our uh, treatment or the protocol of you know rehab techniques and we see most of the people like you know they have a abnormal scapular thoracic kinematics that's why where we have mobilization can be helpful and as well as you know you can have a instability factor so when you have instability factor we are not going to do a, a mobilization part uh, when you have a 
kind of you know involvement with the scapulothoracic joint yes of course you know we will be doing the mobilization part so that's why that we have to be choosy enough to find that where we lie down or where we uh, really need to draw a line like you know where we can pitch in to do that mobilization yes of course we maybe speakers would have talked about this clinical reasoning so i need to reinforce this because the clinical reasoning is a thought process associated with the therapist and the patient for a better outcome so if i if i want to choose that you know who might need to choose for mobilization particularly in in a group of uh, subacromial impingement that's what what we need to see so that's what the process in which we are going to go through today and as we look in okay definition of the same like in you know, a complex multifaceted cognitive process used by practitioners to plan direct perform and reflect on intervention so this guys like you know Fleming or Mark Jones uh, have been talking through this uh, uh, clinical reasoning from the 1990 to till date to give us a big impact about you know the usage of clinical decision making so definitely like you know that what the technique we do we will be talking through with you know clinical reasoning or the reasoning process here and when you take any stiff or any shoulder you know you can have any of this presentation uh, again you know many of the speakers would have talked about it but it's a kind of a, a kind of a look a kind of a way in which uh, you know i go through like you know when a patient step into you or is he having a weak uh, shoulder or is there a stiff shoulder because impingement also you know we get into people with a stiff shoulder we are probably when they come in they will have a restriction of uh, a range of motion or if it is unstable or is that the nervy one or is that the vascular referred or systemic so you know various thought process so that's what uh, as we all we all look in the working hypothesis which we need to make you know in order to step in further into our treatment so mainly the treatment depends upon the technical proficiency or like you know what we do the communication skill or like you know how you get the information from the patient and the knowledge base what we have or the, the theoretical or the the practical knowledge which we get exposed so that's what you know what we say as a component of the clinical reasoning so clinical reasoning or uh, the clinical decision making will not depend upon only the you know researchers so that's what many of the techniques you know when you look in in the research we might not say that like you know it is uh, not effective statistically but clinically we have a lot of uh, you know uh, appreciation from the patient saying that okay it gives a lot of benefit uh, that's what the clinical expertise and the experience and the patient's perspective and this evidence from the researchers all put together will give you a good package of you know getting better treatment that's what again you know clinical decision making which we talk about all right so getting back to the subacromial impingement and what we are going to do or how we are or what we expect from our mobilization so my terms in term of doing this mobilization here is for two factors one is for reducing pain and another one is disability in patients with shoulder impingement that's what you know Karen was talking about various exercises which could be helpful in in order to get better. And when you look back at the evidence basis, also you know it tells you that okay, we have a lot of exercises or specific exercises for subacromial impingement. But my kind of request is you add the exercises, the specific exercises along with the mobilization, it will get you better or it will help you to do better with the treatment protocol. Yes. so what we do you know before we go for the treatment when we talk about the focus is on like you know you are going to assess the cervical range of motion because there might be any kind of involvement of the cervical region and a yeah, spring test or uh, uh, pavums or just accessory movements from c7 to t9 so you know we don't have very specific level in terms for thoracic region and the shoulder but you know you have a specific level for our uh, cervical and uh, as well as with the Uh, thoracic region so where we talk about with you know t3 to t5 which can be which can be tight or which can be stiff which has to be mobilized for a cervical involvement but uh, you know we don't have a very a specific kind of levels for the thoracic region so that's the reason why we really need to find out you know uh, from c7 to t9 all the regions through 
and poster of course you know we talk about the posters we have to find out the supraspinatus or intraspinatus muscle weakness or is that you know it's going to have any kind of a muscle wasting or the position of the shoulder all this uh, tell us about you know muscle length test and to find out our stretch or do we need to go for you know muscle energy technique or do we need to go for a dry needling and all this uh, stuff has to be uh, used in order to know that like you know what kind of uh, muscles and what kind of uh, structures are involved so posterior evaluation has to be done and then you have to talk about like you know Le excessive like you know or kyphosis or reduced kyphosis this is very important so when you have more excessive kyphosis i will not be able to do shoulder flexion so as we all know so when i'm when i do more amount of you know the neutral position my shoulder flexion will be better so that's a main thing which we need to look in like you know or uh, uh, why we talk about the uh, uh, thoracic spine mobilization or why we need to look into the thoracic spine position and uh, of course we need to talk about like you know the levels in which what we say like you know, upper thoracic or the mid thoracic or your lower thoracic where we need to look in like you know where they have a stiffness and we really need to find as i told you c7 to t9 level which we need to find the uh, stiffness or if they have any kind of you know involvement of uh, kind of relative flexibility or relative stiffness depending upon the muscle and as well as the joint involvement and then our scapular positions many of us would have talked about it so that is also a thought in which you know we need to uh, identify in the post evaluation so scapular protractor or retractor or is that going to change the position of the you know length of the muscle there yeah and then we have the glenohumeral that is the shoulder joint and as well as the scapular movements which has to be assessed so we we need to look in the the kind of tightness or we need to look in the kind of you know uh, mobility factor which we always talk through with the the joint corresponding joint so you got to check with the cervical region you got to check with the thoracic mobility and you got to check with the posture and you got to check with the glenohumeral and the scapular you know movements also so once we look in like and you, know, you can see here this animated video which talks about like when you do abduction movement so this is where, like you know that you have a very good uh, rotator cuff muscles so when you have a rotator cuff muscles are good and now you you will have a good movement which comes up and which will not be hinging or which will not be causing or which will not be compressing the subacromial space so that's the one thing which you know which we need to look at so i i sometimes you know pretty sometimes when you have a subacromial bursitis is very 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 acute to be do a, a taping in order to get these things done better like you know getting the location of the acromial process so that the open space and it can help for uh, reducing the pain relatively for a shorter period of time and then you can see here like you know what happens with our abduction and the internal rotation here so we do internal rotation movement so when you do internal rotation movement like you know, this is the one which is going to cause the compression so if you have any of the factor like you know whether you talk in terms of the force couple or you talk in terms of the uh, muscle weakness or rotator cuff tendinopathy it's going to cause the compression over there and yes what else we do in the examination part we like to identify that you know there are various structures or various other elements which could be causing the pain in the shoulder so a uh, very good thing about the clinical pattern which we see is you know how we differentiate mostly with the frozen shoulder and the uh, saas is uh, the test which we talked about and as well as the pain pattern like you know uh, saas which will be around the shoulder and they will they will not be able to go specific particularly to the you know the coracoid process or deltoid tuberosity so when you have a pain of the coracoid process or deltoid tuberosity which could cause in shoulder so this is the one day i look in and you know how to uh, demark like a clinical pattern like in you know, a pattern recognition that's what we say as a, a forward reason so these are the structures which we need to palpate like the acromion the ac joint 
the greater tuberosity, the lesser tuberosity, the bicepital goo and the crocoid process. Because we want to you know, get closer in the terms of like, you know, how to find out what kind of structures we are going to identify. Okay, so you can see here, I, st I would start from the sternoclavicular joint and then keep going to find out about the, uh, the acromioclavicular joint and then identify the coracoid process and then keep moving towards uh, the biceptal group. So that's what, what we see here, like you know, which we try to identify from the sternoclavicular joint to the clavicle and then we come down to the coracoid process and then identify the intertubercle sulcus and then we have the lesser and that greater tuberosity. So these are like, you know, kind of a cues or kind of uh, uh, ideas in which where we can try to identify the structures. And that's what when we start with, like, you know, you have a, a sternoclavicular joint palpation to start with. Maybe you use a two finger or three finger to palpate the, the same. And then, you know, you come across the clavicle and then you try to palpate the uh, AC joint and then you have to do the palpation of the coracoid process. And once you have done that coracoid process, from that, you know, we come laterally, we will be able to palpate the uh, greater tuberosity. So greater tuberosity will be able to palpate easily when you go away from the intertubercular sulcus or like on the medially, like, you know, that you have all this uh, kind of, you know, the lesser tuberosity also. So when I want to, recall like you know, what are the kind of things which we talked about or what are the structures which we talked about in the palpation part is like you know you start from the stenoclavicular joint and then go to the AC joint and then the coracoid process then the intertubercular sulcus then the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity okay so that's what, what we have in the examination part so we have the examination of the cervical region we have the examination of the posture we have the examination of the uh, position of the thoracic region. Then we have the glenohumeral joint and the scapula. So these all the information, uh, you know, which is going to give us a working hypothesis, like you know, how we are going to go forward. So let us look back here with yeah, what we are trying to do. So as I look at, there are two factors which we talk about, you know, mobilization here. So one is the pain. So any all grades of this mobilization may result in the pain reduction. So you know any kind of mobilization grades can be helpful in order to reduce that pain. So which can be helpful in terms of you know giving you a good impact of the person to do the exercises quite freely. And then you know as we as we are familiar, we are all are hours available with this you know knowledge about the glides, different glides. And you have the AP glide, and this PA glide is uh, one you know which we use for in order to reduce this uh, the posterior capsule type place or those who have you know any kind of limitation of the shoulder flexion. So shoulder flexion can be limited, where you will be able to find the you know people having the capsule tightness or where you do the normal you know capsule stretch. So that you do this mobilization, the PA glide which we, we say as a butterfly technique, which you put them in a, a supine lying and then you keep your thumb on the head of humor, the posterior aspect of the head of humerus, and then the fingers on the anterior aspect, and then you do this PA glide. So apart from PA glide, you know, you do have an inferior glide because, you know, you need to stretch the structure surrounding the joint, like, you know, we have this, uh, the posterior capsules or the inferior capsules, which has to be stretched. So we try to find out, you know, what kind of glides or what kind of movements which can be uh, beneficial for the person. So we have the AP glide or we have the PA glide or the inferior glide and as well as the lateral glide. So this is how I choose. I, I don't go with like, a, let me go for a PA for this condition or AP for this condition. I try to find out, justify that, you know, what kind of uh, glide or what kind of movement which is causing or hindering or which is causing the limitation. Then let us try to work on it. And then basically, you know, you can try to increase the range of motion of the abduction and the functional movement, which can be, which can be, you know, taken care of him here. 
So that's what uh, what we look here with the you know terms of the pain. So when you talk about the pain, like if someone who doesn't allow you to touch the shoulder because they have a lot of acute presentation, I would uh, like to go for this lateral glide, and um, which gives you a lot of distraction and which gives you a, a kind of you know soothing to the person a lot. So how? How about you know doing or uh, going with uh, the functional activities of the person, so on the range of motion. So that's what what we you choosing to perform a grade three or grade four mobilization uh, again to restore the posterior capsule mobility, and as well as you know it can be helpful with the shoulder impingement, which may result in increasing the range of motion and uh, reduce the impingement symptoms. So you probably, you know, choose the best way, like, you know, whether they have a sensitivity or very tender or very painful person, and then, you know, probably you try to choose accordingly, like, you know, what you, what grade you want to do. So there is no kind of a, a say that, like, you know, you got to do this particular grade to a person. So you really need to determine that is your, you know, working hypothesis or your clinical reasoning, which we need to make. And there are certain incidents, like, you know, that because sometimes, you know, many people might have a question of uh, asking, like, you know, how much uh, or how far we have to do or what we have to choose. I would be choosing a grade one and grade two for a sensitivity or where you have, like, you know, there is no my kind of, uh, like, you know, in, uh, in applicable or that they don't allow you to touch more or grade three or grade four can be applied. So choose that the sins factor, which we all know, the severity, irritability, the nature of disorder and the specific pathology. And then, you know, you talk about the timing because sometimes we might have this question, like how much time. So I've looked upon it, the various literatures to say that like you know that we can look in for we can apply this mobilization for 30 seconds and as well as like you know you just queue for a, a period of time with the 30 seconds and then i can go for 10 times like that with a consistent rest uh, like maybe you know two seconds or five seconds of rest in between and this can be useful like you know in order to um, give them a kind of uh, understanding like you know how they can hold on with the movements and how they can cope up with further range of motion also and why you know why do we do this or, or as we all know like you know we talk about uh, the mechanical factors or the neurophysiological factors so that's what why we do this this techniques you know help us to activate the mechanoreceptors and as well as to give a kind of hypoalgesic effect and as well as that, you know, it adds up the nutrition to the joint flu joint and it can give a lot of sense of your know, understanding. So I would probably say like, you know, if somebody asked me like, you know, why do you go for a mobilization, maybe a, a, not a physio, maybe somebody else, I, I would, uh, you know, help them to uh, tell them that, you know, I would be doing this because of the neurophysiology effects or the mechanical effect and as well as the vascular effect which you tend to get by doing this mobilization. Yeah. And then of course, you know, there are a lot of uh, studies which talks about uh, the Mulligan technique or, or the other other manual therapy which, which has to be, uh, which can be used or uh, which will be helpful for the subacromial impingement is like, you know, one of the things is like with the mobilization with movement, okay, which uh, causes the cap capsular stretching and which also increases the behavioral orthokinematic. So definitely, you know, you should be able to do that or you should be able to get better with that. So there are a few studies, you know, which talks about comparing this uh, a simple joint mobilization and the mobilization with movement. And they found that, you know, mobilization with movement has stand better for subacromial impingement uh, because of the additional proprioceptive tissues such as the Golgi tendon organs activated by tendon stretch. So as we all know that like, you know, the person will be doing the active movement and the therapist will be doing the glide. So maintaining the glide and then obviously, you know, it has a better effect compared to this. So because when we had the presentations, like, you know, people tend to ask you know, oh, which technique is good or you know, what kind of technique can be useful. So I'm rather, having a question at the end, you know, and trying to give an explanatory for the same. All right, so why do we choose this mobilization? What we have to focus on subacromial impingement. 
the thoracic spine, spine the posterior shoulder, and the inferior glenohumeral capsule. These are the three structures which we need to focus upon, you know, when you say in terms of SAS, or subacromial impingement syndrome. So thoracic spine has to be mobilized with. So when you say thoracic spine, we should be familiar, we should be, you know, happy to do with that. The PA pressure, the posterior anterior pressure in throat, or posterior anterior pressure in fetal positions, or thrust, yeah, I, I don't go much with the thrust, so I, I like to have a gentle mobilization because, you know, that is more handy for the people. And if at all, you, are, you can do that, the dog technique, that is the AP thrust, and as well as the distraction thrust seated. So these are the thoracic spine techniques, you know, which you tend to do. So when you say here, like, you know, when you talk about the movement, so you can see here the thoracic spine, so, in the seated, posi seated position, or where we use the pisiform grips, so the pisiform comes over here, and then you know you try to keep it from the C7 to T9 level. So you can do the mobilization, so which we can intend to do here in the various positions. You know you can do in sitting, or you can do it in the lying positions, or the, you know the prone lying also. Okay, so this is uh, what we have in the sitting positions, like, you know, when you intend to hold someone over here, and then, you know, you are going to do this uh, mobilization in the sitting position with the support of the arm over here, and then you do this uh, a central PA, which is done on the, all the levels, so which you intend to do to the thoracic region. And you can see here, like, you know, that you talk about, yeah, so again, we have a little bit of issue with the videos, but you know, probably I'll be able to set like this. And we can do the, the shoulder movements, or which also can be done like, you know, with the, the rotations of the shoulder and as well as with the AP glide or the PA glide, which can be done on the shoulder in this position. And again, I'm try over here. Yeah. So come, no, fine. So again, you know, this is nothing but like, you know, done in the prone line position with the PA glides. So it's a simple PA glides, so like you know, put the person in the prone line and then you keep the passive form over the spinous forces and then do the movements here. So when we do this uh, movements, so our aim is to, you know, uh, like, you know, if you are very excessive high force, you will not be able to get that. And why do we do the thoracic, you know, spine movement for a, uh, SAS or subacromial impingement. There are two things, you know, that we have uh, explanation. So one is about uh, like you know people who have uh, like uh, lateral stiffness. So you know if you have a tightness in the scapular thoracic joint, it can have an uh, impact. Or you can if you have a limitation in the glenohumeral joint, it can have an impact on the thoracic spine. And another one is like you know you probably ending up having saying that you know the person will be having a kind of a speculation saying that okay when you give the mobilization to the thoracic spine and the scapular region it can increase the range of motions there. And the next is about the posterior shoulder. Uh, already we talked about, we know that like you know the glenohumeral posterior glide uh, which can be done like you know epiglide or a PA glide which you, in order to increase the mobility there and then the mobilization with the movement which also will be helpful in terms of you know looking in the term with the posterior shoulder and then I, I would you know look upon the very important aspect why you know people come with the SAS but they will have a stiffness or they will not be able to do the hand behind back that they have a limitation of the hand behind back. So when you have a limitation of the hand behind back, that probably, you know, you should be, or uh, we will be able to do this movement. So when you have a limitation, like, you know, you put them in the sideline position, you take them into the component of uh, uh, the extension and the internal rotation and the uh, adduction component, and then, you know, you keep doing individually, like, you know, extension component here, and then the internal rotation, and as well as the glenohumeral APPA, which all we intend to do it in the sideline position. So, so that we know that, like, you know, whether we are able to reach backward, because that's uh, one of the limitations of the person who is not able to do the movement well. 
and scapula mobilization, which we, we, most of us are familiar with, all the movements of the scapula, which we do, and then, you know, as well as the shaft rotation. So I would use this as a soothing effect. So when you do the sh shaft rotation, which will give a lot of soothing effect to the person in order to, you know, reduce the pain or so which will or you know my people some people uses the pendular exercises for the stiffness same thing i would use this uh, shaft rotation which will help them to get better with the range of motion okay and then the shaft rotation again here and the posterior rotation of the ac joint so where you put them into the supine line position and you keep one uh, hand on the scapula and another you know covering the anterior aspect of the as clavicle and then try to do that. So this is the one like, you know, when you do this posterior rotation, which can open up the space and then, you know, picks up with a, a rigid tape so that you can take away the inflammation. So you, you can have a, you know, immediate impact of, in terms of pain. So we'll be probably able to use this. And you can do that, you know, over here, that you think about the moments in which where you have a limitation which can be taken care of by doing this mobilization part. And again, here we have the AC joint mobilization, which can be done. And you can see here on the CR missions, like you know, uh, where you can do about or uh, think about the AC joint movement, that which will be beneficial for the person to get better with terms of you know increasing the end range of flexion or horizontal. Uh, Adduction. So both, both for both like horizontal adduction and the end range of flexion, we always use this you know inferior glide of the clavicle or the AC joint. Yeah. And coming back with the continuing with the hand behind back, sometimes certain people we can or we need to do the radial level mobilization in the sideline position, which I I prefer like you know someone who has a radiating pain or who has a pain down the elbow like you know which could be because of this radial nerve that you can choose the radial nerve mobilization okay so that's a another part which we look upon when we do this you know radial nerve mobilization in this and uh, already we talked about the inferior glide of AC joint yeah and this is in general you know people who look at like okay so if you want to look as a patient like you know our, our Clinically, you know, how effective we can be like, you know, you walk, about, walk upon the middle and the lower trapezius uh, weakness and the rotator cuff muscle weakness, and they will have limited shoulder internal rotation. So that's why we have this hand behind back techniques and uh, reduced uh, kyphosis so where you can do the you know, thoracic mobilization. So all this uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, we really need to examine like, you know, what, uh, level is needed. I'm not saying that everyone need a, a thoracic mobilization, but certainly like in a few people might be in need because if they have a excessive kyphosis, you know, that it will not allow you to do a shoulder flexion. And yes, posterior and inferior capsule structures, you know, that's what beautifully explained by Karen about the moment, you know, what you do with the cobra stria or, you know, like the kind of a stretches which we intend to do with uh, normally with the posterior capsule stretch or the inferior capsule stretch which we can do in order to get the movements and as well as to increase the range of motion. So, so uh, that's what you know what I have in terms of you know mobilization. But when you when you look in, in terms of exercises, because I clinically I look like you know two things like yes I, shall I go only for mobilization or shall I go for mobilization with exercise? But I, I found that, you know, mobilization with exercises are quite handy. And you could, you know, start up, you would have looked upon this article, you know, which has given a comprehensive exercises for uh, three factors which we are looking. So one is for the uh, strengthening and another one is for the muscle re-education and another one for the flexibility exercise. So these are the three things, you know, why they have done this exercise so far. So you could see here, you know, the various exercises which uh, most of us do. So which was well explained or would have been explained by the speakers, you know, when you talk in terms with uh, what you do with uh, the movements, where you have the weakness of a muscle and then, you know, you tend to do these exercises a lot. So we have a different paces, the three paces, phase one, phase two, 
and then you know you have these exercises to do so even though like you know exercise is not the one which i'm going to talk through here but uh, i would say like you know clinically uh, what could be taken care of what could be looked upon together for treating the person so these exercises you know can be uh, given for uh, SIAS depending upon the age and the impact you know what they do so uh, we have uh, you know a lot of uh, literatures we talked through with the body blade and i hope uh, many of the physios over here would be using this to you know get better with the exercises for the SAS again so this is for you know the functional movement like you know what they are talked about in the studies about the land mover like you know where you get the downward movement so all this you know the mobilization along with the exercises will be much beneficial so you have here the thoracic extension exercises that's what like you know Andy I would be doing with the, the mobilization I would be using this or the pectoral muscles because the muscle tightness or muscle length tightness which could be causing or which could be leading into the other factors like you know that you can use a muscle image technique or a dry needle or anything else which can be used cross body or the posterior you know shoulder structure which can be and then again here so various exercises which you look at in terms of you know the SAS or maybe you know I would say as a more specific exercises along with mobilization but even though my part is you know about mobilization I would uh, stand with uh, three things which we talk about so this one like you know, instead of doing this uh, internal rotation stretch I would do a mobilization where we have a sequence of events for the mobilization we put them in the sideline we do the inner humeral joint mobilization we do the AC joint mobilization we do the radial nerve mobilization and of course, you know, scapular mobilization also. So there are various exercises again. And when you look in, okay, you know, to uh, talk about uh, evidences, uh, like you know, manual therapy was superior to doing nothing for pain. Yeah, definitely. If you don't do anything, if you do manual therapy, it has a better effect. And manual therapy plus exercise was superior to electrical modalities and manual therapy combined with exercise was superior to exercise alone so uh, I, I would uh, say that you know mobilization and manual th the exercises can be handy for the people but it's uh, kind of you know shortest to time that it uh, stays or it doesn't uh, stay for a long period of time with in terms of you know uh, reducing the pain with mobilization so obviously we have to go for a eight weeks protocol or you know the rehab programs which which will help us in long term for reducing the pain so Oh, I would uh, look upon with few things to summarize here for you in terms of mobilization. The thoracic spine mobilization, the posterior shoulder, and as well as, uh, you know, you talk in terms of the capsular stretches. So these are the three things, you know, we tend to do or we tend to focus upon in order to increase the range of motion and as well as to reduce that pain over here. So there are a lot of evidence which talks about, you know, a systemic reviews which has talked about uh, all is like you know intend to use this but clinically you know all the techniques whatever we see have have a role on it so these are the you know few references and few people you know you know come across this uh, shoulder assessment uh, flow chart which is fantastic to look upon like you know if you want to uh, see a comprehensive way in which you know you do like do you have a stiff shoulder or a weak shoulder wobbly shoulder or a nervy shoulder or a vascular shoulder or is that you know not at all the shoulder or is that the systemic inflammation which, which causes uh, which gives you a, a kind of you know overall make us to understand uh, or make us to learn about the pattern recognition or the forward reasoning in about this thing so these are the further evidences and this is about you know my contact details here yeah so that's uh, my presentation for all of us about you know subacromial impingement and the usage of manual therapy yeah over to Saro.
Yeah. So do we do we have any questions to ask? Yes, Thank you so much, Parson, sir. I request every participant, those who have any question, kindly unmute yourself and ask. Parson, sir, is here to get interact with every one of you. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Anyone? Yeah. Is there any questions? Okay, uh, sir has given anyway contact number. So those uh, who has noted down can post him also. He is very cooperative and very calm in teaching. Uh, I have my personal experience. I've been knowing him past more than 12 years. I express my sincere thanks to Pulsan sir. Thank you. Joined uh, the event. Can you please share the contact details and mail ID please? Yeah. That's great, thank you. Okay. So if there's no uh, verbal questions, uh, there's been a lot of thanks a lot of people on the chat. Thank you very much to there everyone for attending. From Monica. There is a question from Monica Doda, sir. One question. Okay. Awesome. How, does stepping, how does stepping techniques help in this condition? Can you explain, person, sir? Yeah, like uh, I would uh, look uh, in terms of, you know, uh, in opening up the subacromial space by using the rigid tape. So what we do is uh, we do a posterior rotation of AC joint and then, you know, a rigid tape can be used and Jackie can have uh, better techniques to say also. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Cool, great. If there aren't any more questions, we're a little bit early. I'm sure everyone's found it an incredibly exciting day, very interesting. Some awesome variety of speakers. I took um, Wilson for finishing up with us. I want to thank I want to thank uh, Paula and Aaron at the beginning, and Jackie and Yash uh, for some awesome talks. I'd like to thank all the attendees for your support. For, I see on the numbers that we've had close on 60 people in attendance for the duration of the day, which is fantastic stuff. Thank you very much to everyone for, for your attendance. I want to thank also Saurav. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, and um, Sumanjit as well from My Rehab Academy in India. They're amazing to work with. They are so motivated and so keen to, to establish and to improve these education portals. So working with them is um, so easy and so nice from us at Club Physio. So thank you to you guys as well. Thank you, sir. Sarah, thank would you, you like to say anything in conclusion? Yeah. Uh, thank you all the uh, our Disney, uh, Disney fired speakers. And, uh, and our participants who continue to be there since last nine hours, that shows our success, our content, and our uh, speaker's ability uh, to give them a great enlightenment. Thank you so much, participants. Thank you, Craig, sir. Thank you, Pulsan, sir. Thank and you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Craig. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Nice to meet you, Pulsan. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, to all your kind uh, text messages of thanks. I'm not going to reply to each and every one of you individually, but acknowledge all of your texts, and thank you very much for your attendance. Thanks for your kind words. Um, we're going to end the meeting now.
So you don't have to leave unless you want to leave. That's Surav or um, uh, the Mariab Academy team will end the meeting and say good night to everyone. We will have Thank you, sir. A, a planning session in a couple of weeks' time where we will plan the next Hot Topics Econ. Yes. I have a feeling, I have a feeling, I have a feeling it's going to be on the lower limb, but I can't confirm that. So wait and uh, see if the... A bit of information. Okay, thank you guys. All the best. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.